Cross My Heart. A Love on Palmer Island Romance. Written by Suzanne Ash. Chapter 1. Stella Wilson stared at her laptop. It was getting late, even for her, and the work she'd done on her latest freelance project was dismal. It would take at least another hour of focused writing to reach the word count goal she needed to hit to make her project deadline. She got up and walked into the kitchen, pouring herself a glass of ice water. She eyed the coffee maker but resisted the temptation of fixing another pot. The girls would be up early, ready to head out to the beach. If she drank coffee now, there would be no sleep before then. There might not be any either way if the words didn't start to flow. She needed to find her groove, lose herself in the topic, and knock out a few more chapters. Stella padded back to her office, careful not to make too much noise. She returned to her desk, took a big gulp of the water, and rolled her neck and shoulders. Stretching her arms and interlocking her fingers, she hit the keys, reading through the last paragraph she'd written. Getting her blood moving had helped. She should have done it hours ago. Stella's fingers flew across the keyboard, thoughts stringing together and coming faster than she could get them down. This was what she lived for. This feeling of effortless productivity felt nothing like work. It was exhilarating. And incredibly prolific. When she got into this flow, she could knock out days' worth of work in a matter of hours. And her daughters loved the resulting time to play hooky. Stella smiled, thinking about how excited they would be if she could not only catch up, but get ahead tonight. She was getting into the chapter about forest bathing, a fancy new term for clearing your head and recharging by going out in nature, preferably a grove of old trees, when the noise from next door started. Not again. She'd hoped they'd make it through an entire night without the rowdiness of their next-door neighbors. But the slamming of doors and the yelling were not a good sign. Stella forced her mind back to the work at hand, doing her best to ignore the noise, aware of the pack of foam ear plugs sitting in the drawer to her right should she need them. Right on cue, the hot tub and music fired up along with a barrage of lights from the back deck that looked out over the intercoastal waterway and extended along the side of her house. Stella jumped up and rushed into her daughter's rooms, making sure the blinds and the blackout curtains she'd bought last month were tightly shut. She pulled them closer, overlapping the panels, when Emma, her youngest, stirred. Stella walked up to the twin bed and brushed her fingers over her daughter's damp blonde locks. Go back to sleep, sweetie. She tucked the five-year-old in and checked on Abigail. Mama? Her oldest raised and sat up in bed. Everything's fine. Go back to sleep. Is Mr. Madison having another party? The seven-year-old asked. Sounds that way. Hopefully, it won't get too loud. Try to go back to sleep. Stella sat on the edge of the bed and waited until Abigail laid back down and pulled the covers up to her neck. Okay. Are you going to bed? Abigail's voice was soft, getting drowsier. Soon. Stella smiled and rose, returning to her office, yawning along the way. Maybe it was time to call it a night. The bass of the music kicked into another gear, reverberating through the house and her body. Seriously? This is ridiculous. Stella felt rage rising in her belly. Rarely, a night had gone by without some sort of disturbance since Hunter Madison and his boys had taken up residence next door. He'd only bought it a few months ago. For as long as she could remember before then, it had been sitting empty, with only the occasional visit from a local cleaning and maintenance company. Stella shut her laptop and pulled the cardigan off the back of her office chair and looked around for her sneakers. Mama, Mama. Emma's cries sent her racing back to the girls' rooms. Glancing at Abigail, who was sitting up, rubbing her eyes, she stepped into Emma's bedroom. The young girl rushed into her arms. I'm scared, Mama. It feels funny in here. Emma pointed to her chest. It was that darn bass again. Stella felt the anger in her own chest exploding. How much longer were they expected to deal with this? 
blaring music and blinding lights late into the night and roaring jet skis and revving power boats that churned up the waterway that ran behind both of their houses at night. Enough was enough. Stella considered storming out there, confronting the leader of the rowdy pack yet again. But what good had that done so far? Nothing but platitudes and empty promises to keep it down. Mama, I'm so tired. The tears streaming down Abigail's face as she joined them broke her heart. Emma's arms were tightly wrapped around her, her little shoulders shaking as she sobbed. Stay with your sister, Stella said, extricating herself and marching down the hall and into the kitchen. 911. What's your emergency? The friendly voice on the other end of the line asked. Stella took a deep breath and launched into an explanation of what was going on and had been going on most nights for the past two weeks. My girls have school on Monday. We have plans for tomorrow. None of us had a solid night of sleep for days. Are you outside? The woman asked. No. I'm inside my house. Can you hear it through the phone? Stella asked. I can. I'll send a patrol car out to check on the situation and talk to the occupants of the house. Can I have the address, please? Stella gave the woman the requested information before returning to the girls in Emma's room. Does anyone want a cup of warm milk? She asked her daughters, who were sitting huddled together in the center of the bed, both of them with deep rings around their eyes. With honey? Emma asked, her eyes lighting up. Of course. Stella forced herself to smile and stay calm while the noise droned on, with several male voices joining in the chorus of whatever song they were currently listening to. The girls had finished their milk, and the three of them had retreated to Stella's bedroom at the other end of the house half an hour later. I miss Daddy, Abigail said while they were all snuggled in, looking at the picture Stella kept on her nightstand. I know, baby. I do too. Tears welled up in her eyes. She missed Dan often, but never more than in moments like this, when she ached for a partner, someone to shoulder the burdens of parenthood and life in general. Me, too, Emma piped up, snuggling closer. We all miss him, and that's okay. You'll feel better in the morning. Try to get some sleep, and we'll have a fun day on the beach tomorrow. Can we have a picnic? Emma asked, raising her head, her blonde locks falling into her sweet little face. Absolutely. We'll pack a cooler, set up the sunshade, and spend all day out there, Stella said, brushing the hair out of her face. Do you promise? Abigail asked, eyeing her carefully. You don't have to work? I promise. Tomorrow is all about the three of us, Stella said. It would mean catching up on her writing after the girls went to bed, and hopefully getting a few hundred words in before they woke up, but they deserved a day of her undivided attention. She hadn't made it enough of a priority since Hunter Madison had moved in. He might be a country music singer, but that didn't mean she would allow him to continue to disrupt their lives. Just because the guy was some washed-up celebrity didn't mean he was above the law or the rules of common decency. Both her girls were on the verge of sleep when the noise finally stopped around 3.15 in the morning. Stella relaxed into her pillow and thought about her options. She loved this house, but if things kept going the way they were, she might have to consider moving. As much as she hated uprooting the girls and leaving the home she'd shared with her late husband, she couldn't subject them to these interruptions now that school was back in session. Determined to do whatever it took to do what was best for her daughters, she drifted off to a few hours of the dreamless sleep of pure mental and physical exhaustion. Chapter 2 Hunter Madison raised up and pushed his covers aside. The ringing of the doorbell continued, followed by a loud rapping on the door. The noise made its way to his second-story bedroom. Stop. He held his head in his hands, praying for the throbbing pain to stop. When it didn't, and laying back down and pulling his pillow across his face didn't help, he groaned and got to his feet. Coming, he called, regretting the action when searing pain shot through his head. He stopped and put a hand out to steady himself, before making his way down the hall. He gripped the rail, fighting nausea, as he trudged down the steps while the banging and ringing continued, 
interspersed with shouting he couldn't quite make out through the thick oak doors. I'm coming. Hold your horses, he muttered, unlocking and opening the door. About time. Kirk Fergus, his manager and a man he usually considered a friend, brushed past him and into the house. Good morning to you, too, Hunter said, shutting the door and following the man into the large open concept living area. Sounds like you and your guys were raising hell again last night. Kirk shook his head. Hunter couldn't blame him. The place was a mess. Cleaning service must not have been here yet. It was strange. Usually, the house was spotless by the time he woke up. But then he had no idea what time it was. For all he knew, it could be too early for the crew to show up. They cancelled your contract after the last one. Kirk stared at him like he was supposed to know one. Hire someone else then. Hunter shrugged and dropped onto the leather couch. It smelled faintly of stale beer and cold pizza. Breakfast of champions. There's no one left in a hundred mile radius. You've been through them all. Besides, you can't afford them unless you come out with another album. Or at least a single. Kirk stacked plates and glasses and carried them into the kitchen. I'm working on new material, Hunter called after him. Great, let's hear it. Kirk returned a moment later with two large black trash bags and handed him one. It's not ready. What's this for? Hunter looked at it suspiciously. You don't seriously think I'm doing this by myself? Fill that thing up, and then I'm making you breakfast. Hunter shook his head but did as asked. Anything to get Kirk off his back about the new album. He was stuck, and the guy didn't understand that to make art, he needed to feel inspired. It would happen. He just had to wait it out. And what was wrong about having a good time while he did? How do you like your eggs? Kirk asked when they returned to the kitchen, handing Hunter the second bag. With a side of bourbon. Scrambled it is. Take those out while I cook. Kirk dug around the cabinets until he found a pan he liked. Take them where? Hunter asked, staring at the objects in his hands. The trash can next to the garage. How long have you lived here? Kirk turned and stared at him. Hunter shrugged. I don't remember. And you've never taken out the trash. Figures. Green can next to the garage. Go. The air was warm, but not stifling. It felt kind of nice. The neighborhood was quiet, aside from an older lady walking her dog, who glared at him before crossing to the other side. Hunter waved before turning around to look for the green can. He found it and did his best to add the bags to an already full container. We've got to call someone to come get that green can, he said when he returned. It's overflowing. When does your trash run? Kirk asked. Never mind. I'll ask one of your neighbors. Seriously, Hunter, you've got to learn how to take care of yourself. I'm sure someone on my crew remembers. I'm surprised no one passed out on the couch. Where did everyone go, he asked, looking around and realizing for the first time how quiet and empty his house felt. Police kicked everyone out who wasn't on the deed last night. Don't you remember? Kirk asked. Hunter shook his head. Last night was a little fuzzy. They'd gotten back to the house late after a bar crawl up in Myrtle Beach. He'd heard some good music up there, he remembered that. Eat, and then we need to talk. Kirk handed him a plate of scrambled eggs and toast in front of him. The scent of it made Hunter gag. He put it down on the counter and found a glass. Grabbing the vodka from the freezer, he poured a generous amount into the glass, topping it off with a splash of tomato juice. Bloody Mary, he asked his manager. Kirk shook his head and made his own plate instead. Suit yourself. Hunter sat down, and after his first gulp, he felt better. The pounding headache that had eased for a moment in the fresh air was getting better. He managed to eat a few bites of egg and toast before returning his attention to the drink. Go back to bed. Sleep this off. When you're sober, we need to talk. 
Kirk motioned for him to leave, and Hunter gladly did. Making his way back upstairs, he shut the curtains and crashed back into bed. Hunter woke to the scent of strong coffee a few hours later. He stumbled into the bathroom and stared at himself in the mirror. He looked bad. Pale, with dark circles under his eyes. His cheeks were doing some weird drooping thing. He rubbed them, and when that didn't help, splashed cold water on his face before heading downstairs to face whatever lecture Kirk felt the need to make. Hunter knew better than to try to get out of it, and to an extent, Kirk was right. He needed to come out with new material. He wanted to create something new. Problem was, it wasn't working. He wasn't ready yet. Hunter was still waiting for his muse to return. Instead of the muses, three men with serious expressions waited for him in the living room. Sit, Kirk said in a stern tone that meant business. Hunger glanced from his manager to his accountant and his lawyer, the two men flanking Kirk, mirroring his serious expression. What's up, guys? Hunter plopped onto the couch, throwing his feet up on the coffee table. What's up? The police came out to the house again about the noise you and your guys were making last night. Peter, the attorney, leaned forward, his brows knit together. We had a party. It got a little out of hand. That's all. It's no big deal. It wasn't his fault that he was surrounded by goody two shoe types who went to bed at nine. It is a big deal. This is a family place. Your neighbors have young children. I handled it for now, but this cannot happen again. Thanks. Hunter nodded his appreciation. He hated dealing with cops. We're serious. You can't keep doing this. You'll be dead or broke in 18 months if you keep it up. Kirk's eyes were staring at him with an intensity that got Hunter's attention. What do you mean, he asked. He couldn't be broke. He was a platinum recording artist, for crying out loud. It's not looking good. We're facing some serious cash flow issues, as is. If you don't crank out another hit in the next six months, you could lose everything. Martin, his accountant, opened a briefcase and pulled out a stack of papers. Hunter waved him off. I can't look at that right now. Hunter, you have to face this, before it's too late. You hired us to help you make smart decisions. We think the best thing for you, no, the only thing for you to do is to check yourself into rehab, dry out, and then sit down and get to work. Hunter sat up and looked at each of the men in turn. This was no prank. They were dead serious. He felt something inside him shift. That won't be necessary. Kirk started to protest. Hunter held up his hand to stop him. The rehab won't be necessary. I will take care of this. He rose and took the stack of papers his accountant had put on the coffee table. Hunter, I mean it. This is your last chance to turn this ship around, Kirk said when the three men rose as well. I will. Hunter walked them out the door, poured himself a large cup of coffee and dug into the statements of accounts, spreading them out on the coffee table. This isn't good, he muttered when the front door opened, and the boys started to pile in. And this isn't either. Hunter knew the guys weren't going to enjoy being kicked out, but that's what was going to happen. And then he'd pour every bit of liquor down the drain. He was tired of this life. Tired of the group of leeches that had formed around him. It was time to face the music. In a way, it was poetic that it was happening today, on the anniversary of the worst day of his life. Chapter 3 How's the writing going? Claire asked. Stella looked at her friend and handed her a glass of iced tea. Much better. What changed? No noise and drama from next door. Stella glanced at the house. It was quiet. No cars parked all around the property. No music blaring from the large speakers that lined the back deck. That's nice. Maybe the guy finally saw sense. Didn't you say he was a musician or something? Claire leaned forward and stared out the large bay window. Stella punched her friend in the shoulder. Don't stare. 
he might see us. Who cares? The man has given you nothing but trouble, right? Claire leaned forward and continued to look at the property. I think he's back there. Stella leaned back and took a sip of her iced tea. She sighed and took a moment to appreciate the peace and quiet. As long as the music and the parties stop, I don't care what he does. He can stroll around in his underwear for all I care. Claire giggled. You're so bad. I heard he's a looker. Stella shrugged. If you like that washed-up musician look. I'm pretty sure he's a drunk and who knows what else went on over there. She'd heard the rumors about the rock and roll lifestyle. What do you think happened? Claire asked. Stella looked out to the backyard where the four girls were playing. He finally learned his lesson. Oh, spill the tea. What did you do? Claire tore her attention from Mr. Madison's house and sat back in her chair. I called the police on him. Again. I guess this time it stuck. At least that was what she kept telling herself. It had been eerily quiet. Not a single party or group of people showed up. She saw the car for a Myrtle Beach cleaning service in the driveway occasionally, and the odd visitor, but that had been it. I'm glad. Abigail told Josie the noise kept waking her up and made her tired at school. Stella nodded. It was bad. Knock on wood that we're done with that mess. Remember how excited we were when we heard a celebrity was buying the house? Claire asked. The rumor mills had been flying at full speed back then. Didn't think I'd regret it the night he moved in. Stella shook her head at the memory of sitting up straight in bed when the noise and the floodlights had fired up for the first time. How long has it been quiet over there? Claire asked when Emma and Paisley came running up, each of the little girls holding a handful of daisies. They held them out proudly, and Stella couldn't help but smile at their excitement. These are beautiful. Let's go inside to get a vase. She rose and looked at Paisley's mom. About a week or so. Walking into the house, her mind swirled with ideas of what could have happened to the famously infamous Hunter Madison. Mama, are you sure we have a vase for these? Emma asked. It's got to be teeny tiny. She held her fingers barely half an inch apart. I know exactly what to use. Stella pulled the step stool from the cabinet she stored it in and used it to reach the cabinet above the fridge. She was too short to see inside, even with the aid of the stool. She reached around until she felt the items she was looking for. It's perfect. Both girls beamed when she presented the two egg cups. They were part of a set some aunt of Dan's had given them for their wedding. They'd tried to use them once, but neither one of them had been fans of soft-boiled eggs. The cups had gone into the cabinet, only to come out on the rare occasion when she needed a two-inch vase. Let's put a little water in here. She filled each of them with half an inch of liquid before sitting them on the counter. And then we can put them in? Emma asked. That's the idea. Stella remembered Abigail doing the same for years. And then we'll take them outside. To show my mom, Paisley said, holding her hand out for one of the pale blue porcelain cups. Let's go show her. Stella took both cups and carried them outside, not waiting for the little girls to follow her. Those are beautiful, Claire said, lavishing the girls with praise, before sending them back out into the yard to play. I've been wondering, Stella's eyes wandered back to her neighbor's property. About what? If something happened to him. It's too quiet, Stella said. This isn't one of those mysteries you love to read. Claire took another sip of tea. I know, but what if something happened to him? Like what? Claire asked before turning to yell at her oldest daughter. Don't climb that tree. It's too tall and the limbs could break. What if he got drunk and passed out in his pool? He could be floating out there. Claire rose to get a better view. Doesn't look like it. I can see most of it from here. He has all those jet skis. Maybe he had an accident on the waterway, and no one knows he's missing. Next, you'll tell me some intruders killed him. 
Claire looked at her with raised eyebrows. It's possible. Not likely, but it felt strange to go from Party City to dead silence like that. You said you've seen some cars over there, right? Some made service and one other car. Could be anyone. Have you seen him? Hunter Madison. Out on the deck or walking by a window? Claire didn't sound convinced there was anything amiss. I thought I did earlier today, but I'm not sure. Maybe I should call the police. Her hand reached for the phone in her pocket. Do you think that's a good idea? I'm pretty sure he didn't appreciate them showing up the other three times you called them and broke up his party. I wouldn't worry about it. Maybe you're right, Stella said. Of course I am, but that doesn't mean you can't use all this anguish and anxiety in your next poem. Tell you what, why don't I take the girls for the night? You look like you could use some quiet time. And it's actually quiet around here. Stella smiled. You know what? That would be amazing. It's been a while since I had time to think and work on my own stuff. Then it's settled. Claire stood and waved her arms. Girls, let's go. Sleep over at our house. For real? Abigail's eyes lit up, and all four of them came running up. For real. Go pack a bag for you and Emma. Don't forget toothbrushes. Stella looked at her daughters. Unless you'd rather stay home? No way. We love sleepovers at Miss Claire's house, right, Emma? Abigail shot her sister a look that meant business. Not that Emma needed any encouragement. She and Paisley were already discussing sleeping arrangements. It stung a little to see both of them so eager to leave the house, but it was only for a night, and Stella could use the time to herself. As a single mom to two young girls with no family around, it was a rare treat. I'll call you later to say goodnight, she promised as she watched everyone pile into Claire's SUV and pull out of the driveway twenty minutes later. It's too quiet. Stella laughed at the absurdity of her words. Not only was she talking to herself, but last week, she would have given anything for some silence. She pulled her phone out of her pocket, ready to call the police. Not the emergency line, but the local station. It had been a week of quiet. She imagined the conversation with the officer in her head and shoved the phone back into her pocket. She had no reason to have them do a wellness check. Hunter Madison was a grown man. A man who'd gone from non-stop parties to complete recluse. She'd met him once and was pretty sure he'd been drunk at the time. She didn't like him. He was obnoxious, arrogant, and obviously a terrible neighbor. Still, it had been a week, and with every day that passed quietly, her worry had grown. Fine. Stella pulled her hair up in a ponytail and leaving out the back, she walked to his place. She rang the doorbell, twice, with no answer. Sighing, she turned to walk back when she noticed the gate to the backyard being ajar. What if Claire had been wrong, and he was floating in the pool? Or maybe injured and unable to get help? The least she could do was take a look. The sound of some machinery humming or vibrating reached her the moment she rounded the corner and saw the back deck. Tucked in a corner was a hot tub. She could only see part of it, but it was large and expensive. Like everything else back here. She knew this place was well-kept and expansive, but she hadn't realized how extravagant it was. The side facing the waterway looked like something that belonged on the cover of a magazine. Even the wood making up the back deck looked expensive. Teak, maybe? The pool featured a waterfall not visible from her place and looked like it was made up of marble. No wonder this place had been out of everyone's price range when it had come up for sale. Stella walked up on the deck. It was covered in potted plants and outdoor furniture you couldn't pick up at your local garden center. Everything was well kept and clean. Not at all what she'd expected. Stella wasn't sure what she thought she'd be walking into. Empty beer cans and a couch maybe, instead of this lap of luxury. Then again, the guy was a music superstar. Or had been. 
There was no telling what awaited her in the house that had sat on the market for close to a year before country music star Hunter Madison had decided to make Sleepy Palmer Island his home. She had no idea why. Stella mentally prepared herself to see some scantily clad girls in there, along with the home's owner. Hunter Madison sat slumped down, water up to his shoulders, and looked like death warmed over. No girls, or anyone else in sight. Hello? Stella called out. There was no answer. The guy didn't move. Instead, he looked pale. Too pale. What was going on here? Did he need an ambulance? Stella worried for the worst and pulled her phone out, ready to call for help for the third time today. Before she could push the buttons, his eyes flew open, and he looked right at her. Who are you? Chapter 4 The warm water moving around him made Hunter feel slightly better. The jets of the hot tub did wonders for the knots in his neck and shoulders. If he could get over the nausea, he'd be all right. He didn't remember feeling this bad for this long last time, but then again, it had been years since he'd gone for more than twelve hours without a drink. He wondered if Kirk was right. Maybe this was a problem. With his eyes shut to keep out the harsh light of the midday sun, he reached up and brushed his hair back with his fingers. He had to focus and figure out a way to dig himself out of this hole. Wouldn't be the first time he'd managed that. He could disappear into obscurity for a few months to write and record a new album. Something fresh, not rehashing the same honky-tonk drinking tunes he'd become famous for decades ago. A tune formed in his mind, and Hunter opened his eyes, ready to jump out to capture it on paper. Who are you? he asked the vision standing in front of him. She was petite, probably in her twenties, with her hair pulled into a ponytail that made her look a bit like a high schooler. Much too young for him. But the yellow tank top and denim shorts she wore did something for him. Something he hadn't felt in a while. It was a nice distraction from the throbbing headache and nausea. I'm Stella, your neighbor. We've met, she said. Are you all right? No. I'm not. Hunter raised up, putting his hands on the rim of the hot tub. My accountant says I barely have enough money to pay the bills. The party is over, and life sucks pretty hard right about now. All in all, I'd say no. I'm not all right at all. Do you want me to call someone? She reached for her back pocket, the thin tank top fabric stretching across her ample curves. Hunter shook his head, regretting the move immediately. No. I'll be fine in a couple of hours. It's what he'd been telling himself every day this past week. He'd dried out before, but it had never quite felt this bad or taken this long. Does that mean I can expect the music and lights to start back up again tonight? she asked. Her dark brown eyes were blazing, her hand resting on her hip as she stared him down. His neighbor was a bit of a firecracker and not afraid to speak her mind. Which wasn't much of a surprise. She was part of the reason why he was in this situation. He should resent her. Don't worry, darling. No more parties at this place. It's about to get a whole lot quieter around here, he said. Hunter doubted any of his so-called friends would show up without the endless flow of booze and him bankrolling a never-ending summer party. Good, she said, pulling the sunglasses perched on the top of her head down to cover those pretty eyes of hers. You need to stop partying so much. He couldn't help laughing and shook his head. The pain went up to a ten in an instant, nausea coming back in full force. He tried to raise himself out of the tub, his arms giving out from under him as the acid rose in his throat and his stomach cramped painfully. Here, let me help you. Her hand slid under his arms, and with her help, Hunter got himself out of the tub. Leaning over the railing of the deck, he heaved, nothing but bile coming up. She stayed, rubbing small circles on his back while telling him that everything would be okay. It was a bunch of nonsense, and she had no idea what she was talking about, but it felt nice. It had been a long time since someone had cared for him without a motive. Kirk was great, but Hunter was under no illusion that the man would be gone from his life the moment the money dried up for good. 
He was Kirk's meal ticket and that of everyone else around him. Better? The woman asked when he rose. Yes. Can I get you something? Water? He nodded, more carefully and slowly this time, and pointed to the sliding glass doors that lead into his house. Sit down. I'll be right back. She walked inside and returned a minute later with a glass of water and a handful of paper towels. He took the glass gratefully and washed his mouth out, spitting the contents over the rail and down into a sad-looking excuse of a flower bed. Once the money from the new album started rolling in, he should hire a landscaper who did more than cut the grass once a week. Sorry about that, he said, turning to the woman who held out the paper towels. She was a bit older than he'd first thought. The lack of makeup and casual dress made her look younger than she was. If he had to guess, he'd say she was closer to 30 than 20. Don't worry about it. Rough night? She took a step back, leaning against the railing downwind from him. Rough week. Nothing I can't handle. Sure about that, she asked, and he wished he could see the eyes that were once again covered by her sunglasses. I'm sure. Probably stayed in the tub too long. He motioned toward the bubbling water of the hot tub. All right. Maybe call someone to check on you every once in a while. Hunter let out a dry laugh. I'll do that. Anything else? She shook her head, ponytail moving back and forth like a dog's tail. Keep it quiet, especially at night. My girls need their sleep. Girls, he asked, realizing how little he knew about this woman. She'd told him her name, and he'd already forgotten it. My daughters. They're five and seven. Your parties kept waking them up, and your friends told me to get lost when I came over. That's why you called the police on me, he said, understanding dawning. You didn't leave me much of a choice. She pushed her glasses back on top of her head and looked at him for a moment. I do hope you feel better. He watched her turn and walk down the deck and out of the small gate at the side of his property. Hunter didn't take his eyes off her until she vanished inside her own house. How had he missed how good-looking this woman was? She was stunning. And kind. Was he only noticing her now, because he was sober for once? He downed the last of the water and walked inside, lyrics and a new tune taking shape in his mind. They were nothing like the flash of inspiration he'd had before she'd appeared. This was better. Something he needed to capture before it slipped through his fingers and was gone for good. Chapter 5 Infuriating, Stella muttered to herself as she walked back into her house. And insufferable. Who does this man think he is? She made herself a cup of coffee, carrying it up to her office. Without an actual crisis next door, she might as well take advantage of an entire evening to herself. She stared at the couch and TV on her way upstairs, fighting the temptation to curl up with a blanket and binge watch a show. Or five. After I get a chapter written, she promised herself. Doing the work tonight meant she could take tomorrow off from work and have a day out with the girls. Booting up her computer, Stella looked through her research notes. She'd moved from writing about forest bathing to an assignment about establishing a bedtime routine as an adult. No one ever took raising children and looming deadlines into consideration when they came up with this stuff. Stella shook her head at the suggestions. It was all good and well, but bedtime routines did little when your inconsiderate jerk of a neighbor decided to throw an impromptu party in the middle of the night. It had wreaked havoc on her girl's sleep patterns. She looked at the picture of her husband that sat on her desk. Wish you were here, she said. Dan would have handled Hunter Madison on day one, storming out there and giving him a piece of his mind. Or at least she liked to think he would have. If nothing else, he'd been there to tag team, taking care of the girls and the dishes, and doing his share to help pay the bills. Sorry. I know this isn't your fault. You didn't choose to leave us, and I'm grateful for the years we had together. Stella closed her eyes and took a moment to breathe, walking through a simple mindfulness exercise. When her eyes opened, she reached for her headphones, put on some brown noise, and got to work, fingers flying across the keyboard. 
She was several articles into the project and well ahead of schedule when the doorbell rang. Stella looked up. It was dark outside. The clock on her computer told her it was just after 8 p.m., a strange time, for a visit. She checked her phone to make sure she hadn't missed any messages from Claire about the kids before opening the door camera app. A man she didn't recognize, wearing a dress shirt and jeans, stood there, looking right at the camera. Can I help you? she said into the app. Stella Wilson? I'm Kirk Fergus, Hunter Madison's manager. Do you have a moment? I'd like to apologize for the trouble he caused and give you this. He held up an envelope. That's not necessary, she said. Her hair was a mess, and she wore the same old tank top and shorts from earlier. It will only take a minute. Please? The man was persistent. And more polite than the guy he worked for. I'll be right down. Stella pulled out her ponytail and ran her fingers through her hair before redoing it. I hope I'm not interrupting family time, the middle-aged man said when Stella opened the door. She shook her head. I was about to wrap up work. What do you do? he asked. I'm a freelance writer. Stella crossed her arms. None of this was any of the man's business. This is for you and your children. From Hunter. Mr. Fergus held the envelope out to her. Stella tore it open and gasped. Water park tickets? Season passes. Hunter hopes it will make up for waking up your kids. Hunter? Stella looked up at the middle-aged man. Hunter Madison hadn't recognized her. She was surprised he even remembered her daughters from their conversation. He had not exactly been in great shape. He shrugged. He's turning over a new leaf. Right. Let's hope it sticks. He mentioned you'd stopped by to check on him earlier today. Thank you for that. Mr. Fergus took a step back, his eyes darting to the large house next door. No problem. I got worried after a week of quiet. I thought maybe. He nodded. I don't think we have anything to worry about in that regard, but just in case, can I leave this with you? He pulled a small card out of his jacket pocket and handed it to her. Stella looked at the thin piece of cream-colored paper. My cell is on the back. Please don't hesitate to call me if anything about him worries you. Or if the partying starts back up? Stella wanted to believe this particular nightmare was over, but she wasn't naive enough to count on it. Definitely, if that happens. Ideally before you call the police, he said, his lips twitching up. Will do. It was nice meeting you, Mrs. Wilson. He held out his hand. And I appreciate your help looking out for Hunter. Call me Stella. And just so we're clear, I'm not volunteering to be his babysitter. I'll only call in an actual emergency. Of course. Call me Kirk. They shook hands, and the man took his leave to have dinner with his wife and kids. At least, that was what he'd told her. Did you have a good time at Josie and Paisley's house? Stella asked when her daughter stormed in the door at ten the next morning. Yes, did you miss us? Abigail asked. Can we have breakfast? Emma dropped her bag in the hall and ran into the kitchen. Miss Claire, didn't feed you? Stella asked, looking at her friend. Of course I did. We had waffles and bacon. Claire shook her head. But that was ages ago. Stella chuckled. I'm sure it was. I'll make us some eggs, and then I have a surprise for you. She turned to Claire. Thanks for letting them sleep over. No problem. The girls all had fun. Let's make it a regular thing. I'm sure you can use a moment to breathe. And catch up on work. Stella gave her friend a quick hug. We're going to have to work on you taking some time for yourself. I did. I watched a movie after I got my words in. And I slept in until 8 this morning. That never happens. Good. I'm glad. Call me later, and we'll figure out another sleepover next weekend. Will do. My house this time. 
you and Mike can have a date night. Stella wriggled her eyebrows, making Claire laugh, before she left. Mama, we're hungry. Emma came running back and grabbed her hand, dragging Stella into the kitchen. All right. Scrambled eggs and toast. And then we're going to the water park in Myrtle Beach. For real? Emma asked. Abigail stared at her in disbelief. For real. Mr. Madison got us tickets. Why? Abigail asked. Stella shrugged and grabbed the eggs from the fridge. I guess he feels bad about waking you up with that loud music and thought this was a nice way to make up for it. That was pretty scary. Emma walked over and gave her a hug. It was. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. Go get your bathing suits. I'll call you when the eggs are ready. She scrambled six eggs and poured them into the pan before popping three slices of honey wheat bread into the toaster. Five minutes till the food is ready, she called up the stairs. By the time she'd plated the food, her daughters came running down the stairs, each of them sporting a bathing suit and a pair of sunglasses. We're ready for the water park. Abigail took her plate and sat down. Can I go down the big slide? Emma asked. Abby says I can't. Because you're too little. That slide is for big girls. Like me. Stella put a hand on her youngest daughter's shoulder and handed her a plate. We'll find out when you get there. You've grown a bunch since last year. I think you'll make the height requirement. Emma beamed up at her. And if not, we'll go play in the wave pool while Abby waits in the long line for the slide. Stella winked at her youngest, conspiratorially. I could play in the waves. I don't have to go down that big slide. It's kinda boring, anyway. Abigail put a fork full of scrambled eggs into her mouth. Great. That's settled. I think we'll have a good time, and if you two behave, we can go back in a couple of days. Really? Both of her girls stared at Stella with big eyes. Really? didn't I tell you? These are season tickets. She wasn't sure which one of them screamed the loudest. Covering her ears, she couldn't help smiling. It was nice to see her daughters so happy and carefree. It had been a rough couple of years losing Dan and changing jobs from working at a marketing agency in Myrtle Beach to becoming a freelance writer to be home with the kids. But she'd made it work and had done the best she could for Emma and Abby. Hopefully, it was enough. Moments like this made her feel that maybe she did. Her eyes moved to one of the pictures of her husband she'd hung up all over the place. Stella didn't want the girls to forget what he looked like. Daddy would love to go to the water park with U.S., wouldn't he? Abigail asked. Stella swallowed the lump in her throat. Yes, sweetie. He would have. He would be going down that big slide with you ten times today. Maybe I'll go down one time. For him, you know. Abigail's smile was smaller, but just as sweet. And he's watching us, right? He'll see how much fun we'll have at the water park. Emma sat up and pushed her plate away. Yes, he will. And he'll also see if you two give me a hard time when I say it's time to leave, Stella said, picking up the empty plates. We won't. We promise, Abigail said. Good. We can make some ice cream when we get back. Would you like that? Yes. The response was unilateral and almost as excited as when she'd told them about the tickets. Stella cleaned up the breakfast dishes and went to change herself. I hope Hunter Madison sticks to his words and all that ruckus is over for a while, she said to the picture on her nightstand. If not, you might need to go over there and haunt him or something. She laughed at the silly thought. She put on her own bathing suit and a cover before digging through her closet for the beach bag she knew was hiding in there somewhere. I miss you, Dan. She closed the door behind her and walked down the stairs, determined to enjoy this day with her girls. Life was short, and she had memories to make. Chapter 6 Hunter Madison stared at the spreadsheet on his computer. 
Martin, his accountant, had simplified everything into a single statement, and it didn't look good. The bottom line was, he was going broke. Unless he figured out how to bring in some new income, he'd run out of money before the end of the year. He sat back and took a sip of his coffee, letting the figures and their implications sink in. His eyes wandered to the records hanging on the wall. He moved his gold and platinum albums with him whenever he changed primary residences. Now they hung in the office of the house he'd bought on Palmer Island when the pressure of living in Nashville had become too much. Where in the world did all that money go? Each of the albums represented hundreds of thousands of dollars. A lifetime's work and nothing but a few thousand bucks to show for. Okay, it was a little more than that, but nothing compared to what it had been even a few years ago. He opened a new browser tab and pulled up the latest country music chart, clicking through the songs. He leaned back and listened. The scene had changed. These songs had little in common with his last few hits, and even less with what he'd put out back in his heyday. Kirk had run out of material for Best of Albums, and the last one had been a total flop. That was why they were in this mess. Dang, it's not just me, is it, he said to the screen in front of him. The enormity of the trouble, he was in Hit Hunter, with full force. Kirk relied on him. He wasn't making any money if Hunter wasn't. The man had been loyal for decades and was worth his weight in gold. Plus, he was a family man with a wife and three boys to support. And then there was Martin. Hunter was sure his accountant had other clients, but he'd always paid him well. The same was true for Peter. Though lawyers, in his experience, never lacked clients. Time to roll up my sleeves and see if this old dog can come up with a new trick. He wondered if there was any way his former popularity would drive a new album up the charts. What he needed was to buy some time. He couldn't pull something like that out of thin air. A brand new record would take time. He needed fresh material. Hunter picked up the phone. Martin. I'm looking at the statement. Where are you at? On my way back to Nashville. Do you have any questions about the numbers I sent over? Martin asked. A loudspeaker announcement about an upcoming flight to Atlanta came through. Are you at the airport? Yes. Waiting for my flight back home. I only came down to Palmer Island as a favor to Kirk. And you. Martin was quiet after that. I appreciate that, Hunter said, swallowing his pride. I needed a wake-up call. Yes, you did. And I need your help. Can you buy me some time to put an album together? Hunter asked. What do you have in mind? Martin's tone was level. There was no judgment or excitement in the other man's voice. It can wait until you get home, Hunter said. I'm sitting here waiting around. Spit it out, Hunter. Fine. I figure if we raise some funds, we can float this boat long enough for me to come out with another album. Right. I haven't been in Nashville in years. Let's put the house on the market. It should bring a pretty penny, even in this economy. It's got your recording studio in it, Martin said calmly. I know. I can rent studio space when I'm ready. Or call in a favor. He still had friends in the industry. Are you sure? I am. And while we're at it, let's get rid of that place out in California. I think I spent one night in that cabin. Hunter shook his head. He'd made some stupid decisions back when he had more money than he knew what to do with. You're keeping the Palmer Island house? Martin asked, the sound of fingers clacking on a keyboard coming through the phone. Yes. I like the vibe down here. That should keep us going for a while once the properties sell and we get through closing. But. We need something to keep us going until then. I hear you. Sell the cars. I'll make some calls. Willie's had his eye on that old Mustang for two decades. You're not serious. Martin sounded stunned. I am. Whatever it takes. We're going to turn this boat around. What's losing a few cars that I don't drive anymore? 
get rid of them. All right. I'll get the ball rolling on this. Call me if you change your mind. I'll be home in four hours. Safe travels. Hunter hung up and immediately dialed Kirk's number. Everything okay? His manager asked. Not yet, but it will be. He caught the man up on his financial decisions. Wow. You are serious about this, aren't you? Kirk asked. As a heart attack. All right. What can I do to help? Hunter got up and paced the room. I know it's been a while and the last two best of albums didn't do as well as we'd hoped. Kirk made a noncommittal noise. Can you put out some feelers to see if there's interest at the label in something new? Something fresh. Bring back the old Hunter Madison fans and introduce my music to a whole new generation. That's a pretty big task, Kirk said. Hunter continued his pacing. I know. It's gotta be spectacular and hit the market just right. You think you can pull that off? I do. I can feel it in my bones, Kirk. I have something amazing inside of me that's waiting to break through. Blue water's amazing. Let's do it. Kirk's tone changed in an instant from doubtful to excited at the mention of Hunter's best-selling album. I'll make some calls, and you get to work. Let me know if you need anything. This isn't worth the paper I wrote it on. Hunter tore the page out of his notebook, crumbled it up into a tight ball, and tossed it into his overflowing trash can. This was harder than he remembered. His muse was a no-show, and doubt kept creeping in. He'd reached out to several songwriters and musicians he'd worked with in the past, but none of them had any last-minute availability and he couldn't afford to wait around to find someone to bounce ideas off. Writing, recording, and producing an album took time. And he didn't have a day to waste on this project. Your own material never did as well as when you worked with a songwriter, the voice of doubt kept saying on repeat. Why bother, another one whispered in his ear. Go get a bottle and let's forget all about this. Hunter rose and ran his fingers through his hair, massaging his scalp. I need some air. He walked out of his office and through the kitchen. The urge to open the fridge and see if there was a beer hiding somewhere in the back was strong. There had to be something behind the kale and grilled chicken that Kirk had delivered after their call yesterday. Hunter was also the proud owner of a bag of avocados and a collection of raw nuts. The delivery girl had said something about brain food. So far, it wasn't working. Maybe that required actually consuming the stuff instead of eyeing it suspiciously. Hunter pulled open the door and moved the kale. One lone bottle of beer was lying on its side in the back. Next to it was a green smoothie. He cracked open the bottle, surprised how easy it was to ignore the beer. Drinking had been an easy excuse. A bad habit. And one he had no desire to get back into. The smoothie though, would take some getting used to. Hunter strolled out onto the back deck and took a few deep breaths. He could do this. He'd done it before, and if experience had taught him anything, it was that once the words and the music started flowing, it was hard to stop them. He just had to figure out what was blocking him and work through it. The solitude and lack of noise were nice. He didn't miss the rowdy crowd he'd spent the past few years hanging out with. They were good at drowning out thoughts, dreams, and memories, but he was done with that. He flipped the switch to turn on the hot tub and undressed down to his boxers. The warm water was where he did some of his best thinking and creating. Hunter laughed at the memory of soaking in the old, stained bathtub of his first Nashville apartment. He'd done some of his best work in there too, writing hit songs for several up-and-coming artists at the time. He stepped into the hot tub and lowered his body, feeling the warm water embrace him. He could do this. He had to. It was that or end up homeless, surfing the couches of old friends. He wasn't getting any younger. It was time to focus, do the work, and make sure he had enough money to retire. He sighed and closed his eyes, waiting for his muse to make an appearance. All he needed was a spark. A miracle. 
That wasn't too much to ask, was it? Chapter 7 Are you having a good time at Paisley and Josie's house? Stella asked her oldest daughter when she called to check in. The girls were spending another night with Claire's girls. I am. Emma and Paisley are playing chutes and ladders, Abigail said with the disdain only a seven-year-old can muster. Stella bit back a laugh. What about you and Josie? Anything fun planned for tonight? We're gonna have a makeover and a talent show. Miss Claire promised we could put on a performance in the living room. And if it's really good, we'll talk about doing it at the block party next week. We're going to do that, right? Please say yes, Mama. We'll see. We don't live on the same block. Miss Claire says it's fine and everyone's invited. I'll talk to her about it when I pick you girls up in the morning. I thought maybe we can stop by sweet treats and pick up donuts before hitting the beach. What do you think? Emma, Mama's going to take us out for donuts tomorrow, Abby yelled into the receiver. Stella held the phone away from her ear. She could hear the excited squeals of four little girls and made a note to pick up the donuts before she picked up her daughters. On second thought. Baby, put Miss Claire on the phone for a minute, she said when the noise died down. Miss Claire, my mom wants to talk to you. Stella ripped the phone away from her ear. At this rate, she was going to be deaf before the week was over. Stella, everything okay? You and I really need to have a talk about you enjoying your time off. Go lay out on the beach, or even better, find a handsome tourist and... Claire. Okay, okay. You're not ready. But one of these days, you will be. Until then, take care of yourself. Promise me you'll at least take a nap. Or a long shower. Without interruption. Stella sighed. It had been months since she'd had either. I promise I'll take a soak in the tub and catch up on my beauty rest. Thank you for watching the girls. Again. No problem. We enjoy having them. Honestly, it makes my life easier having them around, Claire said. The yelling and screaming in the background exposed the lie almost instantly. Right. Listen, why don't I take all four of them with me in the morning? I'll jack them up on sugar and take them out on the beach. Sounds like a fun day, right up their alley. Claire laughed. I promise to bring them back worn out, fed, and ready for bed. Stella hoped she had enough money in the bank account for a pizza party with the girls after today's mortgage payment. Sounds good to me. See you in the morning. Now go, nap. Do something nice for yourself. Claire hung up before Stella could respond, when the yelling stopped suddenly. For a split second, Stella wondered what was going on at her friend's house. Then she shrugged and let it go. Claire could handle whatever was happening, and if it was serious, she'd give her a call. Shoving her phone into the back pocket of her shorts, Stella walked into the kitchen and filled a tall glass with ice. She grabbed some cold brew from the fridge and fixed herself an iced coffee adding vanilla syrup and a healthy splash of creamer. Where are you hiding? She dug around the drawer until she found one of the stainless steel straws she'd bought a few months ago and popped it into the glass. Stella walked outside, iced coffee in hand, and sat down on the back deck. The sun was hitting it in full force, and that was fine by her. Sure, it made the moisture in the thick South Carolina air condensate on the outside of the glass, but it was a small price to pay for the way the warming rays made her feel. She leaned back and closed her eyes, taking a moment to breathe and soak in the peace and quiet. A few seconds in, she noticed the voices of various birds chirping in the trees around her. More and more of them joined the chorus. The only other sounds were the distant crashing of the waves on the beach and the clinking of the ice cubes in her glass shifting as they slowly began to melt in the warm late summer temps. Stella's shoulders relaxed, and she took some time to breathe and enjoy the silence. No worrying about kids or work or bills. The tension in her body melted like butter in the hot South Carolina sun. The quiet was bliss. Except it was too quiet. The birds had stopped singing, 
and an icy shiver ran down Stella's back. She opened her eyes, struggling to adjust to the bright light. A figure was moving toward her across the yard, sidestepping the large ball Emma had begged for on her last birthday. It was yellow with red polka dots and the bane of Stella's existence. Not a day went by when it didn't fly over the fence or got stuck somewhere impossible to retrieve. She put a hand over her eyes and reached for her phone with the other. Her hackles rose when she recognized the person walking toward her. Hunter Madison. Sorry to startle you. I saw you sitting out here. The washed-up country music star grinned sheepishly. Stella lowered her arm and reminded herself to be friendly. It was how she was raised and something she tried to instill in her daughters. More or less with success. What can I do for you? Hunter took another couple of steps forward and put a hand on the rail of the stairs leading up to the deck. He wore a tight dark blue t-shirt that stretched across his chest. The muscles on his arm strained and moved as he leaned onto the rail. Stella tore her eyes from the impressive display and forced herself to look up at the man's face while she waited for an answer. I heard you're a writer. Is that true? he asked when he had her full attention. I am. Why? Stella was stunned he knew that about her. Or anything, really. I have a proposition for you. Hunter put a foot on the first rung of stairs and paused when she raised an eyebrow. He put up his hands in front of him, showing her his palms. It's a serious offer. I need the help of a writer. How do you know that I write? She asked to buy time to figure out what in the world was going on here. The guy was a total grump and hadn't seemed too pleased to be in her company the other day. Kirk mentioned something about it. I hope you'll be able to help me. He took another tentative step, and Stella motioned for him to come up and join her. What kind of content do you need help with, she asked, indicating he take a seat in one of the deck chairs. She hoped it was a memoir. It wasn't her favorite type of work, and it would potentially involve spending quite a bit of time with a guy she despised so far, but it was good money. She might even be able to put aside something for her daughter's college education. I was hoping I could interest you in writing some music with me. His lips curled up into a grin, but there was a vulnerability in his eyes that took her breath away. She was stunned. There was no way he said what he did. Music? Stella sat down in her chair and picked up her iced coffee. The damp glass slipped in her hand. She caught it and took a sip before setting it back down. Can you say that again? I'm stuck on this song and was hoping having someone to bounce ideas off of would help. He shrugged, the smile gone. I'm not that kind of writer, Stella said. Maybe not, but you have a way with words. I think you'd be better at it than I am, Hunter said. There was an undercurrent to his words she couldn't quite put her finger on. It confused her. The whole offer and conversation did. What exactly are you talking about, Mr. Madison? Hunter. Please. The man stretched out his legs in front of him and interlocked his hands behind his head. Look, I'm in a bit of a pickle. I haven't exactly made the best decisions over the past few years. The comment earned him a snort from her. Hunter raised an eyebrow, but continued when she didn't say anything. Here's the thing. I need to come out with a new album by the end of the year. It's been a while since I've written anything good, and I'm a bit rusty. I don't write music. I don't even play an instrument, Stella said. She couldn't wrap her head around what the man was thinking. She wasn't a musician. Sure, she'd written poetry since she was a teen, but that was different. I'm not expecting you to write the music. What I need help with is lyrics. He got up and started pacing the length of the deck. Look, I've been out of the game for a while. Things have changed in the industry. I need to come up with something current. Something good. What I really need is something that makes it back onto the charts, and maybe a woman's perspective on some of the new material would help. He turned to look at her. I've written some poetry, she said before she had a chance to think about it. That's perfect. Can I see it? Hunter walked toward her. 
Stella shook her head. It's private. So are songs. The best lyrics come from the heart. Stuff that makes you bleed to get it on the page. I really don't think that's something I would be any good at. Stella rose and crossed her arms, hoping he'd get the message, leave, and forget all about this. I'll pay you, of course. Ten thousand dollars for your help for a few weeks. If it works out, we can negotiate collaboration on the whole album. Are you serious? Stella asked, her hands dropping to her side. I thought you were broke. Not yet, and I'm dead serious. When can you start? Chapter 8 You're actually serious. Stella Wilson shook her head. The light of the sun bounced off the strands as they moved around, making them look almost coppery. I am, he said. He wasn't completely broke. Yet. And if the petite woman in front of him could help him through whatever mad case of writer's block was slowing him down, it would be money well spent. Besides, his gut told him this was the right move, and it had never led him astray. And you actually think I can pull this off? I wouldn't even know where to begin. You could start by showing me some of that poetry of yours. Grab it and meet me at my place. I'll order some pizza, and you can listen to some of the tunes I need lyrics for. He turned and jogged down the steps leading from the deck to the backyard. I don't know about that. Stella stood on the deck with her arms crossed when he stopped and turned at the sound of her voice. I don't have to see everything. Some of that stuff is personal, I get it. Just bring what you're comfortable sharing. Something in her stance changed, and he knew he had her. Now, she asked. Yes, bring the kids. I have a pool table upstairs. Hunter turned back and made his way across the backyard. Unless you're not interested. He raised his hand and waved before hopping over the low fence that separated their properties. He had no doubt she'd show up. Working around her daughters would make things a bit more difficult. He didn't like interruptions when he really got into a song, but they'd figure it out. Stella sparked something in his imagination. The thought of having her in his house, creating that special kind of poetry that made up a great country song, lit him up. He felt himself humming a new tune under his breath as he crossed his deck and walked into his house, leaving the sliding glass door open. The breeze off the water blew the sheer curtains into the living room as Hunter walked through it and into the kitchen. He grabbed two bottles of sparkling water from the fridge and made his way to his studio when his phone rang. How are the songs coming along? Kirk asked when Hunter answered. He placed the bottles on a stack of papers on his desk and plopped into the high back leather office chair with lumbar support. It's going. That bad? Kirk asked. Hunter shrugged. Yeah. But I have it under control. My muse is on her way over here. Sure, that's a good idea. You've been dry for a couple of weeks. Chill. I'm not having booze delivered. I'm sticking to mineral water. He reached up and clanked the green glass bottles against each other, realizing they were leaving a ring of liquid on the sheets that held his latest attempt at writing the next big hit. He was pretty sure he caught it in time and the pages would dry, but if the ink ran, it was no huge loss. What's your muse, then? Kirk sounded even more worried and suspicious. Not a what, a who. Stella from next door. The mom? I thought you disliked her. Hunter rocked back in his chair. I wouldn't say I dislike her. Kirk barked out a laugh at the other end of the line. Sure, she's been a thorn in my side with this whole, calling the police and stuff, but she had a point. The guys get a bit rambunctious when they've had a few too many. Which is every day. Please tell me they're not coming back, Kirk said. Stop worrying like an old hen. They are gone, and I'm in serious work mode. Which is why I need Stella. I need help with the lyrics. And she's agreed to help you out of the goodness of her heart? Kirk asked. That and the ten grand I promised her if we can come up with a halfway decent song. All I need is one hit, and we'll be back in business. 
You did what? Kirk's voice rose an octave. I looked at the accounts. I can afford it. It'll be the best $10,000 I'll spend all year. Hunter cracked one of the mineral waters open and took a sip. You're probably right. Are you sure though? She's no musician. It was your idea. You're the one who told me she's a writer, Hunter said. To explain that she was home all day, working from her house. Not for you to go out and pay her like she's a professional songwriter. Hunter sat the bottle back down, careful to avoid anything he'd written that might have some merit, or was at least salvageable, for the new album. Kirk, I need someone to work with, to bounce ideas off. Someone who challenges me and brings something fresh to the table. Well, from what I've seen of Stella Wilson, she won't hold back when it comes to calling you out. Maybe she is what you need. His manager sounded appeased. I'll find out as soon as she shows up. She's on her way over here. At least, he hoped she was. Oh. Okay. I'll let you get to work then. Keep me posted. Kirk hung up, and Hunter shoved his phone in his back pocket. He was rifling through papers and wondering if he'd misjudged her when her voice rang out. Hunter? Come on in, down the hall and to your right, he called, taking a deep breath to calm his nerves. He was too old to get the jitters the first time a pretty woman came to his house. Of course, this was different. She was here to potentially work on his music. It took the intimacy and the potential for colossal failure to a whole different level. And from what he could tell, she didn't even particularly like country music. Inviting her had been a horrible idea. Hey. Stella stood in the doorway, holding a couple of notebooks like a shield in front of her. Hey. Does this mean you want to work with me? He asked. I'm interested in at least giving it a try. What about your daughters? He asked, looking through the door behind her. There were no signs of the girls he'd seen playing in the backyard next door. Abigail and Emma are at a friend's house for the day. Great. Take a seat. Water? He offered her the untouched bottle and motioned to the caramel brown leather sofa that spanned the length of the back wall. It was the most comfortable piece of furniture in his house and one of the few things he'd chosen himself. His interior designer had pitched a fit but he'd stood his ground. The leather was soft as butter and there was no better place to take a nap. Thanks. I brought these. She sat the notebooks down on the glass coffee table in front of her. Let's take a look. He moved to sit next to her and swore she flinched when he picked up the first of the books. If that's okay. Stella swallowed hard, barely perched on the couch. She nodded. Hunter picked a wad of crumpled up papers off the floor. Smoothing them out first, he handed them to her. This is what I've been working on. It didn't go so well, he said with a wry smile. Stella glanced at the papers, then looked back up. He felt her eyes on him as he cracked the notebook open and flipped through the pages. A line caught his attention, and he started to read the verse. What do you think? Stella's voice was shaky. Hunter looked up, surprised. The simple little poem had absorbed him. This is good. He resisted the urge to hum the melody that was forming in the back of his mind. She had the makings of a sorrowful ballad that would bring tears to the eyes of even his rowdiest fans here. But this was her intellectual property, not something for him to change and twist into a song. This isn't half bad either. Do you have a pen? Stella's eyes were on the lyrics he'd been antagonizing over for days. The music had come easily, but the words didn't come together. Sure. Hunter strode to his desk and rummaged around until he found one and handed it to her. Not bad, she muttered under her breath as she crossed words out and scribbled new ones. She scooted back and kicked off her sandals. It was fascinating and terrifying to watch as she tore his lyrics apart. Didn't you say something about pizza? Stella asked. Hunter looked up at the clock made from one of his early records that had gone platinum. It was getting late, and his own stomach growled in agreement. 
I did, didn't I? What do you like? The Greek pizza from the brick oven is pretty good, she said distractedly, scribbling more words. Hand me that red notebook, would you? It was one of the few she'd brought. He did as she asked and watched her thumb halfway through until she got to a blank page and started writing. I'll place the order, he said, grabbing his phone and stepping out of the room to let her work. They'd been at it for a solid hour, and she'd come up with some pretty decent lines. He didn't think they'd work, but it was an improvement from what he'd come up with. Pizza should be here in half an hour. Wanna sit outside and take a break? You're welcome to take a dip in the pool. The offer had nothing to do with the fact that he wouldn't mind seeing the woman sitting on his couch in a bathing suit. Stella shook her head without looking at him and tore a page from her notebook. I think we might have something here. Take a look. Her face was serious, and Hunter realized that what he wanted more than seeing her in a bikini was seeing her smile. A real smile, not the polite one she'd occasionally given him since the day he moved in. He wanted to see her face light up. He'd bet good money he didn't have that she'd be even more gorgeous with a huge smile on that beautiful face of hers. I'm sure it needs some work and I don't know if it would make a good song, but it flows. She stood up and slipped back into her sandals. Do you mind if I call to check in on my kids while you read? Of course. Warmth crept into his neck. He hadn't thought about her daughters or who was caring for them while they worked. Before he could say another word, Stella walked out of the room. He read through the poem. He recognized some of the phrases and basic ideas from what he'd worked on. Stella was right. It flowed much better, but it was more than that. She'd managed to capture the concept he'd wrestled with and put it into a set of beautiful words. It wasn't a song, but it got them a step closer to what he needed. Everything okay with the girls? he asked, walking out to the deck, still holding the piece of paper she'd handed him. They're fine. I can stay another hour before I have to head back. What did you think? She turned and pulled the elastic out of her hair, letting the long locks fall across her shoulders. Stella wasn't looking at him. She was gazing out across the waterway and the marsh beyond. It's good. But? It won't quite work with the music, and we need to work on a bridge. He stepped up beside her. Stella turned and looked at him. A bridge? Don't worry about it. The important part is that this is a huge step in the right direction. This right here, he held up the paper and waved it around. This is so much better than what I tried to put down. I think we've found the chorus, too. He softly sang the last four lines she'd written. It was a touch clunky, but it captured what he'd wanted, and with a few tweaks, it would flow like butter melting in the hot summer sun. Do that again, Stella said, turning to fully face him. He did as asked, and her face transformed from disbelief, tinged with a bit of curiosity into a huge smile that spread from ear to ear as he belted out the verse. He'd been right. She was even more stunning with a genuine smile on her face. He'd never forget this moment. He could feel it deep in his bones. It had felt that way when he'd written his first hit song. Long before he had a record label. Back in the days when he'd shared a crappy little apartment with four other musicians trying to break into the industry. This, though, felt different. More powerful. And for the first time in a very long time, Hunter Madison was looking forward to what tomorrow would bring. Chapter 9 Stella pushed her chair back and rose. She shut her laptop and picked up her phone. It was time to make the call she'd been dreading. Less than 48 hours ago, Hunter Madison, her crazy next-door neighbor, had offered her an insane amount of money to help write the lyrics of his next album. Since then, she'd read everything she could get her hands on about writing music. Not that it had helped much. Hunter was crazy if he really thought she could pull this off. This is not the kind of writer I am, she told herself, for the tenth time. Except maybe it was. They'd worked well together and at the end of the day, song lyrics were their own kind of poetry. 
She sighed and scrolled through her contacts until she found the number he'd put into her phone before she left his music room the other day. Hunter? The one and only. His voice was full of confidence. It's Stella from next door, she said, sounding awkward even to her own ears. Annoyed at herself, she began pacing through the kitchen and living room. I know. What's up? Ready to get to work, he asked. His tone was friendly, but not overly excited. Somehow, that made it easier. She'd been worried he was sitting over there on his teakwood deck, anxiously waiting for her to get back to him after asking for a little time to think his offer over. I'm still not sure I can pull this off, Stella said. She squared her shoulders and took a wide stance, trying to make herself feel more confident than she was. But I'm willing to give it a try. If you're still interested. I'm interested. Why don't you come over now? I have a couple of things I'd like to run by you, he said. Stella swallowed, and according to the clock on the microwave, she had a couple of hours until she had to get into the school pickup line. Unless you're busy with your daughters, of course. Maybe. Now works. I'll be right over. She hung up before she could change her mind and raced upstairs to look for something more presentable to wear than her usual denim shorts and faded t-shirts. They might serve as appropriate work attire for her usual at-home writing jobs, but this was different. She pulled an old linen dress from her closet. Dan had always liked it on her. Fifteen minutes later, she locked the door behind her and made her way down the sidewalk to Hunter's house her sandals softly clapping on the concrete with each step. She rang the doorbell, and Hunter answered. One of his eyebrows raised high enough, it almost touched his hairline. You could have come through the back like last time, he said, stepping aside and motioning for her to enter his home. I could have. But this had felt more professional to her. Why didn't you? Hunter folded his arms across his chest the move stretching the fabric and flexing his impressive upper arms and shoulders. Stella resisted the urge to lick her lips. Keeping this professional, or getting it there in the first place, was going to be a little more challenging than she'd hoped it would be. But the man was paying her. And paying her well. If we'll be working together, I think we need to talk about some ground rules and expectations. She squared her own shoulders and looked him straight in the eye. Beautiful baby blue eyes with long lashes she hadn't noticed before. Okay. Would you like to do that over a cup of coffee? Hunter asked. He stepped back and motioned for her to enter his home. The foyer was nothing like what she'd expected. She'd been tempted to go to one of the open houses when the place was up for sale but chickened out at the last minute when Claire had to back out. This is nice, Stella said when they walked into the formal living room off the large entrance foyer. You sound so surprised. Hunter's lip rose into a resemblance of a smile. It's very different from your music room, she said, choosing the diplomatic route. Hunter laughed. You're not wrong. My manager hired an interior designer when I bought the house. She did all this. He waved his hand around and motioned for her to take a seat on the white leather sofa. But not the music room. Stella looked around. This was nothing like the cozy room with the worn leather couch. She sat down, crossed her ankles, and put her purse on the floor. No. It's furnished with things I've had for ages. I need a place that has the right vibe. Know what I mean? He sat down in the chair across from her looking about as comfortable as she felt. Can I get you that coffee? Coffee would be nice. And it would give her hands something to do. Coming right up. Hunter rose and strode out of the room. Stella looked around. It was obvious no one but the maid stepped in here. It wasn't a home. It was something out of those high-end magazines Claire subscribed to. A showcase. She rose and walked around the room, looking at the few images scattered around. All were professional shots of Hunter. In some of them, it was him posing, often with a guitar and a fancy cowboy hat. Others were shots with what she assumed were other musicians. 
A few had celebrities in them she recognized. A few actors, and a politician she remembered from TV. Only one picture was different. It felt more casual, maybe even personal. It was of a much younger hunter and a pretty blonde woman. The two of them looked at each other adoringly. It almost felt like an engagement shot. Stella sat back down when Hunter's footsteps echoed across the floor. The last thing she needed was for him to catch her snooping around. Is milk okay? I don't have cream. He put a bamboo serving tray down that held two cups of coffee on saucers, along with a sugar container and a small pitcher for the milk. Milk is perfect. She accepted the cup and added enough milk and sugar to make it drinkable. Claire made fun of her, accusing her of not actually liking coffee. She took a sip and sighed. It was perfect. Hunter took his coffee black. He sat back in the chair and watched her. You were saying something about ground rules? Let me make sure I got this right, Hunter said half an hour later. No late nights. No work during school runs. No, involving your girls. And no hanky-panky. Stella felt her face burning. I didn't say it like that. I said we should keep our relationship professional. We work together, and we're neighbors. Right. No dates, no gifts, and no conversations that could be misconstrued as friendship. Got it. He sat his cup down, making the small plate clank against the glass table. I didn't mean it like that, either. Stella sighed. This was harder than expected. She liked this hunter. The sober one. Maybe a little too much. Thus the need for rules. How about this? No dates, no kissing, but you let me take you and the girls out to lunch. Neighbors should be friendly, right? He looked at her from under those long lashes of his, his face carefully guarded. I can live with that. Good. Does that mean we can get back to talking about music? He asked, leaning back in the chair, looking infinitely more relaxed than she felt. Yes. Why do I feel there's a but coming? Hunter asked. I have a confession to make. Stella swallowed and said a quick little prayer in her mind that this wouldn't be a deal-breaker for the man across from her. She needed this money. It would go a long way to help pay for the girl's education. Let me guess. You're not really a coffee drinker, he said with a grin. Stella shook her head. Worse. I don't exactly care about country music. Or listen to it. Hunter laughed. I had a feeling you weren't a fan when you had no idea who I was. I actually like that about you. You like that I don't like country music? Stella sat up and put her own cup down. Hunter shook his head, still looking amused. I like that you're not some huge fan, trying to sneak her way into my life. If you are, you should change jobs from writing to acting. Stella's lips twitched. Trust me. I'm not. What kind of music do you listen to? He asked. Mostly, what's on the radio? Pop. Some instrumental stuff, while I work. She'd never been big into music. But definitely no country music? Definitely not. Never cared for that twangy stuff that country music cranks out. She had no idea why it was so popular with some people. Enough of them to earn Hunter several platinum albums from the look of it. I guess that means you never listen to any of the good stuff. Hunter rose and walked to a credenza that held a turntable and a set of small speakers. I guess not, Stella agreed, relieved this wasn't a deal breaker for him. How much do you know about the origins of music in America? he asked. Honestly, not much. I know there are gospels and stuff. Music has always been something that plays in the background. Something to dance to. I never studied it or anything. Stella shrugged. Let me know what you think about this. He put on a record and a familiar rock song started to play. I love that song, Stella said. But that's not country music. Her toes were tapping to the upbeat sound. 
They listened to it for a few minutes before Hunter turned it off and pulled out his phone to play a pop song that had topped the charts a few months ago. Again, not country music, but one of my daughter's favorites. She hummed along to the poppy tune. Ashley is one of the biggest new names in country music. You should listen to some of her other stuff. Hunter tapped on his phone and something new began to play that sounded distinctly more country. It had that whiny steel guitar sound, but it was definitely by the same artist. The voice was easily recognizable. I had no idea. Stella wondered what Abigail would think of this side of her favorite singer. How about this? He pulled another album from the vast collection inside the credenza. A soft melody she didn't recognize began to play. A hauntingly beautiful female voice joined in. Stella leaned her head to the side and closed her eyes, focusing on nothing but the music until it suddenly stopped. Hunter stood next to the turntable, his eyes on her. She didn't need to hear the words to recognize the question on his mind. I think you're right. I didn't listen to the right stuff. Some of this isn't half bad, and I liked whatever that last one was, she said. That earned her a smile. Ready to hear some of my stuff? Hunter asked. Bring it on. Stella scooted back and crossed her legs. Let's start with some of my older stuff. This was my first hit single. He played her an upbeat tune with a 90s vibe to it that was still distinctly country. It wasn't her cup of tea, but she could see the commercial appeal, picturing a younger Hunter rocking it out with a guitar on stage. This was from my first full album. Hunter went through several songs until something caught her attention. Play that last one again, she said. He did as she asked, and they both listened to the song from beginning to end. It was part love song, part dance tune. Most importantly, though, it had an amazing story and a melody that made you feel something. Stella couldn't quite put her finger on it. I think I know what you should write, she said. What we should write, he corrected. What's that? He sat down in the chair. Stella felt his total attention on her and almost backed out. But this was what he'd hired her for. I've done a little reading over the past few days, she said. I think you should work on a concept album based on that song. Develop the story. Play with the melody. Hunter rubbed his chin. Not a bad thought. The song was a pretty big hit, but not so big that everyone got tired of it. You might be onto something. Stella pulled her red notebook from her bag. Who was this song about, she asked. The first girl I was seriously in love with, he said. What happened? Stella dug around for her pen and flipped through the book until she found a blank page. I asked her out, and she turned me down. Hunter shrugged. And she turned me down. I like that, we can work with that. How about a thread through the album of you asking her out again, and again? In different ways, different words. The songs pulling in bits and pieces of stuff I've written over the years. Influences from some of the big names I admired and learned from along the way. Hunter stood up and walked out of the room. He turned around in the doorway. Write that down, would you? She scribbled notes until he returned moments later, guitar in hand. We could start with a tribute to some of the greats from the 40s and 50s. She listened to him play a beautiful little song that morphed into something more upbeat and modern, that made her tap her pen in time with the beat. I like that. A lot. I think we're onto something here. Hunter kept playing with different themes and sounds. Stella made notes and wrote a few lines that continued the story. She watched Hunter grow more and more excited about the concept album idea. He was glowing and full of life. She could see glimpses of the young man in the picture on the desk in the corner. And the one from the concert shots in his office. There was something about Hunter when he was completely in his element, absorbed by the music. It changed him. She'd always thought he was a good-looking guy for his age, but now she could see why some of his female fans would go to extreme measures to get closer to him. And why so many of them used to show up to his concerts. 
Maybe there was something special about a guy with a guitar laying it all out. She shook her head and glanced down at her phone. Oh, gosh, I didn't realize how late it was. I have to run and pick up my girls. Stella shoved her notebook and pen into her purse and rose. She couldn't believe how long she'd been over here. She wasn't one to lose track of time unless she really got into her writing. In a way, this had felt similar. Something she'd have to contemplate later, because she was definitely going to be late. Why don't you bring them back here when you're back? I'd love to meet them. Hunter sat down the guitar and walked her to the door. Stella hesitated for a split second before running out the door. Maybe later, she called over her shoulder, not sure she was ready to introduce her girls to Hunter Madison. Chapter 10 How's the new album coming along? Kirk asked. Got a name for me yet? The two men were sitting on the back deck, drinking mineral water and enjoying the warm morning sun on their faces. No name yet, but other than that, it's going great. We're coming up with a lot of new material. Hunter leaned back and closed his eyes, relishing the heat. When do you think you'll be ready to hit the studio? It'll take some planning to get it booked and find some musicians to play with you. Kirk sat up and put down his glass. I don't think we're at that point yet. Most of what we have are lyrics. It'll take me a while to write and arrange the music. But I'm feeling good about this, man. This album is gonna be something special. Critical acclaim special, or commercial success special? Kirk asked, his brows knit together. Stop worrying. It's going to put me back on top. It's going to make all of us a lot of money. Not a doubt in my mind. Hunter was surprised by how much he meant it. They had something, he and Stella. They were working on their own kind of music, putting their heads together in his music room. Do you still like working with her? Your muse? Kirk nodded in the direction of the house next door. I do. She's good with words. Really good. If she was living in Nashville, she'd be writing with the best. He had no doubt in his mind about that. The girl had mad talent. I guess that means you're not regretting the offer you made her. Ten grand for a co-writing gig is a lot of money for someone completely green. Kirk shook his head. Trust me, it'll be the best ten grand I'll spend all year. Speaking of which. He turned to face his manager. I'm not gonna like this, am I? Kirk asked. Since the Nashville house sold and we have some cash, I was thinking it would be nice to set up a little studio here. Nothing fancy. Just a place to lay down some demo tracks wouldn't take much to convert one of those bedrooms. We sold the place that has a state-of-the-art studio in it, and now you want to build one. You're not making sense, Hunter. I'm not talking about a lot of money. We can grab some used equipment. There's probably some of my old stuff in storage somewhere. I'll do the soundproofing myself. It'll be like back in the good old days. He put a hand on the other man's shoulder. Kirk chuckled. Back when we recorded your first demo in the closet with a tape deck? I was hoping for something a little higher quality and roomier. But yeah, that's the idea. A place to capture the raw stuff. We can produce in Nashville, but I'd like to get most of the prep work done here. What do you say? I'll put some feelers out and see what I can find. Cash flow is looking better. I had a call with Martin this morning. You might even be able to pay back some of the money you owe the IRS, Kirk said. Let's not go crazy here. That's money I raised to reinvest into the music. They can have a fat check when this album tops the charts. Hunter looked up when he saw movement next door. Stella's daughters ran into the backyard to play. It's nice to see you this confident and inspired. It's been a while. Kirk leaned back and kicked his feet out in front of him. And maybe you're right. There's something special about this place. That or what they say about ions and the ocean is true. What do they say? Hunter asked. He had no idea what Kirk was talking about. I don't know. 
something about it helping your brain work better or something. Ask a scientist. I'm not that smart. You're plenty smart for me. Hunter felt an immense sense of gratitude that Kirk hadn't left him to his own devices. He'd be lost without the man taking care of all that business stuff that bored him to death. Kirk had done right by him more times than he could count over the years, and he'd return the favor, no matter how many songs and albums it took. Hey, mister. Could you help me over here? My ball is in your pool. One of Stella's daughters, the younger one, stood at the fence that divided their property. The gate was closed, and Stella must have told them not to use it. You've got it, Peanut. Hunter leaped over the rail instead of taking the steps, earning him a gasp from the girls and a groan from Kirk. He strolled down to the pool, doing his best to hide the ache in his knee. He was getting a little old for those types of stunts. He fished the ball out and tossed it to the girl, water trailing behind it, leaving a mark on the concrete. My name isn't Peanut. It's Emma. The girl caught the ball and grinned at him, revealing a missing front tooth. It's nice to meet you, Emma. I'm Hunter. He waved at her. Thanks, Mr. Hunter. Emma turned and ran to her sister. The two girls stood by the swing set, heads together, whispering. You haven't met her daughters? Kirk asked when Hunter joined him. Stella didn't think it was a good idea. Too soon, or something. Or something. Kirk smirked. I better get going. Good luck with the writing. I'll call you about the recording equipment, he said and left. Hunter stayed where he was at, on his back deck, hoping the girl's mother would join them. I like this. Let me play with it. Hunter rose to grab one of the acoustic guitars. He sat down across from Stella and pulled the red notebook toward him. Stella scooted back, tucking her legs beside her on the couch. She looked comfortable there. Like she belonged. It surprised him how much this woman had become part of his life, his music, in such a short amount of time. He cleared his throat, tuned the guitar a bit, and stormed a few chords. He softly sang the first few lines. Stella joined in during the chorus. Her voice was pure, clear, and beautiful. Hunter stopped playing and stared at her. What? She looked up, eyes wide, lips parted the tiniest bit. Have you ever thought about singing? Professionally? Hunter asked. She waved him off. I only sing in the shower, where I won't embarrass myself. Hunter grinned and looked around the room. Doesn't look like a shower to me. Stella let out a nervous laugh. Right. I got caught up in the moment. Forget it ever happened. She rose and glanced at her phone. Don't run off. I'm serious. You have an amazing voice. He strummed his guitar again and sang the next verse. Stella sat back down, not looking nearly as comfortable as she had moments ago. Still stunning, though. Hunter couldn't keep his eyes off the woman who'd helped him write some of the best material he'd produced in years. She had a way with words. There was no doubt about that. Play that last part again, but maybe emphasize the part about his loss a little more, she said. He did as she asked. I like it. Good catch. And here, during the chorus, what if we changed we are to we were? I think it'll flow better. She hummed the line. Hunter nodded. It does. I'm glad I asked you to write with me. You're exactly what my music needed. What's that? She asked, taking the notebook and writing down the changes they'd made. I don't know. A female touch, maybe. Hunter laughed. That sounds so cliche, but it's true. You've helped me create some amazing songs. Her cheeks turned pink, and her eyes stayed on the pages of the notebook. Thanks. I'm serious. We have enough for a couple of albums here, and the inspiration doesn't stop flowing. The hard part is going to be picking and choosing what to put on the album. You really think so, don't you? That this is good enough. Stella slid the book back to him. 
not a doubt in my mind. Did I tell you what I call you when I talk to Kirk? He asked, playing the melody of the song. Kirk, your manager? Hunter nodded. My muse. I call you my muse. I'm not a muse. I'm a mom, and I make a decent living for me and my girls with my writing, but I'm no one's muse. Stella shook her head. Forget I said anything. Let's give this another go. Would you mind singing the first two verses and the chorus? I want to try something. Hunter hated how uncomfortable he made her with his comment. You've got it. Stella sang the moment he began to play again. At first, her voice was soft. He could hear the hesitancy in it. He hummed a harmony during the chorus. Again. This time, Stella sang with more confidence, and he joined during the chorus, his voice mingling with hers, giving the simple melody more complexity. I like that. Stella stared at him, and for the first time he saw something there. He wasn't sure what it was, but something had changed between them. Maybe it was the way she looked at him. A look that said she wasn't just seeing him as an employer or the annoying guy next door that disrupted her life. It scared the crap out of him. He shut the notebook and set it to the side. Good work today. I think we can call it quits for now. Let me work on the music, and we'll pick back up on the writing tomorrow. Sound good? The relief he saw wash across her face mirrored his own. Sounds perfect. That gives me just enough time to run to the store before I have to pick up the girls. Hunter waited for her to leave the house before he picked up his guitar again. He strummed it, playing with the harmonies while he tried to come to terms with what all of this meant. There was a spark between them, and he was pretty sure there was interest on her part. Or at least some attraction that hadn't been there before. Question was, what was he going to do about that? He liked Stella. Liked her in a way he hadn't cared for another woman in a very long time. This wasn't the purely physical attraction he'd felt for women over the years. This was deeper. His eyes flew to the picture of Elena. She'd want him to be happy. But this wasn't just about him. Or even him and Stella. She had two sweet little girls to take care of. And he was in no position to build a life with them. Not while his own life was a train wreck. One he was trying to save, but that would take all his time, energy, and attention. Besides, Stella didn't need a guy like him as anything more than a friend. Hunter nodded. A friend. He could do that. He could be the friend who shared his love for music and helped her set up a nice fat college fund for her daughters. The melody that played in his head was slow and melancholic. Not country music chart material but it would round out the album nicely. He replayed the tune and scribbled down notes, capturing the music on paper before it could disappear into thin air. Chapter 11 Are you sure Michael doesn't mind watching all four of the girls? Stella asked for the third time as they pulled up to Mary's diner. I'm positive. He's the one who brought it up. Stop worrying. If something happens, or it gets too much for that sweet husband of mine, he'll call, and we can be back at the house in ten minutes. Claire got out of the car and headed straight for the door. Welcome to Mary's. Just the two of you? The young hostess asked. Yes, ma'am. Girls' night. Claire winked at the girl, who gave her an understanding nod. I have the perfect table for the two of you. Out of the way, so you can talk and no one will judge if you order a bunch of extra fries. She grabbed two menus and walked toward the back of the main dining room. Or a couple of margaritas, Claire said. I don't know if they have anything like that. Stella had been to Mary's diner quite a few times since moving here, but always with the girls and usually with Dan as well. They served beer here and probably some wine, but cocktails were a different story and not something she indulged in, especially not since having kids who woke up at the crack of dawn. We'll figure it out. And we'll have fun. I need this. Claire took her seat and accepted the menu. Stella slid onto the bench on the opposite side of the booth and flipped the menu open. 
no hard liquor drinks. And I should probably stick to sweet tea. You drink tea every day. At least have a glass of wine with me. It isn't a girl's night out without wine. Claire scanned the list of appetizers. I can put in some drinks for you, if you'd like. Otherwise, your server will be right with you. The hostess took a step back. She didn't look all that much older than Abigail. There was no way Stella could ask her for a glass of wine. We'll wait, Claire said. It'll give us a chance to look through the drink menu. Great. Jenny will be right with you. She turned on heels no one in the restaurant industry would make a career in and left as fast as she could. I think you scared her away, Stella said, looking through the salads. The diner didn't have a vast selection of healthy fare, but she remembered the Greek salad was decent. Oh, please. I'm sure she's seen worse. I'm excited and in desperate need to de-stress. Can you blame me? Claire ran her finger down the menu. From what Stella could see, her usually health-conscious friend was not planning on sticking to any of the lighter fare. What's going on? Mostly work. One of the other nurses is out sick for a couple of weeks, and we're spread too thin already. Stella took a good look at her friend and noticed the hint of dark rings under Claire's eyes, mostly covered by concealer. You need to take care of yourself. Look who's talking. Claire laughed. I had to drag you in here kicking and screaming. It wasn't that bad. Stella shrugged and glanced at the burgers and sandwiches on the menu. You were planning on working tonight. And you don't even have a deadline. Tell me this isn't a much better way to spend a Friday night. Claire's eyes were blazing. This is nice. And for the record, it wasn't one of my regular writing jobs. I was planning on going over some lyrics I've been working on with Hunter. Before Claire could respond, their server walked up to the booth. I'm Jenny, and I'll be your server tonight. What can I start you ladies off with? We'll have two glasses of Chardonnay and the crab dip to start. Oh, and an order of cheese fries. Claire looked at Stella. Anything else? A glass of water would be great. Stella managed not to roll her eyes at her friend's order. I didn't realize we were doing appetizers, she said after Jenny was out of earshot. We are. And a meal after. I'm buying. Now tell me about Hunter. How are things going? Claire leaned forward, ready for gossip. I think it's going pretty well. He seems to like my work. Just your work? Claire wriggled her eyebrows. I saw the way he looked at you. I think he likes you. Don't be ridiculous. That man could have any woman he wants. Have you seen the way those concert groupies act? Besides, I can't compete with those women in Nashville. The ones with more money than they know how to spend. Stella shook her head. Interesting. Claire leaned back into the back cushion of the booth and crossed her legs. What? Stella had a feeling she had just taken some bait, without realizing it. You like him. Claire nodded to herself. You like Hunter Madison. Don't be ridiculous. You know how I've felt about the man, since the day he moved in. Sure, we get along, and he's paying me good money, to write with him. But I don't like him. Keep lying to yourself if you want, but we've been friends for a very long time. I can tell when you start to fall for a guy. I bet if we'd known each other in high school, I would have realized you were in love with Dan before you did. I did with most of my girlfriends back then. Claire grinned confidently. Stella remembered the day she first fell in love with her husband. They'd gone to high school together, and he was the captain of the basketball team. She'd been over the moon when he'd asked her to the spring dance. Hunter is nothing like Dan. Let me ask you this, then. Do you enjoy working with the man? After everything he put you and your kids through since he moved here? Claire asked. Honestly, I do. He's a totally different person when he's not partying with his guys. He's, she searched for the right words. Mellow, almost a little depressed. 
and he puts everything into his music. You should hear some of the stuff we're working on. I'd love to. I've listened to some of his old albums. He's not half bad. And like his music or not, the man can sing. Stella laughed. He does have a good voice. And he's a talented musician and writer. I'm learning a bunch about crafting lyrics and blending them with the music. It's been pretty challenging, but also a lot of fun. Look at you, glowing like that. Are you sure there isn't more than a professional relationship between you and Hunter? Stella breathed a sigh of relief when Jenny walked up with their drinks and appetizers. Did y'all decide on a main course, or is this going to be it? Oh no, we're gonna be here, for a while. We are definitely ordering more. She'll have the mushroom Swiss burger with a side of fries, and I'll take the chicken bacon club with a side of onion rings, Claire said, ignoring Stella's protests. Anything else? I was planning on getting a salad, Stella said. Even she could hear the doubt in her voice. If that's what you want, Claire waved in front of the open menus. All I'm gonna say is this. Be prepared to watch me eat that delicious sandwich. Stella laughed at her friend's overdramatic antics. I'll take the burger and fries. She closed the menu and handed it to Jenny. Good choice. I'll go put that in for you. Enjoy the crab dip, Jenny said, and left. And the fries. I haven't split cheese fries with someone since high school. Claire forked up a couple of fries covered in melted cheese sauce. The smell made Stella's stomach growl and dissolved her last ounce of self-control. She dug in herself. I forgot how good these are. The crab dip is even better. Have some. Claire dug in and pushed the small ceramic dish her way. And tell me more about what it's like working with a big country music star. He doesn't act like he's famous or important. He's actually pretty down to earth once you get to know him. And funny. Stella smiled, thinking about the jokes he'd cracked. He never took himself too seriously and wasn't above making fun of himself when the lyrics didn't work out. Come to think of it, she couldn't remember the last time she'd laughed as much as she had while working with the man. You like him, Claire said. It's fun to work for him. And the money is good. Of course, the man had also made a regular appearance in her dreams at night. Putting his arm around her shoulder, pulling her into a warm embrace, and brushing his lips across hers. Stella felt the warmth creeping into her cheeks, and she was pretty sure it wasn't from the few sips of wine she'd had. I think it's a little more than that. Good for you, Claire said. You should go for it. Live a little. Stella blushed even more and looked down at her plate, not wanting to admit it. I can't, she said, shaking her head. I'm a single mom. I don't have time for relationships. Claire reached across the table and squeezed her hand reassuringly. I know it's hard, she said. But you shouldn't let that stop you from having a bit of fun. You never know, he might feel the same way. Stella sighed and shook her head. I doubt it, she said. He's a famous country star, and I'm just a regular person. Claire scoffed. You're not just a regular person, she said. You're intelligent, caring, and funny. I'm sure he can see that, too. You're an amazing woman, and anyone would be lucky to have you. Don't sell yourself short. Maybe Claire had a point. It was tempting to give in. But who was she kidding? Sooner or later, Hunter Madison would head back to Nashville and pick up some hot new country princess and forget all about her and her girls. Better to keep their relationship strictly platonic. I have something I want to show you, Hunter said when she walked into his house a few days later. Were you waiting for me? Stella asked. He'd pulled the door open before she had a chance to ring the bell. Yes. Like I said. I want to show you something. Come with me. He took her hand and pulled her with him as he strode down the hall and up the stairs. His grip was firm, and his hand wrapped around hers was warm and soft, aside from the calluses on his fingertips. What's this about? 
It's a surprise. Close your eyes. He pulled her to a stop in front of a door that looked like it led to a bedroom. Hunter, I think you're getting the wrong idea, Stella said. Hunter's lips twitched. No, you are. Close your eyes and don't open them until I tell you to. I promise this is strictly professional and job-related. Stella took a deep breath and did as he asked. The door creaked open and Hunter's hands were firm on her shoulders. Three steps forward, he said, gently pushing her into the room. You can open them. Stella did and tried to make sense of the scene in front of her. The walls and the ceiling of the room were covered in dark foam that looked a bit like the inside of egg crates. A large desk sat off to the side, covered in computers and what looked like a mixing board. The other side of the room held several microphone stands and a few of Hunter's favorite guitars. What is this? A recording studio. Nothing fancy, but it's enough to lay down some demos of the songs we've written. I didn't know you had a recording studio here, Stella said. It's a new addition. Figured it'd be easier than driving, who knows we're around here, to lay down some tracks, Hunter said. He walked over and flipped a few switches. Myrtle Beach, probably, Stella said. I would like to cut a demo with the new material we've been working on. Would that be okay with you? Nothing professional, but something to share with my manager and the label. Prove to them that I'm actually working on the new album. He stepped back and watched her carefully, a thoughtful look on his face. Of course. Why would I mind? You hired me to work on songs with you that you would record and publish. Her girls got so excited any time the topic came up and had spread the news about their famous songwriter mother all over school. Great. Why don't I give it a try now? You don't mind pushing a couple of buttons for me, do you? He motioned for her to take a seat at the desk. Of course not, but what about the instruments? You can't record all the music you've written. Reading music sheets was still a mystery to her, but Hunter had explained the different instruments that would make up the rich, full sound he was looking for. And he'd played plenty of examples of similar songs for her the past few weeks. That's all right. Like I said, it's just a demo to get a feel for things. I'll record the actual album in a studio in Nashville with someone who knows a lot more than I do about mixing and tuning and all that newfangled stuff they do now. He picked up a guitar, slung it across his chest and strolled over to the desk to show her what buttons she needed to push to start and end the recording. I think I can handle that, she said with a smile. Today's session with Hunter was turning out differently than what she'd expected, but this seemed fun. Keep an eye on those lights. If it starts to hit red, slide that lever down. Slowly. Doesn't take much. He walked to the microphone and turned it on. The lights on the mixing board, or whatever the thing in front of her was, came on. Testing, testing, Hunter said, looking at her. All green so far. She gave him a thumbs up. Hunter fiddled with the strings for a minute, then looked up again. Let's give this a try. Go ahead and hit record. She did as he asked and watched her neighbor transform into famous country music star Hunter Madison in front of her eyes. She couldn't put her fingers on what it was. He wore the same shorts and faded t-shirt he always had on. The foot tapping out a simple beat was in a flip-flop, and his hair was still a bit too long and bleached from the sun. But something had definitely changed. Maybe it was his posture. Or a confidence he didn't usually exude. Hunter had charisma and charm as he stood there, strumming his guitar and singing the lyrics they'd worked on together. It gave her goosebumps and made her feel like someone let a bunch of butterflies loose in her stomach. It wasn't hard to imagine him at a concert venue, rocking the stage and turning the heads and hearts of every woman there. Stella suddenly understood what drew millions of people to this man and his music. It was electrifying. You couldn't not be in a good mood with Hunter singing to you about sunshine and waves. Until the song came to an end, and he changed to a more melancholic tune. He'd written most of the words to this one. She had a feeling it was about the woman in the picture, but they'd never talked about it. 
The sweet, sorrowful melody tucked at her heartstrings, and by the time he asked her to stop the recording, she had to blink away tears. What do you think? Are those worth sharing with a few people? Hunter asked. Absolutely. That was beautiful. I'm not sure you'll need anything other than that. Stella pointed to his guitar. Hunter laughed, his eyes full of joy and pride. Trust me, it'll be even better with the full arrangement. But I appreciate the compliment. Stella swallowed hard and nodded. It was good to see him like this. Happy and definitely in his element. As far as she could tell, he hadn't had a drink since that day she found him slumped over in his hot tub. He looked better. Healthier. His face wasn't as puffy, and his color had improved significantly. Hunter hadn't said a word about alcohol. He was working hard on this album, and if she were a betting woman, she'd put money on it becoming a big hit. Maybe big enough to hang with his other record-setting albums on the wall in his music room. Still with me? Hunter asked. Stella looked up, surprised he was standing over her, turning off the mixing board. She'd been so lost in her thoughts about this man, she hadn't noticed him walking over. I'm here. Now what? Now we switch places, he said, grinning when he saw the terror she had no doubt was clearly written across her face. I'm going to take over on the mixing board and transfer the files over. I figured you might want a copy. I can send it to your phone, if you'd like. That'd be great, but will email work? I should head home. The girls will be back soon. Stella rose and stepped back so he could take a seat. Sure thing. Same time tomorrow? I want to go over the lyrics of Hurricane one more time. Something about the second verse bugs me. He was firing up the computer, pulling up a piece of software. You've got it, boss. Stella waved and left, making her way from his backyard to hers. She resisted the urge to skip or kick Emma's ball across the yard. Who knew writing songs would turn out to be so much fun? and she was getting full credit for her work. Hunter promised her name would be on the album as one of the writers, and that was something to be proud of. It had been a while since she'd been proud of something other than her beautiful daughters. She couldn't wait to play the demos for them, at least the first one. She had no doubt they would love it. Thank you. Stella raised her face up to the sky. The future seemed so much brighter than it had a few weeks ago and it had nothing to do with the brilliant sun in the sky. Hunter had opened an entirely new creative world to her, and she'd be forever grateful for the opportunity. An image of him standing in the bedroom-turned-recording studio, doing what he did best, flashed through her mind. Now, more than ever, she needed to keep her heart locked up in a box, away from him. Hunter Madison was tempting, and it would be easy to let her imagination run away with her. But she was a grown woman, a mother, and the sole provider for her little family. She didn't have time for heartbreak. And that was the only path a relationship with Hunter Madison could lead to. She wasn't the one for him, and he wasn't the one for her. That was all there was to it. Chapter 12 I sent the demo to Kirk, and he passed it on to the higher-ups at the record label, Hunter said when Stella walked back into his house a few days later. Kirk had called half an hour ago and gushed about how excited everyone at the label was for this new Hunter Madison album. What did they think? Stella watched him carefully, coming to a full stop in his living room. They loved it. He grinned, unable to hold back another second. He needed to share this victory with her. His muse. Hunter, that's amazing. I'm so happy for you. She took a few steps and stood right in front of him. For a split second, Hunter thought she was going to hug him, but then her shoulders fell and she took an awkward step back. Thanks. It's all because of you, he said. Let's get back to work. Now that they know this is in the works, they'll hound us until it's done. They kept going for hours, tweaking lyrics and polishing prose until he felt his eyes were about to cross. Let's call it a day and pick this back up tomorrow, he said. Stella rolled her shoulders and stretched her neck. 
Sounds good to me. We made some progress, but I feel like there's something missing. A song about, she looked around the room. I'm not sure what. It'll come to me. It always does. Probably in the shower. He had a flash of water running over her entire body. Shaking his head to clear the image, he stretched his arms and rose to walk her out. Do you have any plans for tonight? The usual. Dinner, homework, getting the girls settled down. Stella shrugged. Why? With the good news and all, I was hoping we could go out and celebrate. What do you say? He watched her carefully. Stella stopped and stared at him. I'm not going for a drink with you. Hunter realized the moment he heard the word drink what the problem was. She was afraid he'd turn to alcohol again, which would lead to all sorts of other problems. It hurt that she saw him that way, but he couldn't blame her. All he could do was prove her wrong. I wasn't talking about a bar. I thought we could go out to eat. With the kids, if you'd like. You wouldn't have to cook, he added, remembering his own mother getting tired of preparing meals for him, his father, and his siblings every day. I don't know. It's pretty busy this time of the year, and the girls barely know you. Hunter glanced at his watch. It's pretty early. Shouldn't be too bad yet, and we can stay on the island. Where do the girls like to eat? Mary's diner, Stella said. Mary's diner it is. And for the record, your girls and I talk all the time. I think Emma kicks that ball across the fence on purpose. He grinned at the surprise on her face. They didn't say a word. I'll talk to them, she said. No need, but the three of you can make it up to me by going out to dinner with me. Eating microwave meals by myself in front of the TV gets old. All right. Give me an hour to pick them up and get them cleaned up. Abby and Emma have been playing with their friends all day. They are sweaty messes. Stella smiled and turned. Hunter watched her until she disappeared into the house before heading upstairs to grab a shower and figure out what to wear. What was the appropriate outfit to wear when you were wooing a woman while getting to know her daughters better? He'd chosen a pair of khaki slacks and a plain, dark blue t-shirt and walked next door exactly 60 minutes later. We're almost ready, Stella called from across the room when Abigail answered the door. She was busy braiding Emma's hair. Not an easy feat from the look of it, with the girl bouncing up and down in the chair with excitement. Do you want me to drive? Hunter asked. Stella shook her head. It's easier if we use my car. Emma still needs a booster seat. I don't, Abigail said. She and her sister wore matching light blue summer dresses and white sandals. Stella looked amazing in a simple cotton sheath dress that was more pink than red and hugged her figure, just right. She slipped on a pair of heels and grabbed her purse. Ready if you are. Her eyes were blazing with excitement, and Hunter was glad he'd asked her out. I hear you guys like Mary's diner. Anything in particular that's good over there, he asked, getting into the passenger seat of Stella's car. The peanut butter pie is to die for, Abigail said, practically drooling already. And they have Dino nuggets. Mary makes them special for kids like me, Emma said. Stella buckled her seatbelt and leaned over. Picky eaters, she breathed in his ear, so soft the words didn't carry to the back seat. Peanut butter pie sounds pretty good to me, but I think I prefer burgers over chicken nuggets, he said. Dino nuggets, Emma corrected loudly. Hunter turned to the back seat. Where do you think they get the dinosaurs to make them? Emma and Abigail giggled. They just look like Dinos, Stella's oldest said. Of course. Silly me. Good thing I have the three of you with me. Hunter asked them about their friends and what they liked to do, keeping up a running conversation with the girls until they pulled into the parking lot of the diner. I am taking these three lovely ladies to dinner. Your best table, please, Hunter said, winking at the girls when they approached the hostess stand. He slipped the young woman there a $20 bill, hoping she'd play along. Of course. The hostess turned to scan the room. 
I have the perfect spot for you. They followed her to a large corner booth with a round table close to the kitchen. Will this work? Hunter asked, looking at Stella. Her lips twitched, and her eyes had those amused sparkles in them he'd come to look for. This will work. After you. Hunter motioned for Emma to slide into the booth and sat next to her after waiting for Stella and Abby to take their seats. We haven't been here in a long time, Emma said. We were here two weeks ago, Stella said, still sounding amused. I'm sure two weeks is a long time to go without that famous peanut butter pie, Hunter said, earning him a smile from both girls. It was easy to keep the conversation going. Stella's girls were bright and funny. It was easy to make them laugh, and Hunter was surprised how much their giggles meant to him. Stella looked more relaxed than he'd seen her. Even when they were deep into writing music, there was a tension in her, like she was ready to jump up and run at any second. Having her girls with her put her at ease, he guessed. And this wasn't work. They were both off the clock, so to speak. Having Stella work for him, no, with him, was complicating things more than he'd expected. Not that he'd convinced himself dating the single mom would be a good idea. For either of them. But it was getting harder to come up with reasons why exactly it was such a bad idea. You're good with them, Stella said when they disappeared into the kitchen with Mary to help cut the four slices of peanut butter pie he'd ordered for dessert after their meal. They make it easy, Hunter said, leaning back. I always wanted kids, but... Stella watched him, but didn't say a word. Hunter thought about the song he'd written, but still hadn't made a demo for. It had been about what he'd lost, including the chance to be a dad. Showing her the lyrics had been hard. Writing them had cut deeper than anything else, and he hadn't been sure how he'd handle it if she tore it apart. But Stella had just sat there on the worn leather couch and told him it was perfect as it was. He hoped she was right. He turned to look toward the kitchen. He'd said more than he'd meant to. I guess that's a conversation for another day. Looks like dessert is here. Thanks for dinner, Stella said when they pulled into her driveway. Girls, tell Mr. Madison, thank you. Thank you, they said in stereo, from the back seat. You're very welcome. And please call me Hunter, he said. If it's okay with your mom. He got out and opened the door for Abigail, holding out his hand to help her out. The young girl giggled and exited the car, finishing with a twirl on the sidewalk when he let go of her small hand. Thank you for the peanut butter pie recommendation, he said. Did you really like it? Abigail asked. And the Dino Nuggets? Emma ran around the car to join them. I enjoyed them both. Thank you for sharing a Dino Nugget with me. It had taken all he could do to choke the dry piece of breaded chicken down, but Emma had seemed happy with her choice. But if I'm honest, the pie was my favorite. Me too, Abigail said, her cheeks blushing. I think we can all agree that Miss Mary's peanut butter pie is something special. Stella locked the car and joined them. I had a nice time, Hunter said. I hope we can do this again sometime. Stella nodded. I need to get these girls settled down and ready for bed. Thanks again. It was nice not having to cook or do dishes. Her smile should have lit up the dim evening sky. You're very welcome. He wouldn't have to take more than a step to get close enough to kiss her goodnight. But this wasn't exactly a date and two pairs of curious eyes were watching his every move. See you tomorrow? I'll call you. Stella took each of her daughters by the hand and walked to the door. Bye, Mr. Hunter. Abigail waved at him. Good night. Sleep tight, he called to the three of them before turning to head down the driveway and to his house. It looked cold and empty from out here, a stark contrast to the warm and bright atmosphere at the diner. Stella and her girls represented everything he'd ever wanted. The love of a family. But she wasn't his to have. He was too broken and messed up from what life had thrown at him. Stella and her girls deserved better. Maybe one day he would be the kind of man they needed in their lives. 
but that wasn't him right now. He pulled his keys from his pocket and walked inside. Without turning on a light, he strode through the house and out the back door, to the deck. Next door, the upstairs lights turned on. He couldn't see her, but he imagined Stella putting those two sweet girls to bed and kissing them goodnight. A long while later, his heart still aching with what he would never have, he stepped into his music room and picked up a guitar. There were only two ways to deal with the storm of emotions brewing inside him, and he wasn't about to reach for a bottle. Chapter 13 I think that's a wrap, Hunter said after another long day in his little recording studio. I can't believe we recorded almost an entire album, Stella said. They'd worked on the songs almost every single day for the past six weeks. Hunter laughed. We're nowhere close. We still don't have a hit single to anchor the whole thing, and none of the songs are actually recorded or mixed. It's nowhere near done. But we're getting there. Stella wasn't about to let the man ruin this moment of triumph for her. We are. It's a big step. The studio big wigs are gonna be pleased. Why the long face, then? Stella asked, studying Hunter's expression. The smile was gone and there was little joy in his eyes. It means I'll have to go to Nashville. Eventually. He sat down his guitar and walked out of the recording room. Stella followed him down the stairs and into the music room. It was her favorite of all the places they worked in his house. It felt the most like Hunter, and it was here that he'd let his guard down a bit and dig deep to craft those lyrics that made her throat tighten and her eyes burn. When do you think you will leave, she asked. I'm not sure. It depends on when inspiration strikes, for the last few songs. Hunter sat on the couch. We'll get there, Stella assured him. Let's hope so. And let's hope it's soon. Once the studio gets the last few demos, they are going to push for a release. Thanks, by the way, he said with the most dazzling smile, only a small undercurrent of darkness remaining. For what? she asked. The label had pretty much written me off. It feels nice to have them all excited about the possibility of another hit song or two. I couldn't have done this without you. Warmth crept into Stella's cheeks. You're welcome. Glad I could help. She cleared her throat. Are you coming over for dinner tonight? We're having spaghetti and meatballs. Wouldn't miss it. And tell the girls to come over for a swim after school, he said. Playing Marco Polo in the pool had become their favorite late afternoon pastime. She didn't mind. It wore out the girls and made bedtime so much easier. I will. See you at seven. She walked out the back and passed the pool her daughters had basically taken over, thanks to Hunter's generosity. The four of them had grown close over the latter part of the summer. Since that night at the diner, Stella had invited him over for dinner with her and the girls a few nights a week. She was taking pity on a lonely man who hadn't had a home-cooked meal in way too long. At least that was the story she kept telling herself. In truth, it was nice to have another adult at the dinner table. Except, it wouldn't be for much longer. Stella opened the door to her house and walked inside. It was quiet, as always, this time of the day. Usually, she enjoyed the solitude and chance to hear herself think. Today, it felt heavy. Like there was something missing. Stella pulled a pack of ground beef from the freezer and sat it in a bowl of cool water to thaw before heading upstairs for a quick shower. She made herself a cup of coffee and worked on her much-neglected freelance projects, which were due next week, before heading out to pick the girls up from school. How was your day? she asked Emma when the young girl climbed into the car. Paisley followed close behind. I made a new friend. Her name is Sissy, Emma said. She tossed her bag on the floorboard and buckled in. Stella's youngest was getting the hang of the car line routine. I know her too. She's nice. Paisley nodded, shrugging out of her cardigan before bucking in. That's great. Where does she live? Stella asked, pulling out of the car line. 
Out of the corner of the rearview mirror, she saw both girls shrug. I don't know, Emma said. All right. I'll see if I can find out who moved to the island recently. Maybe we can invite Sissy over for a play date. Stella turned to loop around the building to the car line for the older kids. Mama, this is going to take forever. Emma peeked out the window, making a long face. They're already out. It'll go quickly. And guess what? Stella turned when her car came to a stop to look at her passengers. What? the girls asked. I brought you a snack. She pulled a small bag of trail mix from her purse and handed it to the girls. Fridays were rough, with everyone worn out from a long week of school and work. The sweet treat was well received, and the girls were happily chatting away about sissy and weekend plans when the two older girls got in the car. How was your day? Stella asked her oldest daughter. Glad it's Friday. Abigail jumped into the passenger seat. Scoot over, Josie said, before climbing into the back, next to her younger sister. How about you, Josie? Everything okay? Stella asked when she saw the girl's long face. I'm fine. Josie didn't look fine. Stella made a mental note to check in with Claire about the older girl. Hopefully, it was nothing more than a bad test. Mr. Flynn gave us a pop quiz, Abigail blurted out. I only got one question wrong. Stella glanced in the rearview mirror and saw Josie's shoulders slump farther, confirming her suspicions. That's great, honey. I'm proud of you. She put a hand on Abigail's arm for a moment and squeezed it. Abby had gone through a rough patch at school after Dan's death. Thankfully, those days were behind them now as all three of them figured out their new normal. We had a snack, Paisley said. Trail mix. With mandams. Yes, you did. And I happened to have some for Abigail and Josie, too. Stella dug around in her purse and handed each of the older girls a small bag. No fair. We had to share, Emma said. Stella took a deep breath before turning around to talk to her youngest. Your bag was bigger. Besides, don't you think it would be hard for Abigail and Josie to share with one in the front and one in the back? I guess. It was going to be a long afternoon. Stella hoped Hunter actually wouldn't mind if the girls hopped into his pool before dinner. At this rate, she couldn't wait for bedtime to come soon enough. We're here, Stella said when she pulled into Claire and Michael's driveway ten minutes later. One of the big benefits of living on a small island like Palmer was that it was never far to get anywhere. Can we go inside, Mama? Please. Josie promised to show me this cool bracelet-making kit she got from her grandma. Can we? Abigail was vibrating with excitement in the passenger seat. If Miss Claire doesn't mind, Stella said, and Abigail threw the door open. But we can't stay long. Five minutes, tops. Come on, Emma. We can play in my room. Paisley scooted out, pulling her friend along with her. I hope you don't mind, Stella said when a surprised Claire watched all four girls storm the house the moment she opened the front door. We won't stay long. Not a problem. Come in. I have coffee, Claire said. And there might be a few cookies left. That's okay. We'll get out of your hair in a couple of minutes. Stella felt she'd taken advantage of her friend a little too often lately. It had been easy to take Claire up on her offer to watch the girls when she and Hunter were hard at work crafting sultry country songs. Don't be ridiculous. You won't be able to convince them to leave for a good 30 minutes. Might as well have coffee. Claire walked into the kitchen, leaving Stella to follow behind. Cookie, she asked, handing Stella a large mug of the elixir of life. The girls and I baked them last night. In that case, yes. Stella accepted the chocolate chip cookie. It was crispy and sweet, the perfect balance to the strong coffee that would help her make it through the rest of the day. How are things going with the famous Hunter Madison? Claire asked, leaning against the counter and taking a bite of her own cookie. We're making good progress. 
A couple more songs, and he should have everything he needs for a full album, Stella said. The record label guys seem happy with what he's shown them so far. Claire nodded. You better make your move soon, Ben. What are you talking about? Me and Hunter? Stella asked. It's not going to happen. He likes you, and you know it, Claire said. And he's good with the girls. I watched them the other day, when all four of them were playing in his pool. He likes kids. That's all. Stella, you know better than that. No single, unattached guy in his mid to late thirties spends all afternoon entertaining a gaggle of elementary school girls if he's not interested in one of the mothers, and we both know he doesn't have his eye on me. Claire held up her hand, the wedding band sparkling in the sun streaming into the window. She gave Stella the don't even try to argue with me look. I don't know. Stella walked to the kitchen table and pulled out a chair. She took a seat and looked up at Claire. It's not like I haven't thought about it. I know. Which is why you need to make your move before he takes off to record this album of his. This is your chance, Stella. Grab it. Claire's words were playing back in her mind when they made it home. The girls raced out to the backyard, looking for Hunter Madison. He stood on his back deck, wearing a pair of swim trunks and nothing else. A stack of thick, fluffy towels was sitting on the lounge chair next to him. Ready to come over and swim, he asked, like he did most days. It was becoming part of their after-school routine. Of course, the girls yelled with delight. Care to join us today? he asked, like he did every time the girls went into his pool. More often than not, she declined, while he joined Abigail and Emma, and played whatever game they came up with. Why not? Give me five minutes, to find a bathing suit. Before she could regret her decision, Stella raced upstairs, and changed into her suit. She pulled her hair up, grabbed a pair of sunglasses, and put on her flip-flops. Hunter's gaze made her smile. The bathing suit was a modest one-piece, but it was the most revealing outfit he'd seen her in. Can I get you something to drink? he asked, taking a sip of his sparkling water and swallowing hard. No thanks. I'm good. Are you coming in? She kicked off her shoes and sat down on the side of the pool, dangling her feet in the water for a moment, before sliding in. It was cooler than the warm afternoon air, but by no means cold. No wonder her girls liked it so much. Mama, come play Marco Polo with us. Emma waved her over to the other side of the pool. A big splash, not far from her startled Stella. She turned and Hunter Dove past her, heading right for her daughters. Who's Marco? he asked, shaking his head, sending beads of water everywhere. Mama is, Abigail said, a mischievous grin on her face. I'm not even sure how to play this, Stella said. Oh, it's so easy. Emma swam closer and stood up in front of her. You close your eyes and call Marco. We say polo, and you try to catch us. With your eyes closed. And no cheating, Abigail added. Ready? Hunter asked as the girls scattered. Why not? Stella closed her eyes. Marco. Polo, came the threefold response. She took a few tentative steps through the pool, arms stretched out in front of her. Marco. Polo. Abigail's voice came from her right. Stella turned and made her way over there, changing directions again and again as they all moved about the pool. She was tempted to take a quick peek when she heard a small splash of water directly behind her. She felt the movement in the water, too. Got you, she said, spinning around and grabbing a hold of an arm. You did. The dark voice did not belong to her daughter, and the arm was too muscular for a seven-year-old. Stella opened her eyes and found herself standing right in front of Hunter. Less than five inches separated them, and the sudden closeness made her heartbeat jump and take off at a gallop. Now what? Stella asked. Hunter didn't say a word. Instead, he stared deep into her eyes like he'd found the meaning of life in those depths. Now it's Hunter's turn, Emma called from across the pool. 
Hunter closed his eyes. Marco. Stella didn't move. She stared at the face of the man who'd turned her life upside down these past few weeks. Who'd taught her more about music and poetry than she'd learned in years of college. And who'd brought lightness and joy back into her life. Mama. Move, Abigail whispered loud enough that the neighbors across the fence could hear. Reluctantly, Stella swam across the pool and rose. Polo. She wasn't sure if she wanted him to catch her or if it was time to make her escape. Chapter 14 I'll have to leave early to head to the store, Stella said. Can't it wait? We're finally getting somewhere here. Hunter looked through the lines of music he'd scribbled to accompany the lyrics she'd written. The song had potential, and they were close to making it work. He could feel it in his bones. I can't. I'm running pretty low on supplies, and if I don't get there soon, the grocery store will be wiped out. Stella's serious tone made him look up and pay attention. What's going on? Hunter asked. You're kidding, right? You know there's a hurricane heading this way. Stella sat up and stared at him. I heard something on the news, but they said it was off the tip of Florida. Which means it'll be here in a couple of days. Unless it changes course. Let's pray it changes course. We can't take another hit like the last one. Stella shuddered. What happened? Hunter asked. She seemed scared. He thought this was nothing to worry about. Rain for a few days, a couple of broken tree limbs. Nothing worse than a severe thunderstorm. At least that's what Kirk had assured him would happen. Maybe getting his info from a fellow Nashville native hadn't been the best idea. Especially if that person wanted you in your office, writing music. Half the roofs were damaged, a couple of houses landed in the creek, and we were without power or running water for four weeks. Stella looked at something on her phone. She'd done it a few times throughout the day. He'd assumed it had something to do with her kids or her freelance work. That sounds pretty serious. Hunter rose and grabbed his keys. Let's go. I'll give you a ride. I should probably pick up a few things myself. Thanks. Stella grabbed her purse and followed him out to his car. What have you done so far to get ready? Honestly, nothing. I thought it was no big deal. He pulled out of the garage and thought about what he would need if he were to be without power for a couple of weeks. Maybe it was time to consider a trip to Nashville until this blew over. All right. Let's get you organized. Stella pulled a pen and notepad from her purse. Emergency provisions and plenty of bottled water. Do you take any prescription medications? No. Why? Usually, it's a good idea to refill those before it hits. Do you mind if we stop by the pharmacy? I need to pick up Emma's allergy pills. I didn't know she was allergic to anything, Hunter said. How many more surprises did this day hold? The pharmacy on Main Street? That's the one. Only one on the island, actually. Stella scribbled a few more notes. Do you have anything to board up the windows? Especially those large glass sliding doors of yours that lead out to the back deck. Hunter shook his head. As he drove across the island, he noticed that there seemed to be more traffic than usual. People had worried looks on their faces, and more than a few of their neighbors were out making repairs and unloading sheets of plywood. I'll see if Michael can head to the hardware store with you later, Stella said. He has a truck. Thanks. Anything else? Hunter asked, feeling a little overwhelmed. Nothing we can't handle. For now, think about what snack foods you like. Anything that doesn't need to be cooked or refrigerated. Stella made a few more notes before tearing the piece of paper out of the notebook. It was in her hand when they walked into the grocery store a few minutes later. The place was packed, and everyone was throwing things into their shopping carts. What's with the milk, eggs, and bread? Hunter asked. Stella shrugged. It's what everyone stocks up on. The bread I understand. The rest I don't get. 
you're much better off with crackers and peanut butter. She piled several cartons and two large jars into their shopping cart. Maybe hurricanes give them a craving for French toast, he said to lighten the mood. Maybe? Stella didn't crack a smile. How about some summer sausage? It's pretty good with mustard on crackers. He'd eaten it when he was broke in his younger years. He lived on that and macaroni and cheese. Stella kept adding more and more shelf-stable food to the cart as they walked along the aisles. Can you grab two flats of water? she asked, pointing to the bottom of the cart. He did as she asked, while Stella added several gallon jugs of water. Anything else? he asked. Not unless you want some beer. She looked at the men standing in front of the cooled shelves. I think I can live without it for a while. He hadn't touched beer or anything harder in months. Not sure I can make it without coffee, though. Do you think cold brew would work? He wasn't a fan, but anything was better than a caffeine headache. That I have covered. Dan and I used to go camping. I still make a pretty good cup in an old French press. Stella smiled at him with those sparkling eyes of hers. Can't wait. Suddenly, the possibility of losing power didn't seem like such a big deal. Thanks for all your help, Hunter said when they'd finished nailing the last of the plywood in place. Anytime. It takes a while, but you'll get used to this. Mark the sheets before you pull them down after the storm. Makes putting them back up for the next one a lot easier. Michael wiped his hands on his cargo shorts and shook Hunter's hand. Hold on, let me compensate you for your time. Hunter reached for his wallet, but Michael waved him off. No need. It's what neighbors do around here. Let me know if you need anything else, and I'll come check on you and Stella when we're on the other side of this. Stay safe. The man walked off, his heavy work boots making a loud thud noise with each step. Hunter reached for his phone when it rang. Martin. Everything okay? He wasn't expecting a call from his accountant. Everything's fine here, but what about you? Josh and I are watching the news. There's a hurricane heading your way. Martin's words came out fast, his voice higher pitched than usual. I'm aware, Hunter said. Are you evacuating? Martin asked. Hunter shook his head, realizing how useless the motion was. I'm staying here. As is almost everyone else. We're prepared to ride this out. At least he hoped he was. After getting back from the grocery store with Stella, he'd done a little research about what he should be doing and what else he might need. When he'd suggested a generator on his way to the hardware store with Michael, the man had laughed at him. Seeing those things sold out long before the storm became an actual threat. He'd have to make do without electricity if the grid on the island went down. Are you sure that's a good idea? Martin asked. Look, it won't be horrible. We might lose power for a couple of days, but that should be it. I'm on the waterway side, not oceanfront. He'd given up on the idea of running to Nashville when he'd noticed some of the older residents getting prepared. If they could make it through a hurricane, so could he. All right. Call if you need anything. And if you change your mind, you're welcome to crash on our couch. Hunter smiled. Martin was an excellent accountant and quickly became a great friend, but his couch surfing days were over. I appreciate it. Don't worry. I'll be fine. A few days unplugged might be just what I need to finish those last few songs. Let's hope you're right. Kirk is getting anxious, Martin said. It'll work out. Unless the money is becoming a problem. Hunter had no idea what he was spending on a monthly basis and how long the reserves Martin had created would last. It's not a problem. Yet. How long do I have? Hunter asked. His chest was tightening, and he had to force himself to take a long, slow breath. Six months. Eight if you stop spending like you're still making the big bucks. I'll see what I can do. Six months should be long enough to see a return from the album. If his gamble paid off. 
be careful and call me when this hurricane is past you. Josh and I keep hoping it'll turn and head out into the ocean. You and all of Palmer Island, Hunter said before thanking his friend and saying his goodbye. Am I interrupting? Stella asked. Hunter turned and watched his beautiful neighbor climb the stairs to his back deck. The way she'd done dozens of times since that day she'd found him slumped over in his hot tub. Not at all. Just talked to a friend. He was checking in on me. Hunter leaned against the plywood. Is there anything else you need help with? Stella asked, looking around the back deck. We have a few more hours until the wind and the rain start. Do these hurricanes always hit at night? Hunter asked. The sun was already low in the sky. It seems that way. Stella stared out across the waterway. Are you worried? Up until now, she'd seemed more than competent in her preparations. Not really. It'll be fine. Looks like you did a great job out here. She smiled at him encouragingly, but Hunter could tell it was forced. There were lines on her forehead he hadn't noticed before, and the corners of her lips were tight with worry. Thanks to you, Claire, and Michael. He put all this up. I was mostly here as an extra pair of hands. He held them up. I'm sure you did more than that. Well, I'm glad you're all set. See you on the other side? Stella raised her hand and waved before turning to leave. Stella? Hunter waited for her to turn back around. Would you mind if I stayed with you and the girls? You know, to keep an eye on things. Help you deal with whatever happens. She was quiet for a moment and still as one of the bronze statues in the park in the middle of the island. If not, that's fine. I have everything I need here. Except for her and those girls of hers who had snuck their way into his heart over the course of the summer. It would be nice to have you over, Stella said. The girls would love the company. Maybe bring one of your guitars? In case we do lose power? Will do. Let me pack a few things, and I'll be right over. Hunter picked up the tools scattered around the deck and walked inside. With the windows boarded up, the place was gloomy and claustrophobic. A bit like a tomb, or the mausoleum, to a has-been country music star. Even the gold and platinum records on the wall in his music room had lost their shine with little to no light. Hunter grabbed his guitar and headed upstairs to pack enough clothes for a few days. He suddenly couldn't wait to get out of this house and was surprised at how much he was looking forward to spending time with Stella, Abigail, and Emma. Even if it meant weathering a storm the size of a large city that was churning in the warm waters and heading straight for them. Chapter 15 Come on in. It's getting pretty bad out there. Stella opened the door and stepped aside to let her handsome neighbor inside. Part of her wondered if inviting him to ride the hurricane out with her and her daughters was such a good idea. I think I made it just in time. I hope you don't mind that I brought this. Hunter held up the binder that contained most of their music. Not at all. We might as well get some work done, Stella said, following him inside. The worst part is all the waiting until we get to the severe winds and rain. It's like being stalked by a turtle. What? Hunter looked like he was about to burst out laughing. You know. Hurricanes move slow. Like a turtle. Stella shrugged. It had been funnier when Abigail had said it last night. She and her daughters had giggled on and off about the image of a huge snapping turtle stalking them. Right. Where do you want me to put my stuff? he asked. How about the living room? It's one of the safer spots to ride this out. As far as I can tell, none of the trees hang over this area of the house and the windows are boarded up. Stella walked inside the room, motioning for him to follow. Cozy. Hunter looked around like this was the first time he'd set foot in her house. Much better than my place. It looks like I'm expecting the zombie apocalypse over there. This is nice. Closing the curtains helped. And if the power stays on, it'll be like any other movie night on a rainy day. 
Stella had pulled the thick burgundy curtains to hide the plywood that covered the windows and sliding glass door. We're camping out down here for the night? Hunter pointed to the piles of pillows and blankets on the couches. That's the plan. I need to get out some flashlights and snacks after dinner. Other than that, we should be all set. Stella made a mental note to put out a few candles and keep a lighter and matches handy. Using them around the girls was a little risky, but in a pinch, they'd provide a source of light. Where are the girls? Hunter asked, leaning his guitar against the side of the bookshelf, out of the way of the usual foot traffic. His bag landed next to the couch with a loud thud. Upstairs, soaking up the Wi-Fi while they can. Dinner should be ready in about twenty minutes. Can I get you anything until then? Stella asked. Nothing I can think of. Is there something I can do to help? He asked, following her into the kitchen. You could set the table. Other than that, everything was under control. The chicken was baking in the oven, and the rice was about done. The lid on the pot would keep it nice and hot until they were ready to eat. Will do. This cabinet, right? Hunter opened the door and pulled out four white plates. Stella was impressed. He'd been paying attention when she'd had him over for dinner. Maybe riding out the storm with Hunter Madison wasn't such a bad idea. Stella changed her mind when everyone was sitting around the kitchen table eating. Hunter was keeping up the conversation, asking the girls about their day and then about the coming storm. What do you think? Will this thing come barreling down on us like a freight train? I heard something about tornadoes. I had no idea hurricanes could cause those. He looked around the table. Stella watched her daughter's faces turn white. Neither one of them had eaten much, and Emma didn't even touch her salad. It'll be fine. Tornadoes are rare around here. It's going to rain a bunch and the wind will howl, but we're fine. We're well prepared, and this house is safe. Abigail, do you remember the hurricane a couple of years ago when we all huddled into the blanket fort you and your dad had built in the living room? That wasn't so scary, was it? Abigail nodded and pushed a piece of chicken around on her plate. Emma didn't even pretend and looked like she was about to cry. Why don't you two pick out a movie, and I'll make us some popcorn, Stella said, keeping her tone upbeat. The girls walked off to the living room. When Hunter rose to join them, she asked him to stay behind. Something I can help you with? Hunter asked, carrying his half-finished plate into the kitchen. Sit and finish your meal. Stella swallowed the sigh, trying to escape, and sat back down across from him after glancing into the living room to make sure her daughters were okay. Something wrong? Hunter asked, cutting a chunk of chicken breast and shoving it into his mouth. Stella lowered her voice. I don't appreciate you scaring the girls like this. The whole point of the blankets, the curtains, and movie night is to keep them calm and make everything seem as normal as possible. I don't want them to be worried about this. Hmm, Hunter put down his fork and took a sip of water. I wasn't trying to scare them. I didn't think you were. But let's keep the talk about the storm to a minimum. Stella pushed her food around while she watched Hunter. What's the game plan? Hunter asked, getting back to his food. Watch a movie. Play some games. Eat junk food. Keep them giggling and most importantly make sure they feel safe. Stella put her fork done, her appetite gone. Got it. I can do that. And Stella? He waited until she looked back up at him. I'm sorry about scaring them. I wasn't thinking. She nodded and rose, taking her plate to the kitchen. She scooped the remaining food on her plate into the trash, surprised when Hunter handed her Abigail and Emma's plates. Want me to pop some popcorn? he asked. Sure. It's in the pantry. Top shelf. Kettle corn, please. She pointed to it with her elbow. Microwave popcorn? The tone of his voice left no doubt of what he thought about it. Yes. I'm a busy mom. Four minutes should do the trick. 
listen for the kernels to stop popping. I know how to use it. But for the record, it's no more work to make it in a pot and trust me, it tastes a million times better. Hunter turned on the microwave, the hum providing a calming undertone to their conversation. I'll keep that in mind. Stella washed the plates. There was no point in loading the dishwasher. If the power went off, before it finished, food residue would rot inside for days. She'd learned during her first hurricane on the island that leaving anything undone was a bad idea. Over the years, she and Dan had gotten better at making it through these storms. I'll make some for us next movie night. Hunter leaned against the counter, next to the microwave, ready to jump into action when the popcorn was done. Do you have a bowl for this? Yes, give me a sec. She finished washing the dishes and dried her hands on a kitchen towel before digging her large stainless steel bowl out from the cabinet next to the stove. Thanks. Hunter stopped the microwave and took the bowl from her. His fingers brushed across hers, sending shivers down her hand. May I have this? His hand wrapped around the kitchen towel, tugging on it lightly. It took a good three seconds for the words to penetrate Stella's brain. Of course. She had no idea what he needed it for, but she let go and took a step back. The sudden tension between them was too much. Like the energy from the storm churning out in the Atlantic Ocean less than 50 miles from the island they called home fueled it. Hunter threw the sturdy piece of cotton across his shoulder and emptied the popped kernels into the bowl. Why don't you take this to the girls? I'll be right behind you. Stella took the bowl he held out to her and watched him stroll over to the sink to dry the dishes she'd washed. You don't have to do that. I know. He looked over his shoulder and grinned at her before returning his attention to the task at hand. Stella watched him, holding the popcorn, until Emma came racing into the kitchen. I thought I smelled something good. Can I have some popcorn? I'm so hungry. Because you didn't eat much of your dinner. Stella handed her daughter the bowl. Any other day, she would have made her girls finish dinner before snacks, but this wasn't a normal night. Hunter Madison stood in her kitchen drying dishes, for crying out loud. Don't eat all of it. I won't, Emma called over her shoulder, rushing back into the living room, leaving a small trail of white kernels. You should go join them, Hunter said. I'm almost done here. I will. Got a few more snacks to get ready. She opened the pantry and dug around, coming up with a jar of peanut butter and several sleeves of crackers. Tucked away behind cans of green beans was her secret stash of sourdough pretzel rods. She grabbed them as well before taking a block of white cheddar cheese from the fridge. By the time Hunter was done drying and putting away the dishes, with prompts from her about what went where, she'd made a plate of plain and peanut butter, covered crackers, sliced cheese, and the pretzels. That looks good. I should have followed Abigail and Emma's example. Hunter winked and snagged a pretzel rod. Don't even start. Stella picked up the plate and walked out ahead of him, painfully aware of the presence of his tall, warm body mere inches behind her. It was going to be a long night, even if the hurricane suddenly changed its mind and went out to sea. I promised to be on my best behavior. Hunter breathed the words into her ear. Did you decide on a movie? Stella asked her daughters to distract herself. The penguin one. Emma pointed to the screen. I love when they sing and dance. Abigail? Stella asked, noticing her oldest wasn't quite as enthusiastic as her sister. It's okay. Abigail sat curled up in the corner of the large sectional sofa, a pillow hugged to her chest. Why don't we start with the penguins, and you get to pick the next one? Stella said, grabbing two pretzel rods and sitting down next to her. Anything? Abigail asked, her eyes wide. Within reason. It needs to be appropriate and something Emma can watch, too. Nothing too scary. Stella had learned the hard way not to give her oldest a carte blanche. All right. We can watch penguins. She motioned for Emma to press play.
I like the music too, she whispered, and Stella smiled. It didn't take long for all four of them to get into the movie. Even Hunter's eyes were glued to the screen, his foot tapping along with the beat of each song. You could take the country music star out of Nashville and throw him at the mercy of a hurricane, but you couldn't take the music out of the guy. Stella felt her shoulders relax as she held her girls, snuggled up on the couch and covered with several blankets. The rain had turned into a tropical downpour, and the wind was howling. But they were safe and sound inside her home. This is fun. I think I like hurricanes, Emma said. Don't say that. It's bad luck. Abigail reached across Stella and poked her sister. Thunder boomed and crashed right above their heads, and Stella thought she caught flashes of lightning in the small gaps between the windows and the plywood. The lights flickered, and the TV cut off, restarting a moment later. Should we unplug it? Hunter jumped to his feet and took three strides to the large flat screen before Stella could say anything. Don't touch it, she called across the room, pulling her daughters closer as the lights flickered once more and went out. Mama, I'm scared. Emma grabbed her tightly and even Abigail scooted closer. It's fine. Everything's going to be okay. We talked about this. Remember how I told you we might lose power, and it could get dark for a little while? Stella asked, rubbing their backs. I've got it. Hunter turned on his phone and used the dim glow from the screen to find the flashlights, turning them on and handing one to Stella before setting the second one upright on the coffee table in front of them like a lamp. Or a safety beacon. Everyone okay? All three of them nodded. Now what? Abigail asked, her voice a little shaky. I have an idea. Hunter walked across the room and picked up his guitar. Sitting down on the edge of the couch, he took a moment to tune it before plucking the strings until a familiar melody emerged. It's the penguin song, Emma called excitedly. Softly at first, then more confidently when Abigail joined her, she sang along with Hunter's playing. He hummed softly and joined them in the chorus. Your turn, he said when it was time for the next verse. I don't remember the words. Stella felt the warmth creep into her cheeks. Sure, she'd sang with Hunter and by herself in the shower. And she still occasionally sang the girls to sleep. But this was different. And she didn't like being put on the spot like this. All right. How about this then? I know you remember the words to this. He changed the tune and began to play the first few chords of a song they'd been working on together. Without hesitation, or even a conscious thought, Stella began to sing. The words and melody flowed out of her. There was no holding it back. That's so pretty, Mama. Emma clapped her hands together. You sound really good. Even Abigail looked impressed. No kidding. Hunter looked down and fiddled with his guitar. What are we gonna sing next? Emma asked. Do you know old MacDonald had a farm? Sure do. Hunter knew a surprising amount of not only children's songs, but pop songs that the girls both loved. They sang until their voices went hoarse, eating snacks and taking breaks to play board games until well past midnight. Why don't you two stretch out on the couch and snuggle under a blanket? Stella suggested when both girls kept yawning. Emma's eyes kept closing, but she'd rouse herself again and again, too afraid to miss out on the fun. I think that's a great idea. Let's play a game. Lay down, close your eyes, and tell me if you recognize this song. Hunter held his guitar at the ready until they were both comfortable. Close your eyes, Stella reminded them gently. Hunter played a soft tune, humming the melody until Abigail guessed the pop song by a young singer who dressed a little too provocatively for Stella's taste. Here's the next one. A children's tune filled the room, and Emma guessed it with record speed. How about this? A soft, hauntingly beautiful melody emerged from beneath Hunter's fingers. Stella had heard it but couldn't quite put her finger on what it was. Hunter kept playing until Stella was sure the girls were deep asleep, their breathing even, and their faces more relaxed than they'd been all day. 
what was that, she asked when he finally stopped and put the guitar back down. Debussy. He leaned back, looking as tired as she felt. I didn't know you liked classical music. I like all good music. And that includes your voice, Stella. You're a talented singer. He stared at her with an intensity that scared her. Thank you. Stella pulled a blanket across her lap. The tension of the day and the responsibilities of being both mother and father to her girls in a crisis weighed heavily on her. You're welcome. Hunter moved closer until his shoulders touched hers. He reached over and ran his hand over her hair. For a moment, she thought he would kiss her. Instead, his thumb traced the hollow under her eyes. You look tired. Close your eyes for a minute. I'll make sure everything's okay. He reached over and picked his guitar back up, playing more Debussy, so softly she almost struggled to hear over the noise from the storm raging on above and around them. Stella closed her eyes and drifted off to sleep. Chapter 16 He watched Stella and her daughter sleep until the sun came up. Tired and aching from sitting on the couch for hours, Hunter rose and quietly walked through the house. All the windows were boarded up with only a few slivers of light making it inside. At least the rain and wind had stopped sometime in the early morning hours. He picked up his shoes and tiptoed out of the large living room. Is it over? The soft voice made him stop in his tracks. Hunter turned around and looked back at the couch. Abigail was sitting up, staring at him wide-eyed in the dim room. He motioned for her to join him. I think so, he said, his voice, barely a whisper. Stella had looked exhausted when she'd finally drifted off to sleep for a bit. She'd slept fitfully, waking up every half hour to check on her daughters. Can we go check? Abigail took his hand and looked up at him. Her fingers felt small and fragile in his. She was still scared about the hurricane and the damage it may have done. We have to be careful. Put on shoes, and you can step out on the porch. After I have a quick look around. Can I come? Emma's voice was loud enough to make Stella move and mutter in her sleep. Hunter put a finger on his lips. Yes. He waved her over, hoping Stella wouldn't wake up completely. You have to put your shoes on and we can't get off the porch. Abigail helped her younger sister with her sneakers. He smiled at the girl and opened the front door, making sure it wouldn't lock behind him. Wait here for a second. I'll be right back. He stepped out and looked around, surprised to find the road in front of him covered in sand. Branches and pieces of debris were scattered all over the place, and he was pretty sure the cover to his hot tub that he'd tied down was sitting in the driveway of the house across from his. Puddles of water were everywhere and small streams of it cut their way through the layer of sand. He guessed much of it was salt water and hoped none of it had made it into his garage. All in all, though, it looked nothing like what he'd feared. From what he could tell, both he and Stella still had roofs on their houses and none of the other buildings he saw from his current vantage point had taken much damage. Missing shingles, sure. Damaged fences, definitely. And quite a few trees had taken some serious damage. But it looked nothing like the coverage on TV when a hurricane hit. Can we come out? Abigail stuck her head out the door. Yes, if you promise to stay on the porch. I'm going to have a quick look around. Hunter waited for the girls to step outside and sit on the steps before walking out to the sidewalk and over to his house. From the front, everything looked in pretty good shape. He opened the side gate and noticed a tall tree in Stella's yard that had come down, roots and all. It had crushed the fence separating their properties and most of the crown landed in his pool, covering up at least two-thirds of it. The girls wouldn't be happy. He pulled out his phone and took a few pictures. Thankfully, it was the only major damage he could see from his current vantage point. They'd gotten lucky. An icy shiver ran down his back when he thought about how easily a tree could have come down on the house, with Stella and the girls inside. 
A protective instinct that surprised him came over him, and he shot off an email to Kirk to find a good tree removal company. He'd have them cut down any tree even remotely in the vicinity of her house while they were here, taking care of the pine that had fallen. Hunter? Stella's voice rang clear across the empty space. Coming. He hurried back and found her standing on the sidewalk, one eye on him, the other on her daughters, who still sat on the front steps. How bad is it? Stella asked. Not a lot of damage, actually. Hunter walked up and took a seat next to the girls. I have some bad news, though. What? All three of them stared at him. No more Marco Polo, for a little while, I'm afraid. Not until I get the pool fixed. He pulled up his phone and showed them the pictures. There's a tree in the pool? Can I go see? Emma asked. Stella was looking over his shoulder at the small screen. I should probably see this. It's one of my trees. I think if you promise to stay close, it would be okay to walk into my yard. If it's okay with your mom. Hunter looked at Stella, hoping he didn't overstep or say the wrong thing. He still felt bad for scaring the girls yesterday afternoon. Can we? Abigail asked, standing up and pulling Emma up with her. Stella looked from the girls to the sand-covered street and sidewalk. Are you sure your backyard is safe? As long as you don't get anywhere near the pool, it should be fine. Hunter held out his hand. Emma, do you promise to hold my hand the entire time? The little girl nodded and put her hand in his. Abigail followed her example, and he walked down the sidewalk again, this time with the girls by his side and Stella following two steps behind. Oh, wow. That looks bad, Abigail said, squeezing his hand. Can we go climb in it? We could pretend to be monkeys. Emma pulled his hand, but Hunter stood firm. Most definitely not. Emma, I need you to promise me you don't go over there until Mr. Hunter says it's okay to go back into the pool. We don't know what kind of damage the tree did. Stella crouched down until she was eye level with her daughter. I promise, Emma said, sounding disappointed. Pinky promise? Stella asked, holding out her hand. Her daughter linked her pinky finger with hers and made a solemn vow not to go into this part of his yard until everything was fixed. You're gonna fix it, right? Emma asked, looking up at him. Absolutely. I'll start making calls as soon as we're back inside, Hunter promised. I'll call my insurance. They should cover this. Stella turned to look at the damage in front of them. Her shoulders were scrunched up and deep lines that usually weren't there went across her forehead. She was worried about the damage and dealing with her insurance, he realized. Don't worry about it. It's just a tree, and the pool needed to be redone this year, anyway. Kirk's already looking for someone to come and cut this down. And if we can't find anyone, I'll borrow a chainsaw and take care of it myself. You? Stella looked at him, surprised. Hunter's pride was hurt, but at least it softened the worry lines on her face. I know my way around a chainsaw. I grew up on a farm and cut down plenty of trees. Nothing quite this big, at least on his own, and it had been a while since the days he spent working alongside his father and grandfather, but he had real country boy roots. I have Dan's chainsaw in the garage, Stella said with some hesitation. You're welcome to borrow it. I appreciate it. Let's see what Kirk comes back with. He turned to walk back to her house, the girls in tow. I need some breakfast first. Anybody else hungry? And after breakfast, it would be time for him to go back to his own place. The thought wasn't nearly as pleasant as he'd expected, and it had nothing to do with the fact that he'd spend hours prying pieces of plywood from his windows. Instead, it had everything to do with the fact that he'd much rather spend it hanging out with Stella and her daughters. Today and every day. Chapter 17 It's almost sweater weather, Claire said, pulling a thin cardigan around herself. I'm pretty sure we're supposed to warm back up after the weekend, but I get your point. I'm looking forward to cooler days. Not sure the girls are, though. 
Stella looked across the fence, to Hunter's property, and the pool where her girls had spent so much of the warmer months. Definitely not. Mine are already complaining about not being able to swim in the ocean. Or in your handsome boyfriend neighbor's pool. Claire grinned and winked. For the millionth time, there's nothing going on between me and Hunter. We're friends who work together. That's all. If she kept saying it often enough, maybe Claire would believe it. And maybe she would as well. Right. And there's no spark at all between the two of you? Claire wriggled her eyebrows. Stella sighed. Of course there was. The attraction was hard to deny after spending so much time together these past few months. When they weren't working on the album, he had the girls over to play or was at her house for dinner. Hunter had even started giving Abigail guitar lessons when she'd shown an interest. I'm a single mom who's about to lose a big chunk of her income. The last thing I need in my life right now is a man. I'm not talking about any man, and you know it. You and Hunter have something special. And I, for one, think you'll regret it if you don't start something before he leaves. Claire's expression changed from teasing to serious. You deserve happiness. And a country superstar who will spoil you rotten. Mama, can we go over to Hunter's house? Abigail ran up, the other three girls following close behind. Hunter isn't home. He's up in Myrtle Beach for the day, remember? Stella asked her oldest. The faces of all three girls fell. But Hunter said we could hang out and play video games. Paisley and Josie haven't seen it yet. She turned to face her friends. The TV is huge, and you can play four at a time. We raced cars the other night, and it was so much fun. Stella smiled at the memory. She still couldn't believe Hunter had bought an entire gaming system and a whole stack of games to surprise the girls. They'd spent last Friday eating pizza and playing games until late into the night. Hunter was spoiling someone. Two someones, actually. Can we go? Please? Emma asked with big puppy dog eyes. Hunter said we can come play anytime we want. Abigail put a hand on her hip, her expression determined. Not while he's gone. You can talk to him when he comes back. Stella looked at Claire for backup, but her friend just shrugged. You could use the key he gave you, Abigail said. That earned her a raised eyebrow from Claire. That's for emergencies only. And before you ask, no, this isn't an emergency. You girls will have to wait. Go play something else, and I'll make us all some hot chocolate. How about that? Stella looked at all four girls. They didn't look happy, not even after the mention of the treat. Can we have marshmallows? Emma asked. Stella nodded. And I might have some cookies in the pantry too. I'll call you when it's ready. To her relief, the girls ran off to play in the yard. So he gave you a key to his place. Sounds pretty serious to me. Claire followed her inside and sat down at the kitchen table. We're friends, and he's going to be gone quite a bit with this whole album thing. It's so I can go check on stuff while he's gone. Stella pulled six mugs down and filled them with milk. Water his plants? Look through his stuff, that kind of thing? Claire asked with a smirk. He doesn't have any live plants. Says he kills them faster than he can replace them. And no, I wouldn't go riffle through his stuff. Who do you think I am? She shook her head. Too much of a good girl for your own good. Have some fun. I know I would if I was unattached and had the chance to date a music star. Stella's heart jumped at the thought of spending time in Hunter's arms. She craved the physical touch and dreamed of kissing the man. Part of her felt guilty, like even considering a relationship with someone else was somehow tarnishing Dan's memory. Except he'd want her to be happy. Find love again. But that wasn't happening with someone like Hunter Madison. Aren't you at least tempted? Claire asked. Stella put the first two mugs in the microwave and turned to face her friend. Of course I am. I'm not made of stone. Then what's the problem? 
Think of what you'll be able to tell the grandkids someday. Claire walked to the pantry and grabbed the bag of marshmallows. What? That I had a fling with someone famous they've never heard about? Stella laughed to cover up her heartbeat, speeding up at the images that popped into her mind. You never know. He could become an icon like Tim McGraw. Everyone knows him, country music fan or not. Besides, it doesn't have to be a fling. I know that's not really your thing, and from what I've seen, Hunter's pretty into all three of you. Instant family and all that. Claire shrugged. That'll never happen. Stella clamped down on the feelings rising deep inside her heart. Sure, the girls adored Hunter, and he'd been spending a lot of time with them, but... Why not? Claire grabbed a spoon from the cutlery drawer and looked around. Where's the hot cocoa mix? Right here. Stella pulled the canister from the pantry and dove back in to search for cookies when Claire took it from her. Would you put the next two mugs in? Sure thing. As long as you tell me why you still think you and Hunter could never work. Because he's heading back to Nashville in a couple of weeks. She kept digging around the pantry, ignoring the box of graham crackers right in front of her. They weren't exactly cookies, but the girls wouldn't mind. He'll be back, Claire said with more confidence than Stella thought was warranted. Eventually, he might. But by then, she and her daughters would be nothing but a memory. Hunter will come back for you. Trust me. Claire put a hand on Stella's shoulder. She wished her friend was right. But the chances of that happening were slim to none. Which was why it was better to keep from crossing that last line from friendship into something more. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much she wished it was otherwise, she was nothing but a woman living on an island who couldn't compare to the celebrity beauties in Nashville. I still don't think this is a good idea, Stella said. Don't you trust me? Hunter asked, his eyes on the road in front of them. They were heading to Myrtle Beach. Of course I trust you, but you keep forgetting that I'm not a singer. She relaxed into the plush leather seat of his car, watching the landscape race by as they drove north on Highway 17. You also thought you weren't a songwriter, and I think we proved that wrong. By the way, did I tell you that a couple of friends reached out to see if we'd write for them? Hunter asked. No. When did that come up? Stella asked. Is it a serious offer? She'd cashed the check Hunter's manager had sent her and the whole idea of making money doing this was starting to feel real. That and the fact that his lawyer had sent a stack of paperwork for her to sign that was a good two inches tall. Of course it is. They listened to a couple of the demos and loved your style. Hunter turned to her for a split second, a huge grin on his face. I told them I'd have to check with you first. You're not a songwriter, after all. Or a singer. Exactly. Which is why I'm wondering why you're dragging me to a recording studio. Stella shook her head, still not entirely sure how he'd talked her into tagging along today. I told you. I need a favor. Don't worry. It's no different from the setup at my house. Why aren't we doing it there, then? Having him talk her into singing background vocals was bad enough. Doing it in a strange environment was making it so much worse. I need some better equipment to work with. This might make it onto the album, he said. What? You didn't mention any of that. I thought this was another demo thing. Stella leaned forward and contemplated ways to get out of this. It might be. But if it works out, and you like it, I figured we could release it. Memorialize what we created here on the island. His smile was so sweet it melted her heart. Except the prospect of recording a song and having more than a handful of people hear her was terrifying. I think I'm going to be sick. Hunter glanced at her and signaled to pull into a side street. He drove until they could see the ocean. Pulling into a beach access parking spot, he cut off the car and opened the door. Come with me. She followed him, letting him take her by the hand as they walked out onto the beach. Take a deep breath, Hunter said, pulling them to a stop. 
Stella did as he asked, breathing deeply and soaking up the salty air, the expansive view, and the sound of the waves rolling in. Better? For now. Stella stared out across the ocean, trying hard not to think about what she was about to do. We don't have to do this if you don't want to. I can turn around and we'll be back on Palmer Island in half an hour. It was tempting to take him up on his offer. She bit her lip, trying to decide what to do. Part of her was terrified. But part of her wondered what it would be like to be on an actual record, to hear her voice on the radio. The girls would be thrilled, and Claire would probably buy enough records to drive Hunter's new album up the charts. Not just her. The entire island would buy copies. I wouldn't have asked if I didn't think you had an amazing voice. Hunter squeezed her hand. Tell you what. Let's give it a try and see how it turns out. If you don't like it, we scrap it. Scout's honor. He held up his fingers. Stella laughed, trying to picture him as a boy scout. You were in the scouts? Hunter grinned. Not really. Unless you count two weeks as a webelo. Not your thing? Stella asked. No idea. But I wasn't going to let anyone call me a webelo. Hunter shook his head. In hindsight, I think I might have enjoyed it. Singing around a campfire and stuff. You would have been good at that, she said. Using a compass and tying knots, not so much though. He let go of her hand and took a step forward, creating a bit of distance between them. Who knows? Kids can surprise you. Stella thought about her girls and how each of them had risen to the challenge of growing up without Dan in their own way. Maybe. He glanced at his watch. What do you think? Will you give it a try? I think it would add something special to the song, having you sing part of it. Stella nodded. Okay. I'll try. But I can't be gone too long. I don't want the kids staying with Claire all afternoon. Got it. We'll wrap it up by five and pick up pizza for everyone on the way home. Sound like a plan? Hunter didn't wait for her reply and walked back to the car. The recording studio wasn't as intimidating as Stella had feared. It was a small building in a strip mall, two rows down from the main highway. Hunter led the way and introduced her to the sound engineer. It's nice to meet you, Greg. Stella shook the man's hand. He looked to be in his fifties with shaggy hair and full sleeve tattoos on both arms. And he was making her nervous the moment she realized he'd be there while she sang. Let's get you set up. Hunter opened the door to a room that held various instruments and a couple of mic stands. Hunter? She stood frozen in the door between the two rooms. She could see the large window and Greg on the other side of this. I don't think I can do this. Sure you can. Come over here. He held out his hand. Stella closed her eyes for a moment and took a deep breath. It was one person. Two if you counted Hunter. She could do this. Hunter's expectant expression was the first thing she saw when she opened her eyes, and it gave her the confidence to walk in and sing a few notes for Greg. He pushed levers and buttons on a board five times the size of what Hunter had at his place. You're all set, he said. You'll do great. Hunter squeezed her shoulder and left, joining Greg on the other side of the glass. Stella cleared her throat and nodded. The track began to play, the music streaming in through the headphones Hunter had put on her. She froze and missed her cue. Sorry. No problem. We'll start from the top. Whenever you're ready. Hunter's voice was calm and encouraging. She froze again. It felt like she was choking on the lyrics. Greg, why don't you go grab some coffee? Hunter said. He waited for the man to leave the room. It's just you and me, Stella. Let me hear that beautiful voice of yours. Stella coughed and cleared her throat. Okay. I can do this. She closed her eyes and pushed everything else away. The music surrounding her was the only thing that mattered. Stella sang. 
The first verse and chorus went well. At least, she thought they did. She avoided looking at Hunter, and he didn't say a word. Didn't stop her. She hoped it was good enough. That thought brought all the old insecurities rushing back. They swept her memory of the lyrics she'd written with Hunter away, and she stopped. She looked up at Hunter behind the glass, waiting for him to lose his patience. Renting a studio like this couldn't be cheap, even if it was in Myrtle Beach, instead of Nashville or Los Angeles. He pushed a few buttons and walked in to join her without saying a word. She pulled the headphones off her head and held them in her hand. I'll try again. Stella tried to put confidence in her words, but they sounded hollow, even to her. Hunter took a few more steps until he was mere inches from her. She smelled his cologne and the scent of the sea air from their stop at the ocean. Felt the warmth radiating off his body. It made her realize how cold the air-conditioned studio was. A shiver ran down her arms and back that had nothing to do with the temperature of the room. She felt, more than saw, his eyes on her lips. Before she could take more than a quick breath, he lowered his head and captured her lips with his. It wasn't a gentle kiss. It was demanding and filled with the passion she'd pushed down and locked away for months. He must have felt it, too, because it was like he was pouring all of it into the kiss that took her breath away. Wow. Stella took a step back and ran her fingers through her hair. The kiss was everything she'd secretly hoped for and dreamed of for weeks. Better than what she'd experienced in her sleep at night. More vivid than what had woken her up hot and breathless more than once. I've wanted to do that for a long time. You okay? Hunter looked at her like she was the most precious thing in the world. Ahem. Stella nodded, not sure what to say. Good. Give me two seconds. He walked through the door, pushing a few more buttons on the mixing board, before returning. Look at me. Focus on my face. Sing to me whenever you're ready. What about the music? Stella asked. It's playing on a loop. Take your time. There's no rush. Hunter motioned for her to put the headphones back on. Stella did and looked at him, fighting the urge to touch her lips. She kept her eyes locked with his. She'd sung with Hunter before. This wasn't all that different. To her relief, her voice didn't fail her this time. Instead, it ran loud and clear through the small room. Hunter's face lit up, and he barely flinched when she missed a note. Badly. Keep going. They worked for a couple of hours until she felt her voice fading. Hunter was patient with her and full of praise. When Greg returned, he sent him off to get lunch. And he kept kissing her. To encourage her, to distract her, to get her out of her head. And Stella kissed him back, starved for the feeling it ignited in her. It wasn't until they were back in the car and on their way back home to Palmer Island that she let herself wonder what all this meant. For her. For them. For their future. Could she trust Hunter Madison to stay around? Or would he take off and go back to his old ways the moment his bank account filled up? In the studio, he'd told her he couldn't stop thinking about her. She wasn't sure she believed him. She wanted to, but she had three tender hearts to protect. Hers and those of her daughters. Pizza? Hunter asked, interrupting her thoughts. What? Ready to order pizza? If you call it in, we can swing by the brick oven and pick it up on our way to Claire and Michael's house. He reached over and squeezed her hand. Right. Stella dug in her purse until she found her phone to place the order. You were amazing back there. I can't wait for you to hear when it's all mixed and ready to go. Hunter took his hand back to shift down a gear. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. She hated listening to her own voice. It sounded off. Wrong somehow. You'll love it. He turned to look at her for a split second and smiled that dazzling smile of his. Don't bet on it. She laughed, feeling more self-confidence than she had when they were recording. And kissing. Stella felt warmth rising up her neck and into her cheeks. 
I'm not a betting man. But this was good. It felt right, Hunter said. He swallowed hard. Not just the music. You and me. We felt right. Stella stayed quiet, trying not to get her hopes up. My life is a mess, and I can't promise what tomorrow will bring, but I hope you'll be in my life. You and the girls. I. You don't have to decide right now. Think about it. I'd love to give this a try. Stella nodded, not sure she was ready to let him have more of her heart than he already did. And to make whatever this was official. Chapter 18 Are you sure we can't do this digitally? Hunter asked. Dude. You need to put in some face-to-face -face time with the studio guys if you want them to push this album. That means showing up in person to sign the contracts. Go to dinner, have some drinks. You know how this works. Kirk looked and sounded exasperated. Hunter sighed. It's not a good time for me to leave right now. Why? Kirk asked. What's going on? He didn't want to leave Stella. Not after kissing her in Greg's recording studio, the other day. They had something. Something special. He could feel it, but it was young and fragile. And there was no telling what would happen if he left for Nashville right now. But this wasn't a conversation he wanted to have with his manager. Nothing's going on. It just isn't a good time for me to go back there. Listen, I get it. I'll be there with you every step of the way. I won't let you fall off the wagon, I swear. And I wasn't thinking about the drinks. We'll skip the drinks. Go out for coffee. Heck, I can make it a breakfast meeting. Those type A guys will eat that up. Kirk scribbled down notes, no doubt instructions for his assistant to look into the best breakfast joints in Music City. I'm not worried about that. I haven't touched a drop in months. Hunter was impressed with how well he'd done giving up alcohol once he put his mind to it. And speaking of minds, his was clearer than it had been in years. He couldn't imagine going back to his old ways of using booze to numb the feelings of loneliness and being adrift. Better to face those problems head-on and turn them into music. Feelings were too valuable a tool for a musician to drown them in bourbon and beer. That's good. What's holding you here, then? Kirk asked. Hunter was quiet. This thing with Stella was too new. He should have let Kirk believe he was worried about falling off the wagon. Is it that pretty neighbor of yours? You two finally getting hot and heavy? Kirk asked. We're not. But she's part of it. I talked her into recording one of the songs. Wait until you hear her voice when it's cleaned up and mixed right. This is going to be something special. I might record a couple more with her. If he could talk her into going back to the professional studio. Or rig up something better at his place. Bring her with you. I'll call in some favors and have a recording studio lined up for you in Nashville, Kirk said. Stella has two young kids. She can't just take off for a couple of days. The idea of having her tag along was appealing, though. A week or two. And I see your point. Listen, I know you don't want to leave, but I need you to do this. If we want them to put the big money and the big promos behind this new album, you're going to have to play nice. Deep down, Hunter knew Kirk was right. When do you need me to fly out? I can have us on the first flight out tomorrow. I'll set up an in-person meeting with Martin, too, while we're out there. Kirk scribbled down more notes, before taking his leave. Hunter sighed. Leaving at the crack of dawn didn't leave him much time to get ready. He needed to pack and clean out the fridge. But first, there was something more important he had to take care of. He looked at himself in the mirror in the hall, running his fingers through his hair and tugging on the t-shirt he was wearing. Stella sat outside on the back deck, watching the sun set over the intercoastal waterway. She had a glass of wine in her hand and a serene look on her face. She looked happy and relaxed, and he hated to disturb that moment for her. Time to herself was far and few between from what she'd told him. Not that they'd talked. 
not since the kiss. The kisses, he corrected himself, a smile spreading across his face when he thought about their time in the recording studio. She looked so helpless and lost. Standing there in front of the mic. He stopped thinking about anything but making her feel better. Kissing had seemed like a good idea, and it had worked. But on the drive home, he'd felt her pull away. Grow distant. They'd eaten pizza at Claire and Michael's house, and he'd driven them home. Stella had rushed the kids inside to get ready for bed, and that was the last he'd seen of her. Until now. Hunter was about to walk back inside when Stella turned her head and looked right at him. His heart stopped. How would she react? She hadn't called, hadn't come knocking on his door. And until now, he had not run across her out here. Stella gave him the most dazzling smile and waved. Any doubts about where they stood after those life-changing kisses that had plagued Hunter disappeared. She raised her hand and waved, motioning for him to come and join her. Hey! Hunter walked onto the familiar back deck. Beautiful sunset tonight. Almost as beautiful as her. She looked genuinely happy to see him and that did more for his ego and self-esteem than those platinum albums had. It is. Sit down. Can I get you something to drink? She asked. Hunter shook his head and pulled a chair close. This is perfect. Isn't it? Dan and I sat here almost every night when we first moved in. Her voice was soft, barely a whisper, and her expression wistful. Tell me about him, Hunter said. He was eager to learn about the man who had captured Stella's heart. Not only that, but he was Emma and Abigail's father. Without him, the girls wouldn't be here, and Hunter couldn't imagine a world without those two in it. They'd captured his heart almost as much as their mother had. We met when we were both young and silly. Stella smiled, turning to look back across the water at the flaming orange ball, disappearing behind the trees. We got married and honeymooned down here. We both fell in love with Palmer Island. The people, the slower pace of living. The view, he promoted when she didn't continue. Right. Can't beat the view or the access to the ocean. After we had the girls, we knew this was where we wanted to raise them. It took every penny we had to qualify for the loan. We ate beans and rice for months, but in the end, it was all worth it. We built our life here and thought we'd grow old together in this place. Hunter watched her grow somber at the memory of what she'd lost. He took her hand and squeezed it, hoping to convey that he understood what she was feeling. He understood all too well. Everything was picture perfect until that morning. Stella's voice broke, and she wiped away a single tear that rolled down her cheek. He went out for an early morning run and was hit by some kid on vacation here. They suspect texting and driving, but there was no way to know for sure. She drove off, leaving him laying in the ditch. She turned herself in a day later. I'm so sorry. There were no words that would smooth that pain. Only time could lessen it. Thank you. The first few weeks, I wasn't sure I'd make it through losing him. But I had the girls to care for. They are what gave me the will to go on. Abigail and Emma are the most important part of my life and always will be. Of course they are. I'm glad you have them. He smiled, thankful she had made it through those first stages of grief and handled the fallout better than he had. They say he died on impact. That he didn't suffer. Stella took her hand out of his and rubbed her face. That's something, at least. It's something. Something to hang on to. Not that it's an experience I wish on anyone. Stella turned and looked at him. The woman in the photograph? Hunter nodded. Love of my life. She died a few months after that picture was taken. It still hurt every single day. I had no idea. Stella turned and looked at him with so much pain and compassion it brought tears to his own eyes. She was the light of my life. My everything. We didn't have as long as you guys did, but I wouldn't trade having her in my life for anything. I know what you mean. 
People ask all the time if I wished I'd never met Dan. Had the girls. It's such a ridiculous thing to ask. I'd do it all again in a heartbeat. Stella's face relaxed, a small bit of the serenity from earlier coming back. He nodded. There are things I would do differently. After. How I handled the grief. He let out a dry laugh that had not even a hint of humor or joy in it. How I didn't handle it would be a better way to put it. That's when the drinking and partying started? Stella asked. It was a way to numb the pain. To forget for a while. And to sleep. Until he moved to the island, he hadn't been able to drift off into oblivion without more than a few drinks in him. And even then, it had never been restful. I took sleeping pills for a couple of weeks right after, Stella said. What made you stop? Hunter asked, curious how she'd been able to handle this better than he had. Abigail kept having nightmares, and I was struggling to stay awake long enough to comfort her. She needed me, so I stopped. It was rough for a few nights, but meditation helped. And therapy. I stuck to self-medicating for decades, and it's cost me dearly. His career, most of his friends. And any true happiness he may have found during those years. But you stopped. That's what's important. Stella looked him straight into the eyes, the setting sun giving her hair a coppery shine. I did. Thanks to you. He smiled, realizing that she was behind everything good that had appeared in his life in the past few months. Thanks to me calling the police on you. She grinned. I needed the wake-up call. Hunter turned to face her, taking both of her hands into his. Thank you for doing that. I mean it. You're welcome, she said, squeezing his hands. I'm not going back to my old ways. No more drinking or partying. I like this new life. Having you in it makes me want to be a better man. The kind of man we wrote about in those songs. Someone who loves a woman with his whole heart and gives her the moon. That's a pretty tall order. Her voice was barely a whisper. Stella's eyes didn't meet his. She was looking down at their clasped hands. I think I'm up for the challenge. For you. For the girls. I want to be the man all three of you deserve. Not to replace Dan, but to make you happy and to share a life with you. If that's something you're ready for. I don't know. It's okay. This is a big step for both of us. Hunter took a deep breath. I promise I'll do everything in my power to become the kind of man you deserve. Think about it. There's no rush. But I needed to get this off my chest and say goodbye. He let go of her hands after one last squeeze and rose. You're leaving? Yes. I have to go to Nashville to sign some paperwork. Are you coming back? Stella asked. The question took him by surprise. Of course. I promise I'll only be gone for a few days. I'd love to see you when I get back. Take you out on a date. If you're ready. I'd like that. Stella rose and embraced him, holding on and squeezing him tight. He never wanted her to let go. Good. I'll call you. Hunter brushed a quick kiss on her lips and left, forcing himself not to look back. If he didn't, he'd call Kirk and cancel the trip. But that wasn't an option. Not if he wanted to rebuild his career and become the man Stella and her girls deserved. He hoped he could pull it off, and that she wanted him in his life as much as he wanted her in his. Chapter 19 Turn that down, Stella called from her office. Old Hunter Madison records were playing on repeat at her house these days. Not that she could blame the girls. They were excited that their mother was singing on the new album, and they adored Hunter. But she had deadlines and couldn't hear herself think. Mama. We are having a dance party here. We need it loud, Emma yelled back. The loud music and the stomping of four little feet continued. Stella forced herself to count to ten before getting up. It had been raining for days, forcing all three of them to stay cooped up in the house together. 
thankfully, tomorrow promised to be better. Don't turn it off, Abigail begged when Stella walked into the living room. Hunter's music is so good. You gotta turn it up to feel the beat. See? She stepped and twirled, doing a spectacular impression of a line dance routine. Emma copied her sister, missing a step and landing on her backside. Ouch. Stella laughed at the stunned look on her youngest daughter's face. You're okay. I know. That was kind of a cool trick. I can't wait to show the hunt man. Maybe he'll hire us as background dancers for his big tour. Emma hopped up and got back to following her sister's lead. We've been practicing. The hunt man says if we keep working at it, he'll hire us. Abigail drew her eyebrows together and bit her lip, concentrating on a particularly fast sequence of steps. I wish you would stop calling him that. He's Mr. Hunter. Stella walked over to the stereo and lowered the volume. She was tired of practically screaming to be heard over one of Hunter's more poppy songs from the 90s. We like the hunt man sounds more cool. And he's cool, right? Emma looked at her sister for confirmation. Totally. When is he coming back? Abigail asked. I'm not sure. It had been almost three weeks since their conversation on the back deck. And while she'd heard from Hunter during that time, he hadn't said anything about when he'd be back. The week he was supposed to be gone to sign contracts had turned into two, and there were more meetings lined up. I miss the hunt, Mr. Hunter, Emma said. Me too. Abigail walked over and took Stella's hands. Can we practice some more? Please? Stella shook her head. I have to get some work done. I need you and your sister to do something a little more quiet. Why don't you work on an art project or something? Can we watch TV? Emma asked. Stella was tempted. It could buy her some much-needed quiet time, but they'd spent too much time glued to their screens already this week. Plus, getting her daughters to agree on something to watch was a whole different kind of problem. No screens until after sunset. You can read, or you can do something creative. And clean up any mess you make. We could make a card for Mr. Hunter. You know, so he knows how much we miss him, Abigail said. And that we've been practicing. Emma repeated the dance sequence that had sent her to the floor and nailed it. Good job, honey. And I like the card idea. Go for it and clean up after yourselves, please. Stella left the girls to their crafting. She went back to her office to write about ten different ways to increase productivity without sacrificing sleep or sanity. Maybe she'd pick up a tip or two that she could use herself. To her surprise, her daughters let her work in peace for a good chunk of the morning. Stella glanced at her watch, fearing the worst, when she realized the girls didn't interrupt her for a solid two hours. She walked downstairs, mentally preparing to walk into a disaster area. Instead, she found a few pieces of paper scattered across the coffee table in the living room. The pens and scissors were neatly stored away in the pencil case. Two beautiful handmade cards stood propped up against the pillar candles that had sat there since the power outage during the hurricane. Abby? Emma? Stella called. We're in here, Abigail replied from the kitchen. We're making lunch. Emma's voice was louder than her sister's, and she sounded excited. Stella rushed through the dining room and into the kitchen, pulling to a stop at the scene in front of her. It's almost ready. Abigail smiled confidently before closing the container of cheese and putting it back into the fridge. What is all this? Stella was stunned at the spread in front of her. Lunch. I'm fixing drinks. Do you want water or tea? Emma asked, holding up a glass. Water would be nice. Stella watched her daughters put away the salad and sandwich fixings. Sit. It's ready. Abigail pointed to the kitchen table, and Stella did as asked. Emma handed her the water and a napkin. Abby put a ham and cheese sandwich and a small side salad in front of her. There was dressing and cherry tomatoes. 
It all looked delicious and made her stomach growl. This looks great. She smiled at her daughters. The girls were growing up fast, becoming more independent every single day. In a few years, they'd be in high school and from there, college. Stella shoved the thought away. The idea of coming home to an empty nest, with no one but her in this house, was too disturbing. Maybe she should consider getting a dog. Someone to be here and wait for her. Or maybe it was time to consider who she may want to spend her golden years with. The image of Hunter Madison popped into her head. Stella picked up her sandwich and took a big bite, shoving the food down along with the idea of growing old with her handsome neighbor. Absent neighbor. Do you like it? Abigail took the seat across from her, and Emma slid into the chair next to her. Two pairs of eyes were trained on her as she chewed and swallowed. It's very good. Thank you. She looked at her daughters. I can't believe you made lunch for all three of us. You're welcome. Abigail looked pleased with herself, and Stella made a mental note to give her a few more responsibilities around the house. It was time and it would help her oldest thrive. We even have dessert, but not until after we finish our sandwiches, Emma said. What's for dessert? Stella asked, looking around. You have to wait and see. And eat all your lettuce. Emma wiggled her index finger, doing a good impression of her grandmother, Dan's mom. Yes, ma'am. Stella mostly suppressed her grin and dug into her meal. Her phone rang before they finished lunch. Sorry, girls. I have to take this. Is it Hunter? Abigail asked, eyes wide with excitement. Stella put a finger across her mouth, signaling for the girls to be quiet, and walked upstairs for a bit of privacy. She shut the door to her office before answering. Hunter, how are things in Nashville? He'd texted and sent over contracts, but aside from a few phone calls the first week or two he'd been gone, she hadn't spoken to him. Not that he owed her long conversations on the phone. It wasn't like they were officially an item or anything. They'd kissed. People did that all the time and never really saw each other after. Busy. I miss you. His voice was rough, like he'd spent the past few days talking nonstop. You and the girls. How are they? It warmed Stella's heart that one of his first thoughts was about her daughters. They are fine. Busy with school. Oh, and they made you cards this afternoon. I'll pop them into the mail for you tomorrow. Or you could bring them yourself, Hunter said. What do you mean? Stella asked, begging her heart not to get its hopes up. I would like you to come to Nashville to re-record the songs we put down in Myrtle Beach. The studio wants something a little different, and we won't be able to accomplish that without getting it on fresh tape, Hunter said. I thought it was all digital. Stella sat in her chair. It is. You know what I mean. I know it won't be easy for you and the girls to come out here with school and all, but if you flew out on a Thursday after school and came back Monday, he talked fast, hardly taking time to breathe between his words. We could do that. Stella flipped open the calendar she kept on her desk. How soon do you need me there? The sooner the better. Hunter's voice was stronger, more confident. He almost sounded surprised. Like he didn't expect her to even consider the trip. Would two weeks from now be too late? The girls have a long weekend. We could leave Wednesday after school, and they'd only miss half a day Thursday. Two weeks would be great. He rattled off the dates, and she confirmed them. I'll get someone at the studio to book everything and get in touch with you about the tickets. Stella heard someone calling his name in the background. Sounds like a plan. You have to run? I do. There was reluctance in his voice. Give the girls a hug from me. I will, she promised. And Stella, he asked. Did I mention I missed you? Because I really do. Before she could respond or swallow the large lump in her throat, the line was dead, and Hunter was gone. 
I have some news, Stella said, scooping spaghetti and meatballs onto her daughter's plates. Can I have lemonade with dinner? Abigail asked. Me too? Emma jumped up and down, standing next to Stella and bumping into her. It almost sent a spoonful of meatballs flying across the kitchen. Stella dropped the ladle and took a deep breath. She was surprised how nervous she was to tell the girls about the upcoming trip. Maybe taking them to see Hunter wasn't such a good idea after all. The last thing she needed was for them to get attached to Hunter any more than they already were. Did you mail the cards? Abigail asked. Not yet. That's actually something I want to talk to you about. Except maybe she should hold off and see if Claire could watch these two for a few days while she dashed off to Nashville to record a song with Hunter. What about the lemonade? Emma pulled on her sleeve. Yes, you can both have lemonade with dinner, Stella said, fixing her own plate. Actually, pour me a glass too. We have something to celebrate. She waited for the girls to fill the glasses and take their seats before taking her own. What are we celebrating? Abigail asked, watching her carefully. The glass and silverware stayed untouched. Emma, on the other hand, was gulping down her drink. Emma, slow down. Stella motioned for her youngest to put her glass down and waited until she did. There's something I want to talk to you about. She looked at her girls, hoping she was making the right decision. For herself and most importantly for them. What is it? Emma blurted out, rubbing her mouth with the back of her hand. Hunter asked me to come to Nashville to record one of his songs with him for the album. Again? Abigail asked. She played the record Hunter had put on her phone on repeat for weeks. Yes, the studio wants to change things a little bit, and I need to record again. Just one song, though. Stella was thankful for that. Though the idea of flying her and her daughters in for something she could do in that recording studio in Myrtle Beach seemed a little ridiculous. Even for Hunter. Unless. She shut down the butterflies in her stomach with a sip of lemonade. There was no reason to get her hopes up. Hunter had a reputation, and while he'd been trying hard to turn things around, who knew if that would stick in the long run? Maybe Hunter wants to take you on a date. Abigail looked at her thoughtfully, as if reading her mother's mind. Don't be silly. Hunter and I are friends, and friends don't go on dates. Stella stuck to the story she'd been telling the girls since Hunter had stayed with them during the hurricane. Sure, Mama. Abigail stared at her, looking a good ten years older than she was. Yeah, right? Emma joined in, looking at her bigger sister for approval. It's a work thing. Except, she was hoping it was more than that and that the idea to fly her out had come from Hunter and not from some studio executive. What about us? Emma stared at her, worry and maybe even a little fear in her eyes. The young girl had struggled with abandonment issues since the death of her father. Not that Stella could blame her. She hadn't let the girls out of her sight for months after it happened. Which settled the issue. You're coming with me. We'll make it a fun family trip. You'll even get to skip half a day of school. She smiled at her daughters encouragingly. Do we get to see Hunter? Abigail asked. I would think so. I'm not sure how much time he'll have, though. He's pretty busy working on his music. I know. He told me. Abigail grabbed her fork and picked up a meatball. You talked to Hunter? Stella asked. Just one time when you were in the shower. Your phone was ringing, and I answered it. Abigail's cheeks turned red. When was this? Stella asked. On Monday. Abigail's eyes didn't meet hers. Why didn't you tell me, she asked. I thought you would get mad at me. And Hunter promised he wouldn't say anything. He said he missed us. I'm not mad at you. Next time, tell me though, Stella said. And don't answer unless you know who's calling, okay? Maybe her girls weren't quite as grown up as they'd seen this morning. 
she had quite a few years left to love on them and shape them into confident young women. Women who'd grow up seeing their mother go after her dreams. And a trip to a city like Nashville couldn't hurt either. Okay. When do we go? Emma asked, downing the last of her lemonade before letting out a loud belch. Emma. Stella drew her eyebrows together. Excuse me. Can I have more? No. Not until you eat your dinner. Stella pointed to the plate of spaghetti. We're leaving a week from Wednesday and we'll be back on Monday so you can make it to school the next day. I'm sure Mrs. Finkel wouldn't mind if I missed a couple of extra days. She'd understand. She likes Hunter's music, Abigail said. I'm sure she does, but I doubt it will take all that long to record one song. Not that she had much of an idea about what they'd be doing. Kirk had called her to confirm the travel plans and promised to set them up in a hotel close to the recording studio. Is it a long drive? Emma asked, digging into her dinner. I'm sure it is, but we're not driving. Stella waited for both girls to give her their full attention. We're flying to Nashville. On an airplane. The girls screamed and hollered with excitement. For real? On a plane? I can't wait to tell Josie. Abigail jumped up from the table and looked ready to run off to call her friend. For real. And please sit down and finish your dinner. Stella bit back a smile, glad to see her girls excited. I've never been on an airplane. Emma sounded more excited than scared. It'll be fun. It's like riding on the bus, except you get to see the world from high up. And it won't take long to get to Nashville. Stella reached across the table and squeezed the girl's hand. And then we get to see Hunter. Do you think they have a pool where he's at? Emma asked. So we can play Marco Polo. I don't know. Stella realized she had no idea where Hunter was staying or even what the hotel was that Kirk booked them in. It'll be an adventure. Later that night, long after the girls were finally asleep, Stella sat on the back deck with a cup of chamomile tea. She stared up at the stars, hoping the cool night air would calm her nerves and the breeze off the ocean would whisk away her doubts. What if she let Hunter even deeper into their lives? There was a good chance she'd end up with a broken heart if she kept up whatever this was becoming between them. Stella reached for her phone, tempted to call Kirk and cancel the trip. She stared at the screen for a long time before shoving the device back into her pocket. The girls were excited about the trip and the song might help with Hunter's album. She had to go to Nashville, and her decision had nothing to do with the memory of the kisses she and Hunter had shared the last time they were in a recording studio together. Chapter 20 Hunter, you need to get some sleep. Kirk looked at him with that don't even think about giving me lip glare Hunter had gotten to know well. The last time he'd seen it in person was during their so-called intervention at his house on Palmer Island. Thinking of the place reminded him of Stella and her girls. And of how much he missed spending time with them. Which was the reason he put in these insanely long hours in the studio. The longer he worked, the sooner this album would be done, and he could get back home. Plus, working hard made the time go by faster. It kept him from thinking too much about how good it would feel to pull the woman he couldn't get out of his head into his arms. But none of this was something he wanted to discuss with his manager. I slept. A few hours. Look at your sound guy. You're not the only one burning the candle from both ends. Give your crew a rest. Shower. Have a decent meal. And for crying out loud, shave and put on something decent before Stella and the girls get here. I don't want to have to explain this. Kirk waved his hand in front of Hunter. He caught a glimpse of his reflection in the glass that separated them from the drummer in the recording both. His hair looked like he just rolled out of bed, but the bags under his eyes belied that fact. The scruff around his face and neck was a far cry from a sexy five o'clock shadow. I look like I've been on a bender. Kirk nodded. You do. If I didn't know better, I'd be worried. Hunter raised his right arm and sniffed. 
Not the smell of stale booze and cold cigarette smoke, but not much better either. You should clean up before Stella gets here. Kirk looked at him, his lip twitching. That's today? Hunter asked, stunned. He'd buried himself to pass the time until she got to Nashville and apparently dug too deep. Kirk glanced at his watch. They land in half an hour. I should head to the airport. Unless you want to do the honors. Hunter felt panic rise in his chest. He couldn't wait to see her, but if she saw him like this. You go ahead. Have her meet me back here after she gets settled in. Kirk rose. Sounds like a plan. I've arranged for a sitter while you guys work. Hunter walked into the recording booth. Let's call it a day. Go home. Get some sleep. We'll pick back up after lunch tomorrow. You sure, boss? The drummer asked. I am. If he left now, he could make it to his apartment to clean up and make it back before she showed up. One of the benefits of finding a place a few blocks from the best recording studio in town. He'd have to thank Martin and his partner for finding it when he got tired of staying in a hotel. He'd made it almost an entire week before being done living out of suitcases. For the first time since arriving in Nashville, he regretted selling his house. It had brought in a pretty penny and kept him afloat so far, but it would have been nice to share a roof with Stella and the girls. He'd take them all to his favorite barbecue joint after showing Stella around the studio. First, though, he'd make sure she was comfortable before the crew showed up tomorrow. Happy with his plan, Hunter pulled the door shut behind him and set off at a quick clip for his place. He was on a tight deadline to make himself as presentable as he could before he saw her. Hey! Hunter pulled open the door and stepped back to let Stella enter the studio. He waved at Kirk, surprised he'd driven her over here. How was the flight? It was good. Not too bumpy. Stella walked in and followed him. She was taking everything in, eyes roaming the set of rooms and the equipment. The place was bigger than the studio he'd taken her to in Myrtle Beach, the equipment state of the art. Everyone settled in at the hotel? He sat down at the mixing board and let her explore the space where he'd spent a good 16 hours per day lately. We are. The girls are watching a movie with the babysitter, Kirk hired. Thanks for that, by the way. I wasn't sure how this was going to work. Stella opened the door to the recording booth and peeked inside. That was all Kirk. Hunter wished he'd been as thoughtful about any of this, including their accommodations. I'll have to thank him. I probably shouldn't stay too long. The sitter has my phone number, Stella trailed off and walked over to join him at the board. This won't take long. I just want to make sure you're prepped and ready for tomorrow. He pushed a few buttons, and the computers fired up. After that, I figured we could get the girls and grab some dinner. I'd like that. Her face lit up, and Hunter's stomach did a strange somersault that had nothing to do with the fact that he'd had little more than black coffee today. I want to play you something. He scrolled around until he found the music to Heartbreak. It was the most important song on the album and the one he knew he had to have her sing on. He layered on his vocals and hit play. The room filled with the sorrowful music he'd written and tweaked for months. The song that told the story of falling in love with the girl next door only to lose her and himself. Hunter held his breath and resisted the urge to watch her face while she listened. Wow. Stella sniffed. Hunter looked up and saw a tear rolling down her cheek. I never explained. Stella wiped her eyes and waited. You don't have to, she said when he couldn't quite find the words. Hunter rose and shook his head. That's not it. I want to tell you. I don't know where to start. He paced the room. The beginning, Stella suggested. It was as good an idea as any. Elena and I met in high school. She moved into a house on my street. Prettiest girl I'd ever seen. He didn't hide the sad smile. The woman in the picture in your music room, Stella guessed. He nodded. 
We dated throughout school and got married not long after. She was my rock, my cheerleader, and my biggest fan. His smile grew and felt more genuine. Without his wife, he never would have had the courage to go after this big dream. Stella sat there quietly, just listening, the song softly playing on repeat in the background. I was on the road, promoting my second album. We hadn't seen each other in weeks. When the single hit number one, I talked her into flying out to Vegas so we could celebrate. He stopped pacing and leaned against the fall for support. What happened? Her voice was barely a whisper. It was a small, private plane. A friend of mine sent it. She'd recognize the name if he told her, but that was not the point of this tale. The weather was bad, and the plane crashed trying to land. The pilot made it, but Elena. Hunter, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. Stella jumped up and flew across the room, wrapping her arms around him and cradling his head on her shoulder. The medical examiner, he stopped when his voice broke and took a moment to let the worst of the pain wash over him. It was easier than it had been the first few years, but the guilt still cut like a knife, gutting him any time he thought about what he'd done. He told me she was pregnant. He expected the regular platitudes that none of this was his fault, or that he should move on. Stella didn't say a word. She held him, softly humming the tune to his song. The song about the heartbreak of losing his wife and the unborn baby he didn't know existed until it was too late. Thank you for telling me, Stella said when he finally found the strength to pull away. I think I understand you a little better. Her hand was on his chest. Right above his heart. In a strange way, it was soothing. Like her being here, knowing what had shaped him into the wreck of a man he was, somehow helped heal those wounds. Not completely, but enough for him to dare to be happy again. Someday. I didn't even know you were married. Not that I was snooping or anything, her cheeks grew the most adorable shade of pink. Kirk worked some magic and kept the crash out of the press. Elena never liked the attention. She wasn't part of my image or my brand. Hardly anyone other than close friends and family knew I was married. It had been a blessing and a curse. No endless condolences from people who only knew Hunter Madison, the country music star. But also no one who realized how much pain he'd been in. People didn't cut him much slack in the months and years after her death. Kirk had done what he could to shield him, but without all the details, how could anyone understand the debilitating and paralyzing pain he'd been in? The song goes a lot deeper than what you want people to know, doesn't it? Stella stepped back and picked up the lyric sheet. It does. And it's why I needed you to know. About her. The baby. What happened? She was the only one he trusted with it. The only voice he could imagine sharing the song with. Are you sure you want me to sing on this with you? Stella asked. Absolutely. There's no one else I can imagine, he said. She would have liked you, you know. I'm not so sure about that. Stella scanned the page again. Are you up for a dry run? We'll have to work on the official recording tomorrow when everyone's here, but you could practice, if you'd like. Sure. Why not? It'll give you a chance to change your mind and call in a professional singer. Stella stepped into the booth, and he followed her, trying hard not to think about the kisses they shared the last time they were in a space like this. He held the headphones out to her and made sure the mic was on before retreating to the mixing table. Ready? Stella nodded, and he played the song one last time. Her voice was bright and clear, a strong contrast to his smoky vocals. It was perfect. Exactly how he'd pictured it in his mind. She was perfect. For the song. For him. With her by his side, he could do anything. Overcome anything. How bad was it? Stella asked when she'd finished. Not bad at all. I have a feeling it'll be a short day in the studio tomorrow. You nailed it, Stella. Hunter wished he'd recorded her. You're just saying that to be nice. 
Stella pulled the headphones off, a big smile lighting up her face. Hunter resisted the urge to tell her he'd say anything to see that smile. Or pull her into his arms and kiss her until they were both out of breath. Instead, they worked a little while longer, going over lyrics. Hunter told her what to expect tomorrow when they'd be working with several sound engineers and musicians in the room. You know what? Stella asked, waiting to get his full attention as he powered down the computers. I'm kind of excited about tomorrow. Good. You'll knock it out of the park. He rose and shut off the lights, picking up his keys on the way out. Let's hope you're right. She followed him, looking relaxed and confident. He had no doubt she'd handle tomorrow like a pro. Ready to get some dinner with the girls? Hunter asked, holding the door open for her. I am, Stella said, taking his hand after he locked up behind them. Hunter, what happened with Elena and the baby wasn't your fault. You know that, right? He'd heard the same words hundreds of times over the years from Kirk, Martin, counselors he'd seen a few times over the years. Tonight, for the first time, he started to believe them. Chapter 21 Time flies when you're having fun, Hunter said, putting Emma on his shoulders. Do we have to leave today? Abigail asked. I like it here. I do too, but don't you miss your friends? I'm sure Josie and Paisley are ready to hear all about your Nashville adventure. Stella looked at her daughters. She'd enjoyed their time here, but she was ready to go home. Sleep in her own bed. And get back into a routine. I miss Paisley. And Mrs. Winters. And all my friends at school, Emma said. I guess I miss them too. Abigail put her hand in Stella's. What about you, Hunter? What do you miss the most? The three of you, of course. But we're right here, silly. Emma patted his head and giggled. I'll miss you when you leave this afternoon, Hunter said. When are you coming home? Abigail turned to look at Hunter. Stella watched his face carefully, grateful her daughter had asked the question. She'd danced around the topic, but had never outright asked him. Which was silly. They'd spent three beautiful days together in Nashville, exploring the city, taking the girls to the zoo. Sure, they'd worked a fair bit in the studio, but Hunter had made it a point to show them around. Asking about Palmer Island had felt like it would break the illusion of their time together here in Music City. Honestly, I'm not sure. If it was up to me, I'd fly back with you girls today. But there's more work to do on the album. But when you're finished, you'll come home? Emma asked from the top of his shoulders. The moment I'm finished, I'm heading home, and we are all going out to Mary's for dinner, Hunter promised. And we'll have Dino nuggets and milkshakes. Emma raised her arms and waved them around. Hunter's hand shot up to stabilize Emma's back when she threatened to lose her balance on his shoulders and fall backwards. Sit still, or this ride is over. Who wants ice cream? Me. Both girls grinned from ear to ear as Hunter set off at a quick trot to the ice cream place not far from the hotel where they'd stopped after dinner their first night in Nashville. How about you? Are you ready to go back home? Hunter asked softly while they were in line. The girls were a few steps ahead of them, their noses pressed to the glass, looking at the different flavors available. I am. Don't get me wrong, Nashville is amazing, and you're right. They take their music to a whole different level here. I understand why you're recording the album here. Stella smiled when he took her hand and squeezed it. I wish it wasn't necessary, Hunter said. But I'm stuck here, for a couple of weeks. I promise I'll be back as soon as I can. And then I'll take you on a proper date. At that fancy French restaurant on the island. Chez Paul? Stella asked. She'd only been once. Dan had insisted on a meal they couldn't afford on their ninth wedding anniversary. She'd tried to convince him to wait until the following year, but he'd been stubborn. Almost as if he knew they weren't going to make it to a full decade as a married couple. That's the one. Just you and me. He looked deep into her eyes, 
and for a moment, Stella saw a vision of a future with Hunter. She wasn't sure it was truly possible, but her heart had warmed even more to the man than before this trip. The doubts were still there. But having Hunter open up to her about his wife and child had gone a long way toward building trust and confidence that what they had was real. That and the fact that she hadn't seen him so much as notice any of the beautiful women they'd been around. I should have a clean cut of our song by tomorrow. I'll send it to you, Hunter said while the girls picked their ice cream. Let's hope it came out the way you think it did. I'd hate to ruin your album, Stella quipped. She was only half joking. Having her sing on this particular piece seemed like a horrible idea. It was the most moving song on the entire album, and she had no doubt that with more professional vocals to accompany Hunter, it would become a hit. You couldn't ruin it if you tried, honey, Hunter said, pulling her closer. You don't realize how your voice affects people. But you'll see. Maybe. Stella smiled at the new pet name. It felt nice. Right. Unlike the fact that thousands of people would soon hear her voice. But the offer stands. It won't hurt my feelings one bit if you have someone else sing with you. It was almost true. Having Hunter replace her would sting a bit, especially on a song that meant so much to the two of them. It's not going to happen. Now, what sounds good today? Hunter asked, looking at the 85 flavors of ice cream to choose from. Tell me everything, Claire said when she walked into the house after picking Stella and the girls up from the airport. Emma and Abigail took off to their respective rooms with their friends to show them the various souvenirs they'd acquired during their trip. There isn't much to tell. We worked on recording the song. Stella put her bags down and looked around the house. It was nice to be back home in a familiar place surrounded by familiar things. That's not all you did. The girls couldn't stop talking about all the places Hunter took you. I can't believe he got you into the Opry. Claire sat at the kitchen table and put the key to her minivan in her purse. Stella smiled. The trip to the Grand Ole Opry had been the highlight of her time in Nashville. The place was incredible. Walking through the Opry with Hunter, who introduced her to quite a few musicians whose names she'd heard had been something she'd never forget. It's a public venue. People visit all the time. Not last minute, and not backstage. True. I'll count myself lucky. Coffee? She walked to the counter and started fixing a pot. I'd love some. So, this thing with you and Hunter, Claire waited for her to look over. Are the two of you official? Are you asking if he's my boyfriend? Stella asked. Of course he is. He takes her dinner and calls her all the time. Abigail waltzed into the kitchen, Josie in tow. We're hungry. Is there anything to eat? We talked about this. Hunter is a friend and I guess kind of my boss. That's all. Yeah right. You should see the way they look at each other when they think I'm not paying attention. They are definitely dating. Abigail shot Josie a poignant look. Stella shook her head. Her daughter was growing up too fast. We're not. And there isn't much food in the house. I can order some pizza. She turned to Claire. Would you like to stay for dinner? I'd love to. Pizza sounds great. I'll call it in and see if they'll deliver. What about Michael? Stella asked. He can fend for himself. I'll text him, Claire said, fingers flying across her phone. I'm not leaving until I have all the tea, she added after the girls headed back upstairs. There really isn't much to tell, Stella said. I don't believe you. Why don't I order the pizza, and you can think about everything you haven't told me about yet. Make a list if you need to. I want to hear everything. Claire pulled her phone out and walked into the living room to place an order with the brick oven, Palmer Island's favorite pizza place. Coffee's ready, Stella said when her friend returned. She held a cup out to Claire. Wanna have it on the patio? Why not? Claire followed her outside. 
The temperature was dropping quickly this late in the afternoon, and fall was in the air. But the last rays of sunshine coming in across the waterway made it comfortable. What do you really want to know? Stella asked. Hunter. Did you guys get any closer in Nashville? Claire wriggled her eyebrows. Claire. Who do you think I am? The girls were with me the whole time. Get your mind out of the gutter. I'm talking about dating, kissing, getting serious. Is Hunter officially your boyfriend or what? Claire had the audacity to look exasperated. Don't start that, Stella said. Start what? Calling Hunter my boyfriend. It's bad enough Abigail and Emma are joking about it. Stella shook her head. You don't see him that way? Claire asked, sounding surprised. Yes. No. Maybe. Stella rose and walked up to the rail of the deck. I don't know. Part of me is attracted to the guy, of course. And it would be nice to be held again. To go out to dinner. Have someone to talk to. A partner. But? Claire's tone was gentle, her words barely audible over the sound of the water and the wind. What if he falls back into his old ways? I can't expose the girls to something like that. Stella turned around. To be honest, I don't want to deal with something like that. Did something in Nashville happen? Claire asked. Stella shook her head. He was sober the entire time, even when the crew drank beer after a long night in the studio. He's been perfect. Never even raised his voice to the girls or played the radio too loud. He's kind, considerate. I'm not sure your heart is giving you much choice in the matter. Claire walked up to stand beside her and put an arm on her shoulder. But it's not just my heart I need to consider. If you want my recommendation, I'd say take the pressure off. Have fun. Date the guy. See how things go. It's not like you have to marry him next week. Give him a chance, and if you don't feel you can trust him after all that, call it quits. Something about that didn't sit right with Stella. It felt like leading him on if she couldn't go into this with her whole heart. I'll think about it. Good, you do that, and I'll grab the pizza, Claire said when the doorbell rang. And Stella? There are no guarantees in this life. Sometimes we have to take a chance if we want to find our happily ever after. Stella stood there, watching the sun go down across the waterway. Was Claire right? Should she give Hunter a chance? She pictured what their life could be like here on Palmer Island. Living in his house or hers, saving the other for one of the girls. And who knew? If the album did really well, they could buy a third place, making it a family compound of sorts. That was something music families did, wasn't it? The thought made her smile. Maybe giving this relationship a chance was a risk worth taking. Chapter 22 You look tired, Martin said. Everything going okay? I'm fine. You know how it is when the album takes off. Kirk's booking me on every radio and TV show he can think of. I was on some cooking show earlier today. The woman tried to feed me fried pickles. Hunter shuddered at the memory. Well, maybe this will make you feel better. All your hard work and dedication is paying off. Here are my projections for the 12 months. And that's without the tour. Martin slid a piece of paper across his dining room table. Hunter picked it up and glanced through the numbers and charts. He was no financial whiz like his accountant, but even to him, it looked impressive. I'm in the clear. Martin laughed. You're in the clear, set up for retirement, and there should be plenty left over to send those girls you keep talking about to a brownstone college if you want. Are you serious? The thought of being able to do something like that for Abigail and Emma warmed his heart. Unless you start spending again like there's no tomorrow, I don't see why this launch and the boost it's bringing to your back catalog couldn't finance your retirement. Or you could keep going. Not today. Dinner is almost ready, and I need for the two of you to clean up this mess you made. Josh waltzed into the room, a stack of plates in his hand. 
Can it wait? We're working here. Martin looked at his partner with so much love in his eyes, it made Hunter's heart ache. He missed Stella something fierce. Not unless you want bone dry chicken. Take it to the living room, or even better, finish up after dinner. Josh slid a stack of papers aside and sat down the plates, before returning with silverware and wine glasses. I think I'm getting the gist of it. We're doing well, and as long as I keep spinning the hamster wheel, with all these promos and engagements, I should be sitting pretty by the end of the year. Hunter looked at Martin for confirmation. That pretty much sums it up. The money is pouring in. What about taxes? Hunter asked. The last thing he needed was a repeat of that mess. His last accountant had been a little too creative, and it had gotten him into hot water with the IRS. Plenty set aside for that, and I already paid your back taxes off. Martin picked up the papers and shuffled through them, handing him a bank statement. This is your tax savings account. I doubt we'll need all of that, but better safe than sorry. You don't have as many deductions as you did before. There's an easy fix for that. Marry that girl with the voice of an angel and adopt her daughters. Instant deductions. Josh set the table. I think it's a little early for that. But the images Josh's idea conjured were more appealing than Hunter cared to admit. And it had nothing to do with taxes. Not that it mattered. He was going to have to ride this publicity wave while it lasted. Taking time off to see her wasn't an option. And neither was asking her to join him on the road. We're barely seeing each other. You need to make time for what's important, Josh said. He and Martin walked off toward the kitchen. When they returned, the paperwork was exchanged for a roasted chicken, mashed potato, gravy, and a big mess of collard greens. It smelled heavenly. Thank you for having me over, Hunter said, looking at the spread in front of him. Hold that thought. Josh jumped up. I forgot the biscuits. You're very welcome. Don't take this the wrong way, Hunter, but you look like you could use a good meal. And a trip to Palmer Island. Martin poured himself and Josh a glass of red wine. Hunter put his hand over his. Water, if you don't mind. Still or sparkling? Josh asked without skipping a beat, putting a basket of scratch-made biscuits in the center of the table. Sparkling. This feels like a celebration. Hunter grinned. A man of my own heart. Josh returned the smile. Wait until you see dessert. I'll be sure to leave some room. He wasn't sure how that would be possible with everything the men were piling on his plate, but he would make an effort. Martin's right, by the way. You should go see that beautiful woman of yours. Don't want to risk having her, forget all about you. Josh buttered his biscuit and took a bite. I'm not sure that's even possible. The guy's handsome mug is everywhere these days. Martin cut into his chicken. That's true. When I went to the grocery store this morning, you were on at least five different magazine covers. And did they put an ad for your album on the side of the buses? Josh asked. Hunter nodded. He knew it was all part of the game, but this was getting ridiculous. What was next? His picture on frozen french fries and coffee cups? Not if he could help it. But you miss her, don't you? Martin asked. Why don't you ask her to fly out for a few days? Hunter shook his head. What's the point? I'm booked from the time I roll out of bed until late at night. Maybe she could join you for some of your engagements? Josh asked. I've been listening to a few of your interviews, and people keep asking about who this beautiful voice belongs to. To be honest, I wouldn't mind meeting her myself. Josh isn't wrong. We could use this to our advantage. Everyone's talking about how haunting and beautiful Stella's voice is. Martin sat back and looked at Hunter. Don't even think about it, and don't you dare put that idea in Kirk's head. Keep Stella out of this. Being in the limelight was his choice, not hers. Besides, he would never ask her to join him. He'd made that mistake before and paid dearly for it. Martin held up his hands. 
I won't say a word. Thanks. And thank you for all this. It's the first decent meal I've had in weeks. Hunter piled mashed potatoes and gravy on his fork. Our pleasure, Martin said and reached over to squeeze Josh's hand. I hope I didn't wake you, Hunter said when Stella answered the phone. You didn't. I'm still up, writing. Stella sounded tired, and she'd probably be up with the girls at the crack of dawn. Anything exciting? he asked, craving a deeper connection with her. Not really. It's a set of articles for an interior designer client of mine. All about feng shui. Sounds interesting. Hunter leaned back in the chair in his hotel room, looking at the room service dinner he'd ordered and barely touched. Stella laughed. You're such a terrible liar. How are things going on the road? It's going well. The album keeps rising in the charts, and the studio is happy. Hunter grabbed a cold fry and popped it into his mouth, regretting the decision almost instantly. Martin's happy. My coffers are once again full. That's got to be a relief. Stella's chair creaked and he guessed she was leaning back, settling in for their chat. Hunter glanced at the clock on the bedside table. He had a good forty minutes before heading out for some evening event Kirk had lined up. He had no idea what exactly it was and didn't care. Something else to get through before he could hit the hay tonight. It is. I'm glad your hard work is paying off. If it helps, you're all the talk on Palmer Island. Stella sounded amused and you're all the talk here in Nashville. People keep asking me who the mysterious woman is who's singing with me on Heartbreak. Mysterious? They actually call me that? Stella laughed. They wouldn't if they'd seen me in the kitchen earlier today, covered in flour and splattered with tomato sauce. What happened? The girls wanted to make homemade pizza. Let's just say the brick oven has nothing to worry about. I could go for one of their spicy pepperoni pizzas right about now, Hunter said. Anything would be better than the overcooked burger and limp fries he was trying to get down. I'll take you the next time you come home, Stella said. He heard the unasked question. That might not be for a while. I get it. Your schedule is pretty crazy right now. But it has to slow down eventually, right? Or they'll at least have to give you some time off. Not while the album is climbing the charts. It's like a wave. You have to ride the momentum and keep feeding into the buzz, or it fizzles into nothing. He'd forgotten how grueling this part of the business was. But she was right. It would die off. It always did. He hoped she'd be patient enough to wait for him until that happened. I guess we'll have to ride it out. She sounded disappointed. I miss you. Believe me, if there was any way, I'd get on a plane and come visit you and the girls. He'd jump at the opportunity. I know. And this is nice. Having you check in and tell me all about your adventures. Anything going on tonight? she asked. Talking to her was the highlight of his day, but it wasn't the same as seeing each other in person. Some charity event. Kirk has me singing a couple of songs, including Heartbreak. Which, by the way, isn't the same without you. I'm sure Kirk found you a suitable replacement. Someone a little more professional than me. He did. Allison does a good enough job. But you know what I mean. He ran his fingers through his damp hair. I do. And if I'm perfectly honest, I am a little tempted by the idea of singing in public. Don't get me wrong, it terrifies me, but it's one of those childhood dreams. Really? It was the first time she'd mentioned wanting to sing in public. It was an interesting development. Don't sound so surprised. Isn't it every little girl's dream to be a big pop star? I sang into my hairbrush in front of the bathroom mirror, imagining performing in front of thousands of screaming fans. He smiled at the idea of her singing into a hairbrush. Why didn't you go for it? Her dream wasn't that different from the one he had as a young boy. Except his had included a guitar and no hair brush. Because there's no way, I'm actually some pop diva. I've always loved to sing, 
but I'm too much of a realist to think I could make a career out of it. I think you're selling yourself short. People around town keep talking about you. They love your voice. He'd done what he could to protect her privacy, but if she wanted to give this a go, he could open doors for her at the drop of a hat. That's sweet. I can't say I'm not tempted. Country music feels different. Not as much drama and crazy hair as the pop scene. Hunter laughed. You don't know very much about country music, do you? Not really. But it's nice having people appreciate my voice. I'm glad I was able to contribute to all this in some small way. She'd done far more than she gave herself credit for. You did more than that. And you're welcome to join me on stage anytime. I mean it. Thank you, I appreciate that. But this is plenty. We're the talk of the town, and the girls tell everyone we meet that their mama is singing on the number one country album. Hunter smiled, picturing the girls' excitement. Not quite number one yet, but we're getting there. You will. And Hunter, I'm so proud of you. Of everything you accomplished since this summer, Stella said. When she'd found him slumped over in his hot tub. I have to go. Emma woke up and is calling for me. All right. Give the girls a hug from me, and I'll see you as soon as I can. Promise. Hunter hung up, hoping he could fulfill that promise sooner rather than later. He stared at his dinner and decided there was no point trying to force more of it down. It would just sit like a brick in his stomach all night. He stepped into the bathroom to brush his teeth and finish getting ready. For a moment, he thought she might take him up on his offer to share a stage. Even if it was for one performance. But deep down, he'd known she'd decline. The limelight wasn't for her, and that was okay. He was glad he'd been able to help her fulfill a part of her girlhood dream. To give her a small taste of stardom. This way, she got to taste the good without having to deal with the bad parts. Being hounded by photographers and getting up at four in the morning to appear on some morning radio show across the country. He sighed and put on one of his fancier shirts and the good boots, like Kirk had requested. On Palmer Island, this outfit would be ridiculous, but tonight, he'd fit right in. He tugged on the collar and wiggled his toes. Everything felt too tight, too restricted. When the front desk rang to tell him his car was here, he was ready. Let's get this over with, he said to his reflection. In the backseat of the limo, he pulled out his phone to send Stella a quick text, thanking her for rescuing his career and telling her goodnight. Without her, he wouldn't be where he was today. He doubted he'd been able to finish the album without her input. Even if she wasn't interested in a career as a singer, she had a future in songwriting if she wanted it. The songs they'd worked on together were popular. Bigger and better than almost everything he'd done in the past. How are Stella and the kids? Kirk asked when he met him in front of tonight's venue. Some billionaire's mansion on the outskirts of town. They're good. Any chance I can make it back home for Thanksgiving? he asked. Kirk shook his head. No can do. I got you on a float in the Macy's parade. You're flying up to New York for rehearsals in two weeks. Maybe some other time. Kirk hustled him inside the building, and Hunter wondered when that might be. He hoped it would be before she gave up on him coming back to her. Chapter 23 I miss Hunter. Is he ever coming back again? Emma asked as they walked around the Christmas fair on Palmer Island. He'll be back as soon as he can. And you got to video chat with him a couple of days ago, remember? Stella took her youngest daughter's hand and swung it back and forth. She'd been trying hard to take the girls' minds off missing Hunter by filling their days since winter break started with holiday activities. Truth be told, it wasn't just for the girls. She missed him, too. Or maybe he's going to stay on tour forever. Abigail's attitude toward Hunter had changed the last few days. She'd refused to speak to him and stopped playing his music. It made Stella wonder if she was making a mistake by continuing her friendship, or whatever this thing between them was. 
If it hurt her daughters, it would have to stop. Stella ignored the sharp pain in her heart and forced herself to focus on the girls. On making this day special. He isn't. Hunter is going to try to make it home for Christmas, and the tour won't last much longer past that. Emma squealed with delight. Abigail shrugged and walked off, pretending to look at a craft table. It was covered in soup bowl covers and hand-sewn kitchen towels with crochet toppers. They were cute and full of Christmas cheer, but not something her daughter would give more than a passing glance. With Hunter home, it'll be the best Christmas ever. Emma skipped to her sister. You're so dumb. He's not coming back. He's too busy with his career and stuff. Abigail ran her hands over the fabric. That's not true. Take it back. Emma pulled on her sister's sleeve. It's true. Ask Mama. She doesn't think he's coming back either. I heard her tell Claire. Abigail picked up a soup bowl made from bright Santa Claus fabric, earning her a raised eyebrow from the stall's proprietor. Stella rushed over. We'll take three. Do you like this one, Abby? Abigail dropped the item like it had turned into a piece of burning hot coal. No. It's silly. What are you supposed to do with these, anyway? They are soup bowl covers. You set your bowl in here and then you can hold it in your hand without burning your fingers, Stella explained. Whatever. Abigail turned to walk back out into the lane. That's a great idea. I like this one. Emma held up one full of brightly colored strings of lights. Stella picked up the two covers and added a third one. It was made of midnight blue cotton with bright golden stars printed all over it. She glanced at a fourth one that had musical notes all over it but left it where it was. These three please. That's $25. The woman who died Abigail, suspiciously, had a friendly smile on her face. Would you like a bag? Stella shook her head and handed her $30. Keep the change. Where is Abigail going? Emma asked. Stella took her youngest daughter's hand. Let's go find out. Is it true? Hunter isn't coming back? Emma asked. I'm sure Hunter will be back as soon as he can, Stella said, wishing she could believe her own words. I see your sister. Over there, by the hot chocolate cart. Can we have some? Emma skipped and swung their intertwined hands, all worry about Hunter forgotten. I think hot chocolate is an excellent idea. With all the toppings, Stella said as they caught up to her eldest. What do you think, Abigail? Marshmallows or whipped cream? Abigail studied the sign carefully. Whipped cream and a candy cane, please. The smiles on her girls' faces warmed her heart more than the sweet hot liquid in her own paper cup. She would do anything for her daughters. Anything to keep them safe. And right now, that meant sipping something warm and sweet and doing the traditional meet-up with the guy in the red suit. Stella smiled at Abigail. Sounds perfect to me. Hot chocolate, and then we're taking pictures with Santa. I hear he has a reindeer. Stella looked at the picture from last week's Christmas market. The three of them stood next to Santa, holding up their hot chocolates. Santa held an actual reindeer by a lead, keeping it from craning its neck to reach the marshmallows that floated in Emma's cup. The smiles on all their faces were genuine. For a moment, Stella had forgotten about Hunter and enjoyed the moment. Her gaze traveled back down to the magazine she'd picked up on this week's trip to the grocery store. She rarely spared a second glance for the gossip rags, but this one had caught her attention. Her name and a grainy picture were on the cover. She wasn't the main headline, simply something to fill the space between a recent high-profile divorce of some pop princess and the latest teen heartthrob who was seen with an up-and-coming actress. Stella was surprised she'd made it. This was a national magazine, and she'd been eager to flip through it since she'd gotten home from the store. Not in front of the girls, though. They were too excited about this whole album already. No need to pour gasoline on that flame. She took a sip of her chamomile tea and flipped through the pages until she found the article about her. 
the mysterious, reclusive songstress who has enchanted the nation. Stella shook her head. The whole idea of her as someone mysterious was ridiculous. She was an open book. Everyone on the island knew her. Unlike the writer of this piece. The woman had cobbled together a basic profile that included mostly what Stella shared on her freelance website and on social media. The majority of the actual article was about Hunter. The writer didn't seem to be a fan, judging by how often she referred to the man as a hard-partying cowboy silver fox. Stella rolled her eyes. Hunter's hair wasn't gray, and his partying days were over. The cowboy she'd give them. He wore his boots and hat on stage. Her eyes keep scanning farther down the page. The article mentioned her and Hunter making magic together. How much more ridiculous could this get? Stella underestimated the writer. The woman was creative. She gave her that. Hunter Madison and Stella Wilson have a special kind of magic, Stella read out loud. So much so that fans of the aging country music star are wondering if they are in a relationship. She rolled her eyes at the so-called journalist's ability to make something out of nothing. However, this reporter can confirm that those rumors are unlikely since Mr. Madison has been seen in the arms of country music's latest darling, Alison Williams. Stella looked at the picture of a blonde bombshell, smiling big and looking cozy on Hunter's arm. She had no idea where the shot was taken, or who the woman was. Hunter had mentioned someone else singing with him at live events and, of course, the tour, but Stella hadn't bothered looking into who this person was. Maybe she should have. The mysterious, small-town singer has no chance against a hot blonde bombshell like Miss Williams, the article concluded. Hot blonde bombshell, all right, Stella mumbled under her breath. The woman showed more cleavage than the Grand Canyon and stared adoringly at Hunter in the picture. Stella swallowed hard and closed the magazine, shoving it hard enough across the kitchen table that it slid off and landed on the tile floor. Stella got up and walked to the counter, stepping on the magazine on her way to the electric kettle. Ten minutes later, teacup in hand, she walked into the living room. Her eyes fell on the couch where the four of them had huddled together during the hurricane. She blew the hair out of her eyes and sighed before sinking into the oversized chair opposite the couch. It was time to get real with herself. Yes, she liked Hunter Madison. Probably more than she should. And yes, her girls were getting older and becoming more independent every day. But for now, Abigail and Emma needed her here and Hunter was off sharing his music and his passion with the world. Her phone beeped. Stella picked it up and looked at the message. It was Hunter, sharing a picture of himself in front of yet another concert venue, telling her goodnight. It was sweet, but also a stark reminder of why they couldn't work. Their lives were too different, and none of that would change in the foreseeable future. He was much better off with someone like Allison Williams who could join him on the road. Stella sat there for a long time, tears rolling down her cheeks. She stared at the message with bleary eyes before finally hitting delete and turning her phone off. You look dreadful. Tight deadline? Claire asked the next morning over coffee. Stella shook her head and wrapped her hands around her cup. The warmth of the hot brew felt good on her chilled fingers. Didn't think so. Stella looked up, surprised at her friend's remark. You usually kick me out after two minutes when you've got a bunch of work to get done. Claire reached across the table and put her hand on Stella's arm. What's wrong? I couldn't sleep. That's all. She'd tossed and turned for hours, despite the tea, and finally given up an hour before dawn. Stepping out on the deck, she'd watched the sun rise over the houses that separated her and the ocean. Does it have something to do with this? Claire pointed to the magazine one of the girls had put back on the table this morning. Stella shrugged. Don't read anything into this nonsense. The person obviously doesn't know you. I doubt they know Hunter any better. Claire pulled the glossy pages toward herself. You read it? Stella asked. Of course. Everyone on the island has. 
it's not often we get to live with a celebrity in our midst. Claire leafed through the pages. Stella laughed. Hunter has been living here for almost a year and then there's the Suttons, Anne. Claire waved her off. You know what I mean. It's different when you're becoming the, how did she put it? Ah, yes. The songstress who has enchanted the nation. Stella shook her head. It's ridiculous. What was I thinking, agreeing to sing on his album in the first place? The attention and fame aren't really what's bothering you, are they? Claire asked gently. No. It'll blow over in a couple of weeks. Stella took a sip of her coffee. She had no illusions that it would be more than 15 minutes of fame. It's the blonde, isn't it? Claire tapped her finger on the image of Hunter and the singer in a tight red dress so low-cut it was a wardrobe malfunction waiting to happen. Stella shrugged. It doesn't matter. That's not true. Did you talk to Hunter about this? Claire asked. No talking to the man brought up too many confusing feelings. Don't you think you should at least ask him about her? Maybe they're nothing more than friends. Or colleagues. Claire, he'd be better off with someone like her. Someone who can travel with him, share the stage. Someone who understands this world of glitz and glamour he lives in. The truth was hard to swallow, but that didn't change anything. Her life was here. His was out there. He'll be back. Don't give up hope. I saw the way the two of you look at each other. Claire took Stella's hand in hers and squeezed it encouragingly. Hope. That was the problem. She couldn't afford to get sucked in by hope again. It did nothing but disappoint you. After Dan's accident, there'd been mornings where she'd woken up and reached for him. There were moments when she'd been sure everything had been nothing but a horrible nightmare and that her husband was in the kitchen making coffee. She'd jumped out of bed, hoping all of it was true, only to be plunged back in the depths of grief when the memories of seeing his body at the morgue flooded back into her mind. I can't cling to hope. Stella sniffled. It was the one thing she couldn't afford anymore. Not when she had her daughters to worry about. The last thing they needed was to hear about Hunter and some other woman. At least talk to him before you make up your mind, Claire said. Unless you already did. I think I have. Besides, this isn't a conversation you have over the phone. To make this work, Stella grasped for words, not sure how to articulate the Herculean effort it would take to have a serious relationship with Hunter. It would be all but impossible while he was busy keeping up with the increasing demands of his reviving career. You too could make it work, Claire said. I'm not saying it would be easy, but you deserve happiness, Stella. I was happy. She'd had the love of a good man. Enough happiness to last a lifetime. And she had her daughters. It was enough. It had to be. Chapter 24 Kirk, I need to go home. Hunter looked at his manager across the small table of the tour bus. They were barreling down some interstate out in the Midwest. He'd lost track of what state they were in or where he'd be playing tonight. We'll be back in Nashville in three days. Kirk looked up from his laptop. Not Nashville. Palmer Island. I'm spending Christmas with Stella and the girls. If he didn't get back soon, he'd lose her. Impossible. I have appearances lined up for you throughout the holidays. And Wendy is excited to have you at the house for Christmas dinner. Kirk smiled at him encouragingly. Cancel them and tell your wife I'll take a rain check on dinner. I'm going home. Hunter stared at Kirk, willing him to agree to the change of plans. You can't be serious. Kirk closed his laptop and gave Hunter his full attention. I'm dead serious. What's the point of all this if I have nothing to live for? Tried that, and we both know it didn't end well. I want to be happy. I deserve to be happy. And Stella makes you happy? Kirk asked, his eyes softening. She does. And I'm going to lose her if I don't get home and make her mind for good. What does that mean? I'm not sure yet. 
I'm guessing it's a little early to propose. Especially since she thinks I'm with Allison. Kirk made a choking noise. Does she know you at all? Not as well as I'd like her to. Which is something I plan on fixing. Over Christmas. Hunter looked at his watch. He needed to get out of here. Palmer Island was a long way off, and he had presents to buy on the way. Are you sure about this? The record label won't be happy. They are counting on people spending their holiday money on your album and concert tickets. I am. And with everything I've done already, don't I deserve a break? Hunter asked. You do. We all do. All right. Let me find you the closest airport and see if I can get you on a flight out. Kirk opened his laptop and started typing faster than Hunter's fingers could fly over the ivory keys of a piano. Thank you, he said, feeling it with every cell in his body. Anything to make the man of the hour happy. It's gonna cost a pretty penny, though. Hunter laughed. With the way sales are going, that's not going to be a problem. Kirk raised an eyebrow. Don't worry. I'm not planning on slipping back into my old spending habits. Martin talked a lot of sense into me. But this, this is worth making an exception for. And there was one other item he planned to splurge on. This thing with Allison, Kirk said. We could leverage that. Especially since Stella isn't interested in joining you on stage. Once you get a chance to talk to her, I'll get in touch with Allison's manager. No. I'm not interested in a pretend relationship with Allison. And neither is she. Hunter shook his head vehemently. Even if it could drive up record sales? You'll have to sell quite a few more albums to pay for this ticket. The only thing I can find is a first-class seat. Kirk turned his laptop to face him. Hunter looked at the price. It was ridiculous for a three-hour flight. Book it. And stop worrying about sales. I'll finish my engagements after the first of the year. And talk to Martin. He's got a solid plan for all this money that's coming in. We don't need a PR stunt. Trust me. All right. Pack your stuff. We'll drop you off at the airport in half an hour. With a little luck, you'll make your flight. Kirk pulled out the corporate credit card and got to work. Hunter walked into the back of the bus and pulled his duffel bag out from under his bunk. He checked his phone. Still nothing from Stella. She was ignoring him. If it wasn't for Claire, he wouldn't even know she was upset about Allison. He smiled at the thought of her getting jealous over nothing. Even if he was interested in Allison, he was pretty sure the woman was batting for the other team. His best guess was that she was in a long-term relationship with her drummer, a cute red head with more energy than the Energizer Bunny. He'd keep Allison's secret if she wasn't ready to come out in public. And there was no way he'd let Kirk or any other PR guy exploit the friendship he'd formed with the singer and her band. Focus, Hunter. You have shopping to do. He shoved the last of his clothes and his toiletries into his bag before searching for gift ideas on his phone. Hunter? Stella stared at him like he was a ghost. What are you doing here? He smiled, forgetting how tired he felt after spending the last 24 hours in airports and on planes. The delays had driven him bonkers, but standing here and seeing her, it was all worth it. I was hoping to spend Christmas with you and the girls. He held up the gifts he'd bought at the gift shops in three different airports. I don't understand. I thought you were working. Stella didn't move. Can I come in? I'll tell you everything you want to know. I promise. Hunter took a step to close the distance between them. Stella stared at him for a long time. Long enough for Hunter to worry that she'd refuse to let him in. Okay. She took a step back and motioned for him to walk into the house. Hunter. You're here. I knew you'd come back. Emma ran up and wrapped her little arms around him. Abigail was a few steps behind her sister and gave him a cautious smile. Of course. I wouldn't miss Christmas with my girls. 
Sorry, I'm so late. I was going to get here yesterday, he looked at Stella, smiling at the woman he loved apologetically. What happened? Abigail asked. All kinds of stuff. First, there was a blizzard, so we couldn't start. Then, when the weather finally cleared, one of the engines wouldn't start. They worked on it for a long time and finally put me on a different plane. I flew to Washington, D.C. From there to Atlanta, and then finally down here. Sounds like quite the trip. Stella's expression softened. Are those for us? Emma pointed to the stack of gifts in his hands. They are. Merry Christmas. Hunter sat them down on the coffee table and handed two boxes to each of the girls. Can we open them? Emma's gaze flew from him to her mother. Of course. What are you waiting for? Hunter grinned at the girl and watched her eyes light up with excitement before turning to Stella. This one's for you. You shouldn't have. Stella hesitantly accepted the small bag. It's Christmas. Hunter shrugged and slung his duffel bag across his shoulder. It is. Stella watched the girls tear into the wrapping paper. Hunter leaned close and kept his voice soft. There's nothing going on between me and Allison, by the way. She'd be more interested in you than me, if you catch my drift. Stella's eyes went wide. How did you? I talked to Claire when you ignored my calls. Hunter shrugged. It was one thing he wouldn't apologize for. He'd fight for her. For them. Whatever it took. I'm going to have to have a chat with Claire about girl code. Stella's lips twitched into the smallest of smiles, and Hunter's heart leaped at the sight. And you're sure? I am. But I'm happy to call her and have her speak to you. He pulled out his phone, hoping Allison wouldn't mind a Christmas Day interruption. I believe you. Besides, there are other reasons this can't work. The smile disappeared as quickly as it had come. Hunter took her hands in his. We'll talk about it and I am ready to debate you on every single one of your reasons, but first let me spend Christmas with you all. Can we do that? We can do that. Stella squeezed his hands, her features relaxing. Any chance I could have a cup of coffee? Hunter asked. He was tired and cold. And happier than he'd been in a long time, even if it was going to take some work to convince Stella that they belonged together. Sure, Stella turned to her daughters. We'll be in the kitchen. He followed her and watched her put on a cup of coffee before joining him in the breakfast nook. Is that what I think it is? he asked, pointing to a bit of greenery tied to the lap that hung over the table. Hmm, Stella looked up. Hunter leaned forward and waited for her eyes to meet his before closing the last bit of distance between them. His lips brushed across hers in a familiar sensation he'd relived a thousand times. Her mouth opened the smallest bit and a tiny sigh, barely audible, escaped her lips. It was all the encouragement he needed. Deepening the kiss, he poured every bit of longing and passion he'd felt into it. He'd missed this. He'd missed her. Missed this feeling of coming home. Merry Christmas, he whispered, slightly out of breath when they finally broke away from each other. Merry Christmas to you too. Stella smiled, her lips red and the tiniest bit swollen. Her cheeks were flushed, her hair tousled from his fingers. You didn't open your present. He plucked the small sparkly bag from the counter where she'd dropped it and sat it down in front of her. I didn't think you'd be back, Stella said, turning pink with embarrassment. I don't have a present for you. Hunter waved her off. Being here with you is present enough. He watched her open the bag and pull out the small cardboard box, tied with a midnight blue ribbon. She pulled it off with shaky hands and opened the box. Inside was a small silver necklace with a heart pendant. It's beautiful. It's the best I could do at the airport. I'll get you something nicer, he promised and reached over to take the small necklace from her to fasten it around her neck. Stella's hand moved to the pendant. Don't you dare. This is perfect. Besides, having you here is present enough. 
You mean that? Hunter asked. For now, yes. She turned to face them. I don't know how we can make this work, with you on the road and me here. I have some thoughts about that. There are some obligations I can't get out of, but I'm ready to slow down. Come back home. Work on new material. I'm too old to be on the road for months. Stella laughed. You're not that old. Besides, aren't the Rolling Stones still touring? He grinned. All right, you got me. Guess I'm just tired of touring and have a place I'd rather spend my time at. And where's that, she asked, her eyes blazing. Here with you, Abigail and Emma. He pulled her into his arms and lowered his mouth to her ear. You're the best Christmas present ever, and you always will be. Epilogue Valentine's Day, Palmer Island, South Carolina You look beautiful. Hunter stared at her like she was a famous piece of art. Or maybe a slice of decadent chocolate cake. Either way, it made her heart beat faster. We gave her a makeover, Abigail said. Do you like it? I love it. You girls did an amazing job. Maybe I should hire you for my next concert. Claire did most of it. But I helped. Abigail smiled from ear to ear. You sure did, but now it's time to pack up all the makeup stuff and take it back to my house. Claire took the girl's hand. But you promised we'd get a makeover, too. Emma walked over and put her hands on her hips. We will. At my house. Josie and Paisley are waiting for you. Claire took the two of them with her. You look pretty nice yourself, Stella said. She took in his appearance. He wore a nice suit and a tie that set off his eyes. He was clean-shaven, and she was pretty sure he'd gotten a fresh haircut as well. Thanks. Hunter felt warmth creep up his neck. He reached up to adjust the tightness of his collar. These are for you. Stella took the flowers, a small bouquet of pale pink roses, with dark greenery. Thank you. I should get these in some water, before we leave. He followed her into the kitchen and reached up to help her get a vase down from the top cabinet. Thanks. Are you really not telling me where we're going tonight? Stella asked. Not a chance. It's a surprise, he said. You two have fun. Claire grinned and winked at Hunter. We're going to get out of your hair. Stella couldn't help but feel there was more to this Valentine's Day date than met the eye. She watched her best friend walk out the door with her daughters. We should get going. Hunter took the vase from her and filled it with water from the sink. At least let me take the paper off and cut the stems. Stella reached for the bouquet. Not going to happen. Hunter took it and plopped it into the water before taking her hand. We have somewhere to be. He led her out the door and to his car, holding the passenger side door open until she got in. He practically ran around to the driver's side. Something was going on, and it made her heart beat faster. Shay Paul, she asked, surprised when Hunter pulled up to Palmer Island's most expensive restaurant. Where else did you think I was going to take you on Valentine's Day? he asked and got out before she had a chance to answer. Paris, she quipped, taking the arm he offered her as they walked to the entrance. Maybe next year. Or when the girls are a little older. He held open the door, and Stella wasn't sure how to respond. She hadn't expected him to take her joke seriously. They were seated immediately in a semi-private space close to the kitchen. The booth was cozy, and a glass of chilled champagne was waiting for her. What's this? Stella asked when the hostess left. The Valentine's Day special. Look at the menu. If you don't like it, I'm sure we can change it. Stella looked at the printed linen card in front of her. It held a five-course menu of French food. Everything from the smoked salmon canapes to the creme brulee sounded delicious. This is perfect. She looked around, taking in the place she'd only admired from the outside for so long. It was a fancy place. A night and day difference from Mary's diner. Everything was perfect here, 
from the ambience to the row of silverware in front of her. In that case, a toast to a lovely evening with a lovely woman. Hunter held up his glass of water and clanked it against hers when she followed suit. To a lovely evening, she echoed before taking a cautious sip. The sparkling wine was tart with just a hint of sweetness. The tiny bubbles danced on her tongue, lighting up her taste buds. It turned out to be more than lovely. The food tasted as delicious as it sounded, and Stella enjoyed every bite of the beef bourguignon. Hunter looked at their server and raised his hand. Please don't get any more wine on my account, Stella said. The champagne and the glass of red she'd enjoyed with dinner had been more than enough. Hunter smiled. I'm not. Are you ready for dessert? I don't think I can get another bite down. Stella put her hand to her stomach. It seemed that four courses of rich French food were her limit. He looked disappointed. The server appeared with two small dishes of creme brulee, and the scent of the caramelized sugar wafted up her nose. Maybe just a little bite. Hunter grinned and cracked the caramelized sugar top with his spoon. Stella followed his example and tasted the popular dessert. The contrast between the crunchy sugar and silky custard worked perfectly. Her mind was still on the delectable treat when the music suddenly changed from classical to something that sounded more familiar. She didn't know the song, but she would recognize this voice anywhere. Looking off into the distance, she listened to the song. It wasn't one she recognized and definitely not something they'd worked on together. The lyric spoke of longing and coming home. Will you be mine? Hunter's voice sang over the speakers. She turned to look at him and gasped. Hunter was in front of her on one knee, holding out a small box with a large diamond ring. Well, then? Hunter asks, a huge grin on his face. Stella was too stunned for words. She stared at the ring. It was a beautiful princess cut diamond nestled in the velvet cushion of the box. Will you be mine, Stella? Hunter asked, his voice rough with emotion. Where did the song come from? Stella asked. I wrote it for you and wanted you to be the first to hear it. I know my life is crazy, and it probably always will be. And I know you're afraid, but, honey, I love you. You are all that matters to me. You and the girls. Stella, you are my world. My everything. Please say you'll be mine for the rest of our days. Ask them to play that song again, Stella said, a tear rolling down her cheek. She leaned over and kissed him, right then and there, in front of everyone. Is that a yes? Hunter asked, his lips still touching the corner of her mouth. When she didn't answer, he turned to the wait staff, gathered behind them. Would you mind playing that song again? I think she's not sure. Yes, Stella said, loud enough for half the restaurant to hear. I'm sure. I'll always be yours, Hunter. Forever and always. She wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him deeply as the song he wrote for her played again and the restaurant staff and patrons around them erupted in applause. The End This has been Cross My Heart written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2023 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.